What is up, y'all? It is the Winter Championship Singles Edition, of course, this weekend is coming to a close as we have one final region to get through, but we've still got doubles next weekend as well. And that means you've still got time to pick up your winter merch. Brahala.com slash winter merch to pick up that hoodie and that blanket. But I'm Duke and join with me is Sparky and those actually say our names. That's true. They got it right this time. Yeah. Let's go. They it's always say third time is the charm that's the saying today it's a saying forever mm -hmm. but he talked about that winter merch it is gone on the 12th pick it up it's now less than seven days until it is gone do not wake up the next day after it has been taken away and say oh shucks i didn't get it in time my year is ruined get it now right now right now pull right up another window and get it right now but while you're doing that you'll have something to listen to because we're on the pre-show and we're talking about north american 1v1s duke lead us off well, of course, uh, one thing that's great about North America is the fact that they are going to be the final three to get uh, invites to the Royales, right? We've already got five people bringing up that final three. Uh, the Royale will be happening in March. So let's talk about some of these players, maybe players to watch, players we think that might do well this weekend, or um, just some players that we think are generally interesting. And uh, I think there's a really quick one. Do you want to do that at the beginning or at the end? Uh, we'll save that one till the end. Okay, okay. Then uh, let's kick it off with none other than Radish. Radish is a player that a lot of people were looking at kind of starting last year. He had several breakout performances. We're seeing it right now on the screen. The replays are, of course, with the Petra, uh, the Ryu being that specific skin that Radish chooses a lot of the time. You're seeing him throw some dunks down onto Boomy to secure that game with a two stock. Radish has done well in uh, in 2v2s as well, but of course we're talking about 1v1s today. How are you feeling about Radish today? Radish is uh, it's a really cool one. Okay. 2022 was kind of this tumultuous time in the North American region, right? All of those big names that we used to have as household names were taking breaks, they were kind of falling off, and then we started seeing these new bloods come in. We saw the Radish, we saw the AO Blue, we saw the Jet Beans come in, do well in the North American region, and we we're always left with this question of, are they gonna be consistent? Is this a one and done or is this gonna be someone who is gonna continue to progress? And Radish is one who, thankfully has been progressing. He's continually doing well. We got to see him perform at the Midseason Invitational. He's already won a seasonal before. So he's got a lot of things going really well for him. He's also one of those people who might not stick to his guns. Interestingly enough, even though he's kind of known as the Petra, known as that Ryu and Ken player, he also has kind of shown some other stuff as of late, right? He's shown the uh, Ezio, and most recently, he's also shown some Tesca in the ranked ladder. Yeah, Radish is playing Tesca in the ladder, also playing Tesca in the tournament today. But if we're looking at specifically the stats from Radish, we're seeing a fifth place at the Brahalo World Championship in 2022. That's huge. That's pretty good. So when you bring in the consistency side of things, like that's a big arrow that I'm focused on because maybe if you look a little bit lower on the page, you're like, okay, the Brawlhalla Midseason Championship, 13th place. Like that's, it's, it's good. It's not bad. It's good. But then if you also look at the Steel Series Invitational, 25th, the Spring Championship in 2022, 13th. But then towards the end of last year, Summer Championship, first place. Autumn Championship, fifth place. Then on the world stage, just like a month after that Autumn Championship, he's still in that fifth place spot when you add in so many EU players, so many South American players, when you have US West players that are able to compete better on land, when you're adding all of these players from around the world, he still hits that fifth place, which is incredible. What an effort from a player like Radish. Yeah, I really want to commend his consistency, his ability to continue to progress as a player. And of course, the fact that he's branching out in his character pool, that you're still seeing these kinds of thread lines back to the Petra, right? You're seeing that orb carry over to the Ezio, you're seeing the gauntlets carry over to the Petra as well from the Tesca. But either way, you love to see it and you love to see that consistency, which again, like we said, he's kind of a new blood, but to see him get fifth place at the World Championship, that's absolutely massive. Yeah, that's, that's a big exclamation point saying, hey, everyone needs to watch out for me next season because a lot of next season, I mean, most of next season isn't even going to involve the EU people. It's not going to involve SA. It's not going to involve Aus. It's not going to involve SEA. So if you're in the North American bracket with Radish, you better look out because he's coming after you with that Petra. He's coming after you with the Hadouken. Or now he's coming after you with those drop kicks. He's coming after you with that Tesca. Those big boots. But I think it's time we uh, shift over to the next person on our list. We actually talked a little bit about this person on that call before the brawl or whatever it's called. <laughs> we're, we're never going to remember. I, I love that we've just stolen that name from Tazla, who was really happy with before the brawl. 
Well, is that what it is? Before yeah. The, brawl? the name the Taz came up with was before the brawl, and then I for I thought there was like some other some other juice in there, uh -huh. and so that's why I came up with call before the brawl because it rhymed. Oh. But that was like on the spot, either up there or right here, because I couldn't remember the name before the brawl. I like like call 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 the brawl or whatever. I don't know, whatever. They all sound good. We, can, we like we like puns we, and we hey, like. It's uh, our show. We runs. can make it whatever yeah. we want. We, we can, can, we, you know, it, we, we can call it the pre-pre-show. We could. We, we could, could do that. That's a possibility. We could call it the pre-pre-show. But either way, we talked about Stingray a little bit. He was one of those players who, again, I think we uh, in the past have criminally under-talked about. He's done so incredibly well for himself. He's one of those players who, like, when he first showed up, he was in that position that Radish is in currently, where it was like, is he a one and dunner? Is he going to be that consistent thing? And we started to see a lot more consistency come out from Stingray. We see the gold medal, three silver medals, three bronze medals. This guy has been placing incredibly well for himself. He does have those tournaments where he kind of falls off. But at the same time, like the fact that he's able to perform so incredibly well in these high pressure situations, he, I, I, I cannot overstate the fact that he was able to clutch up so many times at the World Championship. Like, I, I think there's a lot of good things going for Stingray right now. Take, take me, take me to jail. Put, slap the cuffs on me, Copper. You'll never take me alive uh, because I also, I also criminally underrated yeah. Stingray quite a bit. Now he's PR three this year. Incredible work there. You mentioned some of the tournaments that he doesn't place uh, nearly as well as we would expect. Looking back at the Winter Championship last year in 2022, he ended up coming in 17th place. That's not great. That's definitely not great for a player like Stingray, but the rest of the year was fantastic. It showed so much improvement. Omen Oasis, he got seventh, which again, right inside the top eight, a lot of us expect someone like Stingray to place a little bit better than that, but then right after that, Steel Series is first place, and then he's like back and forth between fourth and third, with of course a fourth place finish at the World Championship. If I'm praising Radish for fifth, I gotta do the same thing for Stingray in fourth. Absolutely. Um, Stingray very likely will be coming in with the Orion. That's kind of been like his claim to fame, his ability to play the Lance. He's kind of taken on that mantle of the Lance player. And we've seen a lot of Lances this weekend do really well. In particular, it's been like the Vectors, but we've also seen a handful of Orions do pretty solidly as well. I'm glad you bring up his character pool. I don't know uh, how diligent he's been in reporting his uh, legends on the actual bracket today. Uh, he may have done it recently and I haven't seen it since it updated, but he does have a wonderful legend pool for the current meta, or at least the way the meta exists kind of right now. We don't know if he has that Tesca, but like you said, the Lance with the Orion has the Vector as well. He also has Qatar legends under his belt, which everybody who's seen like even 20 minutes of footage of the tournament this weekend know that Qatars are heavily favored right now he has the Ragnar he has the Asuri he has even that rare Queen Nye that we saw at BCX and of course with Asuri really being the most meta of those picks but it shows that he has a bunch of different things that are very powerful right now in a lot of pros minds that he can reach at and all of those things show variety and difference so it's not like okay I'm gonna pick this Qatar legend and then I'm gonna pick this Qatar legend okay those didn't work what do I do I'm gonna pick this other third Qatar legend no he can reach and put his finger in a lot of different pies yeah, and hopefully he'll eat all those pies because that's really unsanitary. Yeah, it's also just like disrespectful and rude yeah. to the people who made that. But we do have a tweet from Stingray that we're going to show here, uh, which is something I really haven't seen from him yet. Okay. And we have it on the screen. I'm very nervous for tomorrow. I've improved a lot, but I have a bad habit of forgetting everything I've learned mid-tournament, so I hope that doesn't happen. I feel like anybody who has ever been to school and taken a test and had that moment where they studied and then all of a sudden they get to it and they're like, what the, is, is this, is this an English? I thought I was in math class. <laughs> this looks like a Spanish test. Or What's even, going on here? Even when you're like, I know the answer to this, but I can't think of it right now. Yeah. Where I'm sitting there and I'm like, I know I studied what the mitochondria is. But I can't figure the answer right now. Right now. Uh, definitely it's those pressure situations. It is the powerhouse of the cell. Those pressure situations can be uh, incredibly tough. And it's interesting just highlighting that tweet as a whole because it takes, I mean, like, I'm, uh, it, it takes a level of vulnerability yes, to kind of call absolutely. that out. And the fact of the matter is when we see our players on social media is nine times out of 10, they're putting on that big confidence and saying, yo, I'm winning tomorrow. I know Snowy tends to historically be like, I win winter championships. I win BCX, things like that. And to be there and be like, you know what? I'm actually kind of nervous. I'm kind of stressing about this. It, it takes a level of vulnerability. It shows vulnerability. It shows honesty as well. That you're communicating that to the people out there. And I mean, we saw the 181 likes on it. So he's probably garnering a lot of support from people. Mm -hmm. So that's also a, uh, a feather that he can put in his cap of all the people around him telling him, no, you are a successful player. You can do this. But I mean, 
if he plays as well after all the effort that he put in, that's fantastic. Seeing the fruits of your labor come to fruition is incredible, but it can go the other way as well. We worked really, 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 really hard. Then all of a sudden you forget the quadratic equation and you end up failing your test that you worked so hard and that just demoralizes you further. So this will be an interesting proving ground for Stingray. I think not necessarily him proving himself against others, but him proving his abilities against like the most powerful opponent, which is this thing up here. Yeah, yourself. Um, X equals negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. B squared, yeah, square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. Sick. That's the quadratic equation, ladies and gentlemen. We're not just learning Brawlhalla here, we're learning math. You're welcome, anyone who's coincidentally taking a test. Yeah, if you're taking like algebra <laughs> right now, like, you're welcome. We did that for you, ladies that, and gentlemen. That's for you. Um, all right, up next is a player that I honestly don't know too much about. I've heard murmurs about some of it honestly coming off the back of memes, but either way, I wanna know, what's the deal with Balloon Boy? Honestly, I don't know very much about Balloon Boy either. I mean, you see his earnings right there, $65 in earnings. He's top 32 only three times, so he hasn't really shown up on stream, at least in singles, that often. He is PR 76, but of course, if we look at one of the other regions this weekend, we had PR 1,585 do well. So that number be darned. The real thing that I'm looking at from BB Balloon Boy is we, we like you said, we were kind of like joking about how, how he's, he's going to be the top three. He is going to be the winner of today's tournament. Everybody needs to look out for BB Balloon Boy. And then when I was looking at doing research this morning, I was looking at the ranked ladder, which is something I regularly look at before mm -hmm. winter championships specifically, because there's not an official in between PCX and now. And I was looking at his record. He is number four on the North American US East leaderboard, which is the most competitive leaderboard in North America, 294 wins to 115 wins. Very few people are touching that ratio and touching that many games grinded. And you, you know how it is in the beginning of like your ranked grind. If you're a pro player, you see a lot of pro players who are like 11 wins, they get to diamond and they're like, okay, I'm not touching ranked anymore. I'm not trying to sweat against these other people. The fact that he put in that many ranked games still has that consistency of victory, still is able to move himself up that ladder with some of the best players in the entire world. That that's a big thing for me. I think one thing that really stands out about just like the sheer volume of games played is that like the ranked ladder reset not that crazy long ago, but to put in 300 plus wins, basically, well, he's got 294 yeah. wins, but basically 300 wins. And then on top of that, 100 losses, that takes a level of just like sheer determination. You are going at it and playing a lot. And generally speaking, as long as you're putting in your time and you're actually trying to progress in each of those matches, that's going to end up really positively impacting you. You're going to be a lot better with that much experience under your belt, which bodes well because, again, this is a, a pressure cooker situation. You're coming into the Winter Championship. If you go down early, you're going to be playing a lot of games. You're not going to be playing 400 plus games, but you're going to be playing a lot of games. The Winter Championship is like the perfect place for someone like Balloon Boy to come out and really solidify themselves in the top Brawlhalla scene. That may not mean top three. That may not even mean top eight. I mean, you can see on the board he has zero top eights. I think that could possibly change today that's what I'm putting my money on and especially after not only did he survive the sidewinder missile from the f-22 that took down the balloon yesterday he's here showing up for the tournament he's ready to go I'm thinking balloon boy is gonna look better than ever today uh, all right I, I mean we, we will have to wait and see but we still got one more name to talk about and of course it's the North American region if you know anything about the region if you know anything about me with the North American region you know I gotta talk about my boy Luna. Luna was the man last year. Yeah. Like there's there's really no other way to say it other than Luna was the man last year. Because of that, he's number one PR right now. He's number three on the ranked leaderboard. And his record is 240 to 106. So still not as good as Balloon Boy. So I'm looking <laughs> at that at that ranked numbers from Luna. I'm like, dang, that's a good player, yes, sir. And then I look at Balloon Boy. So using Luna as sort of that uh, maybe a litmus test to look at the record of Balloon Boy. But with Luna here, highest peak in the U.S. East, second highest global peak at 2669, only second to use from South America that we mentioned yesterday. He's been playing Lucian and Mordex today, or at least that's what was, was reported in the set that he reported against Kosalix that ended in a 2-1. Yeah, Luna is uh, definitely a big question mark for this one. Um, we talk a bit about character pools and the fact that, like, 
uh, towards the tail end of 2022, he started shifting a lot more into like the Mordex, into the Hugin and things like that. Like he started going a little bit more scythe heavy, even like the Jiro he pulled out in tournament. And then uh, coming into today, a lot of people were talking about how he was likely going to be playing the Lucian for the bulk of it. But also there was this conversation of like, well, his character picks from old are kind of coming back into the meta, right? There's that potential for the Taros to come back. Hammer's looking pretty solid. There's that potential for maybe even the Bodvar to come out. Because again, Hammer's looking pretty solid. But right now it seems like it's going to be leaning a lot on that Lucian and that Mordex. One thing that's a big thing for me with Luna this weekend uh, is the fact that like, I think he was very disappointed with how he finished Absolutely. the World Championship. He's someone who has a lot of pressure on himself. He puts a lot of high expectations on himself. You go back and watch the World Championship, that loss to Godly, you could see the defeat in him. And I think that only motivated him to practice in this offseason more than I think a lot of other people did. And it like extra hurt because it wasn't him losing to Godly in grand finals. So it was it, not only did he not achieve the level that he wanted to, but I feel like that gap from not being in the grand finals when everybody expected to you to, when you expected yourself to, like that hurts even more in addition to not even making it to grand finals. So that's a really tough spot for Luna to be in. Coming into this one with a chip on his shoulder, I'm sure. I'm a little bit surprised that he's still leaning into the more decks. Of course, he has an incredible more decks, but we have seen more people step away from the gauntlets. Not that they're unplayable <coughs> by any means, but after that neutral light was taken away as a KO option in any like reasonable amount of damage, a lot of people stepped away from the gauntlets when they're starting to dig into their bag of tricks to find what's working when they're when they start losing not a lot of people were moving on to a gauntlets legend even if they had a history with that legend so luna coming into this one you're, you're right he's, he's a question mark for me as well honestly everybody is a question mark in this tournament if we were talking about it in the car on the way over from the hotel but when we were looking at eu i was seeing like okay i see eight different people who can win this tournament when i'm looking at north america I legitimately have no clue. I'm not like super confident in any one person to win this tournament because I think so many things are up in the air. The fallout from BCX that a lot of these, I guess, quote, newer players have never really had to deal with. Even in the previous years, it was an online BCX that, you know, at the end of the day could be a little bit akin to a seasonal. But the real land BCX, that kind of the fallout from that changes everything. Yeah, it's, uh, this is going to be a really, really weird one. I mean, uh, we, we don't even, we haven't even really mentioned the fact that like Impala won the world championship. He's not really in conversation for winning the winter championship, not just because of that like consistent curse that's kind of been around of the person who wins the world championship doesn't really win winter championship nine times out of 10. Uh, and couple that with the fact that he didn't place last year. And then you have the fact that North America basically had a different per person win every single seasonal for the most part. Like it's just a chaotic region and a chaotic time. And like Snowy could win this. Anyone could win no, he this. Can't. I'm just, hey, he, he won last year. Yeah, he can't win this one. AO Blue could do well. Who knows? It's it's just it's chaotic and like that's true. You could just you could throw a, a coin into a wishing well and be just as accurate as any other pick for North America. Like it's it's just chaos. So we do have one more player to talk just a brief bit about, and it is one of those players who won the World Championship uh, several times and has yet to deliver in the Winter Championship. Everybody knows the stats, so we're not gonna go too in depth on all of the numbers from Sandstorm. We're like, oh, he's really good. These are his legends. Cause everybody, pretty much everybody out there who's paid attention to five minutes for Hall Esports knows that. But we do have, like we had with Stingray, an honest and vulnerable tweet that came out from Sandstorm just recently that's one of those things where like a lot of people it's it's easy to be cool mm -hmm. quote unquote cool and like not try the vulnerability here comes from him saying the most time i put into preparing for a tournament that includes multiple lands that includes multiple world championships let's just hope i actually play like it looks that way lol na right now is the most competitive it has ever been results could be completely unexpected that second part super normal we always expect that to be the case but the first part the fact that like literally the goat of brawlhalla saying that this is the most he has ever put in preparation for a tournament. That again is like Stingray. He hopes the fruits of his labor come into fruition, show that success that he's been working on. But an L here could be super demoralizing, even for a player like Sandstorm. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to what uh, I've been talking about both today and yesterday of just like, 
the way that the world championship ended for a lot of people, I think only served to motivate a lot of people. Sandstorm in particular, right? The GOAT of Brawlhalla, the best 1v1-er, most world championship titles, did not even podium at the world championship, which a lot of people were like, hey, he's kind of just like the land king. Like he does incredibly well in offline environments, but he didn't podium at the world championship. This is gonna be the first time he's coming into a winter championship without that status. And he, I think it, it really shows that he was really motivated this year to do incredibly well. So let's move on to our predictions for the top three. Who gets to go first? Viewers. Viewers get to go first. That way we do not change the result by saying our things. So let's get, I hope you voted. Um, I, it, Wait, oh no. So so we can motivate oh. you, but we want to give, we want, the, the polls are open. You can go vote now. If you're in line, stay in line. <laughs> yeah. We won't close the polls, <laughs> uh, but we have to give our predictions because yeah. maybe maybe we can do some last minute electioneering. For Let's go! <laughs> There's no, uh, I love doing election <laughs> fraud. <laughs> We're gonna manipulate the votes. Um, I think you finished South America, so it's my turn. Yeah, could just go ahead and go. You got it. Okay, sure. In third place, I'm probably wrong. Which one? Did I? Did I? Yeah, okay. Radish <laughs> is who I put in third place. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, second place, hold on. Uh, production, we got, did I get Stingray? Stingray. And then in first place, Luna? Okay, <laughs> Luna. No surprises. Radish, Stingray, Luna. Some great picks all around. Of course, I'm going to put Luna at the top. Stingray, again, looking incredible this year. And I, I've just, I've done him so many disservices. I, I got to put him on this. And then Radish, the consistency. So that's my big three. What about you? We're going to be looking pretty similar, almost in the exact way that we did for EU, where our first and second are going to be the same. The third is going to be different. In third place, I have the floating man himself, BB Balloon Boy, coming in third place, surprising everybody here at the Winter Championship. His boldest placement yet. He's gonna do it here, he's poised to do it here, and I believe it's gonna happen. In second place, I have Stingray as well for the exact same reasons that you did. And in first place, I have Luna as well for the exact same reasons you did. Luna was the man last year. He was 50-50 on winning versus not winning tournaments. That is a club that has very few members, some of those being the literal best players who have ever touched this game. Yeah, I think Luna is still looking incredible at the top of his game. But like we've said, there's so many people that like, if you said Sandstorm, I'd be like, yeah, I get it. If you said Boomy, I'd be like, I kind of get it. You said Snowy, you no. wouldn't get it. Ain't no but, way. But you know, it's always no fun, way. winter championship, Snowy, that kind of wordplay is at least something that's And cool. that's also, I didn't even think about that, but that's another reason why I'm just against <laughs> Snowy winning this tournament whatsoever. I'm not gonna get involved with that at all. Okay, well, uh, fortunately, a thousand people put in their predictions, and maybe they collectively make up for your abject hatred of Snowy. Okay. But let's see, let's see what it's the community has. Twitch.tv slash Brahalla. Y'all put your votes in. What did y'all pick? In third place? Wes! Wes. That's, okay, y'all are wrong. He is not in that region. Y'all messed up. Like, is are those old, or? Um, I think... I'm gonna guess they're old. Well, we can retry it, retry it, retry. Yeah, everybody needs, everybody gets two. Okay, well, while y'all figure out which region you're voting in. It's North America. It's North Balloon America. Balloon Boy's out. Oh, oh <laughs> man. That's what that says. No, that says Ballon Boy is out. Okay, well, Ajax doesn't know how to spell. <laughs> There's but, still hope for Balloon Boy. <laughs> in third place, y'all put Boomy. And again, I can, I get it, it's Boomy. Okay. Goat of 2v2s for sure. Uh, what's number two? Luna, Luna. y'all are wrong. First place, who I don't it, yeah, who? it's gotta be Sandstorm. You think? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. No no surprise there. It's, yeah, fan favorite. Yep, that's uh, that's just a lot of people like picking the guy they like a lot. Yeah. And if anybody's gonna have the most people that like them, it's Sandstorm. And that's for very good reason. Ajax is in the background, putting his hands up. He believes in uh, Sandstorm doing work today. Obviously everybody in chat there is agreeing with him as well. Thank you so much for tuning into the pre-show. We're gonna be moving into the actual games of the tournament very shortly. But before that, we're gonna hit a quick break. Make sure to go to brahala.com forward slash winter merch to pick up your merchandise before it is gone on February 12th. If you want to know the schedule 
of anything that is happening in Brawlhalla. That includes tournaments. That includes dead streams as well. Brawlhalla.com forward slash schedule. That'll give it to you in your time zone. If you're on twitch.tv forward slash Brawlhalla or twitch.tv forward slash pro Brawlhalla, make sure to hit exclamation point bracket or type exclamation point bracket in chat. That'll give you a link to the bracket on start.gg where you can see where your favorite players are progressing and where they're actually playing, whether it's on this stream or twitch.tv forward slash pro Brawlhalla. Make sure to also uh, drink water, wash your hands, call your mother, brush your teeth. Uh, anything else you got to add? Tweet at us, hashtag BHE oh, yeah. Sports. And of course, check out Odin's Journal, which is another place that you can find out that bracket. But thank you all for tuning in. Take the time during this break to pick up that fantastic merch. Again, brawlhalla.com slash winter merch. We'll be right back. What's up? What did he do? to Brawlhalla. It's been a week been a week in a frigid cold, but it is time to warm things up as we get into the North American Winter Championship 1v1 uh, finals. Top 32 is going to be coming up for you pretty soon, and this is by far and away I think the most confused that any of us have been both in the production side of things and on the viewer side of things to find out who's going to win today as I am Ajax joined by the one and only Taza. I, I don't know if you share that same confusion, but I feel like a lot of us are in that department right now. For me, it's less of confusion and more of excitement to see what's True. going to be happening because we are in a state of Brawlhalla where it's kind of like, all right, I've been seeing a lot of people say a lot of things, <laughs> but now we get to see in the Winter Championship what actual reality is when it comes to the metas that are in different regions. And we've been seeing some various results and everything so far. I think the thing that we can say for sure right now is that uh, Qatar's are meta, but, Just, but, but, outside, <laughs> but outside of that, there's a lot of different things depending on who's playing what. Um, much to my surprise, I feel like right now there's like there's like one player per region who I'm convinced is like, okay, you really taking the time with battle boots going into this tournament. And I want to see how many players are doing that in North America because. There's a lot of chatter right now between what's best, Qatar, Scythe, Great Sword. Are we back to just sword and spear all the time? Or are boots going to be the best thing that we're going to be seeing today? And that's what I'm looking forward to here in the North American Winter I mean, after watching the performance from Machete uh, yesterday and just a couple people who pulled out Tuska beforehand, I was super happy because I love boots and I want to see more of them come out. But in North America, this is where we get a lot of really big character diversity. People will start to just kind of mix up the legends a ton. But in the other regions as well, they were playing Roulette Machine on what they decided to pull out. And I think that we could see that early on too. Uh, like you said, Qatar's though, a lot of people are swapping between Qatar's. We saw a lot of Lin Fei, a couple of Lucians that were showing up. I think we might see some Lucian today. I think somebody was saying that Luna was playing some. I might be wrong on that. We'll see. But I'm wondering <laughs> if it's going to default to a Suri all the time. I, I, look, <laughs> a Suri apparently is like the counter to Tesca. So <laughs> hey. that, that's what we've seen so far in the small uh, bits that we have uh, so, result wise. So back to the, or forward to the schedule that we've got hanging up right over here. We've got some we what, uh, okay. What a, All right, what look, a I was is this? I was not necessarily begging in the back, but I was begging for some of these so, matches to get so, up here. Okay, so, so we've got we've got the current world champion. Oh, we got we got the world champ versus the people's champ. The well, and, yeah, and T -H -E it's not like the people's champ, champ hasn't been the world. That's champ. That's what I'm saying. The be, world champ. Be, T H E E world champ before, right? for so Sandstorm. They're they're fighting for, and this is a winners bracket match to get into winners quarters. Yep. 
that's going to be Sinensen versus Impala. And then right after that, the, the, the two players that, at least when it comes to the pre-show vote and the viewer vote, are in contention for that third place mm -hmm. spot. Where people are looking at both Stingray and Boomy and being like, look, you both are playing really, really well. And it's a fight over seeing who's going to be getting into that qualifier for the, the Winter Royale. Because that is absolutely reality here in 2023 yes. with this Brawlhalla Esports season. The top three players in North America will be qualifying for the Winter Royale, which will be happening later this season. Uh, and there will be a huge competition between the best players from the Winter Championship in North America, Europe, and South America. And this is the, the final event for qualifying for that. Yeah, this is why I'm super excited to see that. Of course, this is why we got 1v1s going for, for 2v2s. Got to get people figured out, get them prepped and ready to go for these events. Mm -hmm. And honestly, again, this is one of those toss-ups because even if you discount the fact that this last year, a lot of names really rose up and started to show how good they are, Winters is always that confusing thing, especially in North America. They mentioned it before, and it bears repeating. No, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, only one BCX winner has ever gone on to win Winters right after. Yeah. And that is an incredibly difficult stat. Speaking of which, go ahead and take a look at the stats of these players here. One of the two of them has only recently performed the Card Blue Willow because I only had the one podium, but it was at the event, that being Impala, yeah. getting that first place at the, uh, the BCX Championship. And so talking about Impala, I think this is a really big deal. Impala had an incredibly consistent record of getting seventh and fifth mm -hmm. on these seasonal championships. And so becoming the land monster at the first land uh, uh, in 2022, which, which was BCX, was a really great placement for him. Now, Sandstorm, on the other hand, <laughs> we talk about why how he's the, the champion, we, right? Just, just look at the numbers. 22 first place medals. And the amount of time that he spent in the top three, oh 211,000, all made off of the back of just incredibly good performances. And at the very bottom of the screen, it said free agent. Keep yes. that in mind. <laughs> and no lifetime set count between these yeah, two, zero. Well, and, so, and so another exciting thing that was mentioned on the pre-show by Sparky, but was something that I was very surprised to see and also happy to see from Sandstorm on, on, on social was that like he was saying, this is the most he has really put into preparing for an online championship. That's exactly why I have him in my top three. I have a lot of, I, this weekend I went biased oh. anyways, cause I kind of definitely forgot to do my predictions for the other days, I overslept, but Today, I did not, and uh, everybody's just so up in air. It's like, you know what? I'm going to go with Bias. I love watching Luna, Radish, and Sandstorm. Okay. And today, we're getting what Sandstorm has been preparing a ton of. It's going to be the Arcadia versus the championship winner itself, the Kaya. I'm starting to see why Sandstorm was talking about all those things about how great Sword actually isn't the best weapon in the game because <laughs> he's been very, very good for this. But yes, he's been running with the Arcadia the entire time. And Impala on the Kaya. So interesting to note, despite Kaya getting hit by a lot of balance changes, which were just all nerfs, uh, Impala himself did state... I think these are the things that needed to be hit with the character, and I still think that the character is good. And that's why he's bringing it out here in Winter Championship, going up against Sandstorm, as both of them are kind of fighting yeah, off with the their down six. They both, neither one of them wanted to be the one to budge first, which yeah. is incredibly impressive. Not to mention, also, you have to think about this. Impala has a lot, like, has a huge target on him with the fact mm -hmm. that this is the previous champ, and you have a lot to prove. Not a lot of people believe that they could get that W today, and uh, Impala feeling a little stressed too, but against someone like Sandstorm, just continuously barely being being missed by these D6, Taza. Yeah, this is crazy. Sandstorm jump dash jumping right into the down six. So something that's cool about this matchup between these two spear legends is that their down six function, I think, very similarly in a sense that they're laying a trap for their opponent to fall into. Uh, Impala holding the down six with a chainsaw effect to catch Sandstorm out of those jumps. Meanwhile, Sandstorm laying the trap on the ground to try to catch Impala grounded so that he can follow up with the finisher. That down air recovery just barely not comboing, but we'll see him go for that more often to finish off stocks with the greatsword. Yeah, and this is the weapon that was really the big issue for pretty much everybody, whether it be Luna Godly or whoever, it doesn't matter. The bow was a problem in that previous game, but the D-Light Sarah is going to go ahead and at least get rid of that. That puts Sandstorm on the board. Yeah, it puts him on the board. He took an incredible amount of damage from Impala on the way through there, and Impala's at a state where Dial and Light Recovery, I think, will do it. Impala's incredible at landing signature knockouts with the bow. I want to see if he can get that down sig with the spear again. Probably looking for that dash jump in, but there's that down sig. And Sandstorm doesn't get the jump afterwards to get the pogo off of catching him with the signature. Yeah. And now he's looking for some more damage on the recoveries, but Impala's doing a great job escaping. Yeah, you cannot leave any damage on the board against Impala. He's going to be start hunting. He's going to start hunting for that Nair pretty soon. It's pretty much the main KO option he had mm -hmm. back at BCX. But Impala is actually having a oh. bit of a tough time. All of a sudden, Toss oh. getting in. There's the pogo. Oh. Weapon toss down. 
down. Do we get the close out here? The weapon toss up. Pogo doesn't matter. Weapon toss down again, again. And he's already going to almost take that. Good job getting back on, but that was really close. Yeah, that was an amazing exchange of edge guard recovery, edge guard recovery. And at the very end, Impala makes it back, but he's not unscathed. As we see that neutral that comes through and Sandstorm at this much damage one minute ago mm -hmm. takes the lead after some incredible edge guard pressure uh, and is now up two to one. Impala still looking for that neutral there that you were talking about or anything there. Daylight recovery finally he gets sent flying the smoke trail. Just all sorts of colors there with how much damage Sandstorm had before he went and took off to the skies. That and was we intense too. We, we have like, an even game. Yeah, he was, I, he, like you said, that damage differential was so huge and not just to mention Impala kept reading Sandstorm yeah. a lot. So the fact that he finally got away from him like five Ooh. times in a row. That was beautiful. d -Sync, and tries to follow up again to try and get me a panic recovery upwards. Nothing happens out of that, but Sandstorm's starting to cook. Oh, he's putting the down six, and then he's mixing it up with these dash jump fastball down airs on the spear as well. Most of the gameplay from Sandstorm so far has actually been off the back of the spear after the great sword didn't work too much in the beginning of the game. I can see down six or down air coming out here, and last time when that down six hits, he gets that side light. He goes in for a huge read on a jump out of the side light. Impala dodges down and manages to get out of it, but that D-Light side air could have been huge. Recovery hits, and Impala brings Sandstorm to orange. Another recovery, oh, Ajax. Oh, my God. This has gotten so incredibly close here, Taza. Right now, he's web toss up, going to go over to the great sword and see if he can try and close it. One of those new buffed enders, but that oh. depends if he gets a chance. Impala sending him back off stage. Weapon Toss just gets him out. Oh, and the down stick catches the landing. And what a finish coming up from Impala, where we got to see the lead get torn away from the hands of each other at the very end with Impala clutching it with an amazing down stick finisher. A difference of one damage between both weapons there. Impala showing, hey, He's an all-arounder. No, it, no, no. it doesn't matter. His whole character's kit is going to be used, like you said, even with the changes to Spear Kaya. Spear and bow, I think, had six different things nerfed about them and three Kaya signatures. And still, looking at this, he's so darn good at mm -hmm. Kaya and taking Sandstorm out in that game number one. We're going right back to Apocalypse here, where I... I really don't know how to call this. I think Sandstorm's getting a better idea of how he wants to use Downsick against Impala, but what makes Impala terrifying is that no matter what the state of the game is, he finds a way to land these signatures, whether it's catching a landing, catching a dash jump, or whatever have you. But Sandstorm, this time around, a much better start. Which is really impressive to point out, too, because of the fact that he missed almost every D-Sig prior to that moment, but he never believed that the spacing was bad enough that he'd take a massive punish, which yeah. is the case. He barely took any punishes for it, and all you need is that one singular one to get the job done at the end and his defense has been so on point. Other than the start of this game where Sandstorm's kind of built up a decent lead. Yeah, nice uh, nice unarmed here. Side light waits it out. Never mind. The Beetle Cups charging forth and Sandstorm with the wake up. Catches Coming Impala through. off guard. And that, that signature doesn't he travels a little bit further than maybe he was expecting there as Sandstorm gets a nice early knockout. Side airs from Impala means that he's going to try to get this edge guard here. But Sandstorm has been great great with the spear uh, when it comes to this ground neutral game. The side lights usually work out in his favor, but that mm -hmm. time Impala was able to get his own D-Light side air off yeah. of it. I'm loving watching this right now, too, because we didn't get to see a whole lot of Arcadia last uh, last year. We didn't much. Like, yeah. I think we saw maybe two times where people pulled it out in bracket, and uh, Sandstorm is making it look phenomenal right now as one Pogo comes through, going to avoid the other one, and just gets through just enough with that recovery to avoid the, uh, yet another one. Yeah, down to comes through. Impala being careful not to jump right into that hurt box. Sandstorm puts on another down to and that combo's right in the side air. Goes to the edge guard once again. Oh, keeps that poking so Impala good. off with the neutral lights. Look at the way that Sandstorm constantly like repositions himself too to get Impala to pull first, but goes a little bit too low. Even if he was able to try and find his way back up, he was probably getting caught by another dare anyways. And Impala finally gets one on the board. I still don't even feel super comfortable with the lead because of how good Impala has been at bringing the games back. Yeah, okay, that was big there. So last that changes time, my tone. <laughs> we, we, we saw this exact same scenario, but with Sandstorm mm -hmm. in that much red. And I was thinking, Impala, you got what it takes to do exactly what Sandstorm did to you. And we might see that anyways, just with the stock difference here. Um, playing around that down to quite nicely, gets back onto stage, but that down light goes a little too far in, and Impala really having trouble getting around the down tick pressure coming up from Sandstorm in the Arcadia. Yeah, he's lucky he was able to avoid it that time because otherwise Sandstorm or probably is going to go for a chase. He's up a stock, and you know full well Sandstorm will chase you deep off stage if he has the opportunity oh. to do so, but he's not getting the reads on the dodges. He's instead yeah. just getting one hit a piece, and it's been a bit since I've seen a big string come out of Sandstorm. Oh, he, okay, he got the downline bridge that time around, but he hasn't felt confident enough to go for anything further because it's probably too committal, and that's a huge string from Impala. Gets the recovery towards the end. Uh, neutral sig off of a jump could be pretty big here. Coming up from the bow. I'm not sure how much he wants to go for that, though. Puts up the down. So he doesn't pivot it. I think if he pivoted it, that would have been the stock. The recovery comes through, and Sandstorm picks up a fresh spear. 
Yeah, baby. I see some decided to switch on over. Weapon Toss now is going to get him out and get him the landing. Plus, still having it doesn't matter. So no, gets caught. Like you said before, he uses it both offensively and defensively in a way that you can only really do when you are that committed to a legend. Yeah. Down Sig comes through there pretty well for him, and that's another time we got the knockout, but he's so damaged. Now, this is where it's like, I haven't seen Sandstorm convince me that the Down Sig on the Great Sword has led into anything substantial yet, and Impala has an opportunity. Oh, okay, that recovery comes through, and he really wanted to get as much as he could off that unarmed, but the recovery comes out from Sandstorm as a wake up, and Sandstorm has a convincing game, too. And convincing I mean, like, indeed. 609 yeah. to 393. For, uh, 420 on the spear damage there from uh, from um, Sandstorm was just on point. So accurate about all of his strings. It kind of slowed down a little bit at the end, and then we didn't really see too many of those bridges come through yeah. on reeds for the greatsword. It didn't matter, though, because the, the spear was just enough to get the job done. What do you think? What do you think Apollo's going to do in game three here to try and adjust around that? Well, and here, well, here's the adjustment. I was wondering myself if Apocalypse was going to be a stage that he wanted to continue to go towards because Sandstorm was looking pretty comfortable there. Although I think the way Sandstorm was playing isn't exactly map dependent. The way he was covering the side of the stage, I think, would have benefited a lot from uh, from having platforms there. So we'll see if Brawlhaven just means that Impala is able to get these knockouts a little bit earlier. Uh, we're going to find out because Impala here now on Brawlhaven with the bow doing quite well getting back to the stage and Sandstorm hasn't been able to get any of those great sword finishers but here's an opportunity for a down air edge guard I really want to see what he could do with this great sword because last time you were talking about that 420 damage on the spear the great sword's kind of been something that's just been in between Sandstorm picking up speed well this is definitely the stage to get that to happen you have no platforms to hide on so it's only brawling now it's yeah. just that flat stage which makes those bridges way easier to consistently try and open up but he's still forced over to the spear very close first start here Nair won't be enough just yet of course but another Ooh. delight recovery Recovery from that bow should be enough to do it. Oh, and he doesn't punish the neutral signature with the down sig. Instead, he gets hit by the recovery, barely survives there. Nice job with the recovery on the way back. And what a what a call out. That was with an that amazing call out. Yeah, that he was he was just put in disadvantage for like a solid like 15 seconds in a row. And he's like, I don't care. I'm still swinging on my way back up. And that's just the fear factor that Sandstorm could do to you sometimes. He's never truly in a bad spot, mm -hmm. even when you think he is. Yeah, Impala getting caught by one down sig and decider there. And then just saying like, okay, we're going to try it again. I'll jump right around it. Gets his own side air. Edge guards with the ground pound. Evens things up two to two. Weapon starves. And now he's pressuring Sandstorm, waiting for that new spawn to come in. Side light does not catch the dodge, but the Nair does. And a D light neutral light means that he's going to get some good damage on the Sandstorm. And Sandstorm, he, he tried to go for that down light call out once again. And now Impala is actually adapting to these this down sig play style by trying to play stacked, being underneath Sandstorm. Yeah, big time. I mean, Impala's won. All right, up to that point, Impala oh. won like five interactions in a row. And now all of a sudden, Sandstorm getting something started. Got, got one bridge to get a three piece, but he doesn't get too much else after. Uh, I, I think. However, it kind of feels like the Great Sword is waking up here. Like I, we mentioned it yesterday, I think you need a couple games before Great Sword's really working for you, Ooh. even if he's played it all the way up to this point. Yeah, I, I just got to witness my first down sig into side air from the Great Sword there. So that's something where that, that, that signature is actually working out for uh, Sandstorm on the Arcadia. But Impala, not down yet. Gets back to the stage. Silent doesn't catch him. And that's a good... Uh, it's better than nothing when punishing the neutral signature, and that time he gets the Nair as well. Jumps the Nair, falls, and immediately lands with the neutral light. And these do spot dodges from Sandstorm are not catching Impala off guard, but that downer will go punished, and this could be the edge guard for Sandstorm. The weapon toss over with the Greatsword. I like the mix-up, trying to get the bounce off of that to get a panic jump up. Still not enough just yet. Weapon toss up, of course. That's going to oh. send him to go low. I love the attempt. Pogo does find its mark. He's probably going to get the wall touch here. Still doesn't, though. Ground pound finally, he finally takes that out. What an obstacle course Sandstorm set up. Two spears for flying in the air and a down sig, and Impala was able to get through all of that until the very end when a ground pound came through. Now Impala, with the spear, has to find that finisher there. Pogo went into recovery. Look at this, so good. And, and I'll tell you what, Ajax, I wasn't expecting to see a spear showcase going into the first match no. of the Winter Championship here in North America, but that's what we have uh, between Sandstorm and Impala right now, and it's incredibly fierce. Yep, multiple things. A, North America is just different. B, uh, I expected to see way more of the bow out of Kaya from, yeah. from the starter just because the bow was what was the problem last time. Impala's pretty balanced so far. Yep. We were seeing those 300-300 uh, damage splits, but I, I, I do see what you're saying. Um, Man, these down are so hard. Oh, oh, he jumps right into it, and he was sweating when that got hit. So he's got to be careful. When he touches the stage, he won't be able to hold on the wall very long. 
as a really good mix up too because of the fact that he's pretty much only ever covered the low range of that and decided to go high that time. Uh, now Greatsword is in the way. Weapon Toss over, trying to catch him with the DC again. Paul is still being weapon starved. He should be able to get to it pretty soon, but it lands right in front of Sandstorm. Oh, and he's waiting for the, him to go right. <laughs> yeah. So that was a 50 50 on Sandstorm to go for either the down stick or the neutral stick there. He's like, okay, are you going to try to cover, get the weapon from above or are you going to dash in and dodge back to get it from below? Uh, and Apollo ends up guessing correctly, but Sandstorm still in the problem when it comes to weapon starving. And oh, that would have been an amazing finisher coming out from the Greatsword. Oh my god, we have like a winner's final Excalibur set going on right now between these oh. two. This is so incredibly close, and Bimpala is one good mistake away on Sandstorm They're from closing it. one mistake away. Oh, actually, He's looking for the signature finish. There's the recovery, and Impala gets it at the very end. What an amazing display of neutral prowess. It's a four damage difference between these two players, Ajax. That's, I cannot believe it. That is it. Four damage separating the two, and uh, that time it was way more bow heavy yeah. attached to Impala. Uh, that game round, I think he was losing out on that spear mirror match in that previous game, and the bow here just got the job done. I remember one time where he had five to six interactions in a row, and Sandstorm just could not touch the ground. Yeah, and you were we were literally talking about that in the middle of the game, and I guess I just didn't really register that a lot of that damage was coming in from the bow, just because. I, I mean, he had his spear in hand for quite a bit of that match. He just wasn't hitting him. Yeah, it just right? wasn't yeah. actually hitting him. <laughs> so, so we're going to the Small Fortress of Lions now, and Impala has Sandstorm on match point. This is the reigning world champion going over against, I mean, the, the knowingest said, player in Brawlhalla Esports. The world right? champion. This is, this the go, if you will, to many. Uh, yeah. if, if you join, like Sparky said earlier, if you've watched Brawlhalla for five minutes, you know about Sandstorm. Mm -hmm. But right now, that you know, the storyline is trying to change. He didn't get to that, that to podium finish at BCX, right. but this time around, he's put so much effort into this, so I don't count yeah. him out just yet. However, Impala is showing that that was not a one-time fluke. He's oh. still performing well. Yeah, and what I love about what Sandstorm has prepared for this is that this is an absolutely new play style of Arcadia that previously, oh, that side is so good. That's the first time we saw Impala ever let that rip. He's so good at Kaya Ajax, but what I was saying was is that I do feel like a play style with Arcadia that was previously theoretical or hypothetical, rather, uh, is being demonstrated by Sandstorm here now against Impala. And Impala, after three games, seems to have really uh, cracked the case here. Down six coming through, but Impala is just going crazy here. Nice down six into the recovery, and Sandstorm gets that edge guard there. And that's an amazing knockout coming out from Sandstorm, which I thought was honestly going to become a three to one stock lead at some point. It felt like it for a second there, too. But instead, he's able to like get, kind of close the gap. And that's pretty much what's been going on back and forth between these two. The gap's been getting closed well. I like his attempt at falling off with the neutralites that time. He hasn't really gone for that oh. before. But once again, Impala striking first here and now has Sandstorm on set point. Yeah, that down stick was fantastic. And, and the, 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 the pace of the game is changing in terms of when Impala is using these signatures. It no longer feels like it's a dash back, catch the landing thing. Impala is going in, pressuring Sandstorm to the corners and then hitting him with these incredibly hard hitting signatures and still getting the knockouts, catching Sandstorm in the air, getting the recoveries, goes for the neutral signature and Sandstorm with the spear, goes out the downs and gets hit by a Sarah. And now he has to be careful about the edge guard from Impala here, goes out with that neutral signature. The owl does not connect and Sandstorm with the double recovery could get the edge guard here with one good down light. He gets it down light, Cider. That's the second time that we've seen him have such amazing precision with catching the landing. That was perfectly placed to get him to land on a soft platform, too. He went for that double recovery and faded right yeah. underneath to bait him in the idea that that's what his safest spot was, and maybe he dodged a nair or an, another recovery. Instead, goes right underneath it and gets us to an even point. Oh. I want to see this go to game five biasly. Oh, but yeah. <laughs> at, the, at the moment, Sandstorm is making an effort. Oh, he goes up for the downer, makes up afterwards, and Impala slips right by. Landing opportunity here. Sandstorm does go over to the fresh spear. Looked like he wanted the old one. Side light, down light, side air. He goes in for that bread and butter, and now he's got the down six at the edge. And Paul has to go high, and the down light does not catch. And this the is nares that. are breaking up the pressure. This is that lineup of the previous game where Sandstorm was winning out on the deal, but this time around game number four here, uh, Impala's Spear has looking has been looking much better, but he's going to make his way over to the bow. This is what's been getting worked on. It's already gotten two strings. Oh, the downs that comes through, Sandstorm slips by. Impala with the bow. He knows he's got Sandstorm to the point where any signature that connects could possibly be the game. Sandstorm goes for that weapon throw, pick up down sig, and the recovery clips. Impala with no jumps makes it back. I thought Sandstorm would go for the down light, but he likes to go in for those at the edge of the stage of the downs that hits Ajax. He's one oh. signature away. It's not yet. It's not done just yet, but one more mistake will oh. do it. Here comes the great sword. So does he get a recovery? Does he get a good read on him? Down sick, recovery. recovery and he gets into a game number five. Sandstorm does not go down just yet, and we still get some more. This is the first match of the day, and we are already in what has been a phenomenal set. Oh my goodness, Ajax, this is everything I could have hoped for. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> 
I kid you not, when I went over and I saw like what oh, looked, look at what, that. I was like, where's Stream Q? I see him policy and storm. Give yeah, me yeah, yeah. that, please. And this is exactly why only a 60 damage differential, but that I, was I still like so close. I like the slow-mo on that replay at the end there because we got to see that Impala was definitely still in Hitstone at the end. And I was waiting to be convinced about the follow-ups from that maneuver from Arcadia. Uh, and Sandstorm is now showing exactly why he's trying to catch those landings on the Great Sword. He gets that recovery knockout, even on Fortress of Lions with a relatively high ceiling and much to my surprise, we're back over here on Brawl Haven. Yeah, I'm uh, pretty surprised considering how well, uh, I mean, that was a really close game in general, but yeah, Impala, Impala was brought looking it back so fast. good here. And uh, I also remember back to the fact that this is this is chat's pick, prediction-wise, mm -hmm. to take it all. So there is definitely some fan favorites going on, of course, for the GOAT himself to try and get this W here, but Impala is not making it easy at all, Taza. Yeah, for sure. And even after... <laughs> Even after the uh, after BCX, it was a little surprising to me to see Impala not even in that top three. It was definitely fan favorites all the way through there. But there's a, I think there, it's there's, that. More, there's more reasons than just being a fan favorite as to why Sandstorm can be so high in the viewer vote. So we see that down six air hit into side light. Oh, that was such a great pivot down air. Okay, Sandstorm's really cooking here on this, he this, this really game is. five. Let him cook. He's currently over on the side, but he gets caught by a neutral air, so he's going to get back on stage at least. Impala, this is very dangerous. Impala is so accurate at finding that D-Light recovery when he needs to at the right points. But Instead, he gets caught, and that's going to be Sandstorm getting the first stock. Okay, the neutral sig. Sandstorm's gone for that a few times, and most of the times, Impala was able to punish, and that one actually catches him. Uh, now it's up to Impala here with the spear. Falls to the side air, goes in a little bit too far, and Sandstorm repositions to get one neutral light punish. Impala reverses the position in that nice, what, what, a little bit of an oomph there with the dash to dip down and get the yep. down sig there. And that's why I was talking about the change in pacing. Uh, with Impala as the set has gone on, whereas before it felt a lot more defensive, and now Impala's going out there with these defensive attacks and yep. using them aggressively. We are so more used to seeing him go for slide cancel, neutral sig on the bow, compared yeah. to anything on the spear. So the fact that he's now switching it up is going to trip you up in those positions because you don't expect him to be down there with you. But right now he's down there and he's enjoying the show of the left side of the stage exclusively by himself. Oh, the down ticket, the side light comes through and Sandstorm just keeps, keeps putting out the pressure. Nair into recovery, doesn't hit. He's disarmed and Sandstorm deep, he, he just slides out there with that attack. Is and now Impala can't even get a weapon. And Sandstorm starting to switch it up to more neutralize at the ledge as well. But that's going to be the great sword to close it. And this is a big comfortable lead he has. However, you have to think back to that previous game too where he had a lead like this and Impala brought all the way back. So you cannot get too comfy here if you want to close this out. Oh man, yeah, you are absolutely right. And look at this, the Nair dodge just barely by Sandstorm. Impala tried to dash to pick up the weapon, but Sandstorm steals it away. And now with the spear on the edge guard, Impala has to work extra hard to get past this wall slip. It's gonna be at two, at three. He gets neutralized off and he hasn't been touching oh. Sandstorm. Downlight, side air, dare, dodges out of the way. Sandstorm continues the pressure relentless. He won't back off right now and he was a good reason for it. Like you said, he'd count down those resources. It was getting to the point where he could make that attempt at that dare that he was looking for. But but now goes in, doesn't get anything off the dodge, but he's starting to get some data in the neutral oh. sink, misses. Misses, Impala doesn't go in for the punish, dashes in, doesn't get hit by the down sink, the air hits. Impala needs a strong recovery here to be able to bring it to a one stock to one scenario. Both players <gasps> fighting to stay in the winner bracket, the down air, the, the weapon toss, oh my the down sink. Taz, this is so intense, it's so intense right now. Uh, Impala's gonna go ahead and get over to the spear, one recovery, puts himself into a one stock game, and we are oh, at said there. one stock game. Okay, this is tough. Impala by no means has those string heavy weapons that can get the early knockouts unless, I mean, save a bow ground pound. This is going to be quite the mountain to climb. Good start with the side light, side light. Right. D light side air. Sandstorm makes it back to the stage. That's a great punish coming from Impala, the dash of dare. He's opened up a ton already, but there no, it is. No, not air. just yet, that was so close. But Sandstorm just needs one more good read, and that'll be it. Here comes the spear. Does he go for recovery soon? Who knows, but right now Impala is gonna fall to the Sair, and that is your BCX ship falling to your the world champ. Sandstorm striking back, showing that that effort is playing through as this Arcadia continues him through this top 32. Oh my goodness. I, I by, by all means, this is an upset. Uh, Sandstorm at PR 27, uh, not as active in the previous year as he was throughout most of Rahala history, despite the credentials that he's got. Impala is the reigning world champion, and he just got taken down in game five. Last mm -hmm. stock by Sandstorm, who is, by all means, to me, a completely new breed of player in Brawlhalla with what he has prepared for the Winter Championship, how he's playing the Arcadia, and how he competed against uh, Impala, who honestly looks even better to me on Kaya than he was at BCX. Yeah, and which is crazy somehow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
What a oh, and that's that's winners I, round one. That oh was that was only to start off top thirty two. That's that, that's how crazy this has been of a day. Wow. Winters Winters is always that that crazy nonsense that sometimes happens where you can go and predict anybody you want. You could say okay, this person's been consistent all year, but then they don't perform at Winters. However. I think Impala is going to still be a massive threat in the elimination side of bracket. Nobody should be happy to have to run into Impala down there at all. But Sandstorm has now taken over that number one seed position mm -hmm. in the tournament by pushing Impala down into the limbs. Yeah, Impala down in elimination bracket far earlier than many may have been expecting. Um, and a lot of names are just going to be going down there because the more that I think about it, the more that I look at North America and I go, we have a whole history of players that at one point we're in top three or in winning tournaments, and now we've got like what thirty-two to forty of them. Mm -hmm. So every time that we see one of these uh, these matches, we just have to constantly be surprised that somebody went down as early as we just saw them there. But what an awesome set to begin out the day! Yes, and we're only going to continue. Uh, I actually just realized I was looking at the wrong one. But either way, all these rounds and this, all these matches in the first one are amazing. And we have Boomy Believer time because it is now Stingray versus Boomy up next. Stingray was the person who, of course, I decided to go supervise today. I am a huge Stingray fan as well. Yeah. But I left him just out. However, I think Stingray is the one who's going to probably destroy my predictions in top three because there's a good reason for it. He is the biggest threat to take out most of your favorites. Yeah. Uh, this, this, He's just been so good throughout all of last year. Uh, had that incredible performance at BCX. And uh, also, one of the best Game 5 sets that we've ever witnessed in Brawlhalla history uh, with that clutch comeback. Yeah, yeah. I, that still rings true today. But it's Boomy on the other side, who, of course, has been no stranger to this position so as well. So we just witnessed the 1v1 world champion go down to Sandstorm in a Game 5 set. And over here, we have one of the 2v2 world champions, Boomy, going up against Stingray, PR3 versus PR14. So Stingray is the leading Lance main mm -hmm. in, in North America. The yes. best Lance that we've got in the region and also somebody who's pretty dang good on Spear as well. Yep. And we just saw a lot of Spear focus coming out from uh, both Sandstorm and Impala and Stingray this is quite the pick for me. This, it's yeah, Bryn th coming through here to go against Boomy, who, despite all the talk about playing Orb and Blasters leading up to the championship, is on the Tesca here for game number one. Yeah, there's a completely confusing table of events happening right now, whereas we're not seeing Orion for one, which normally, whenever you see Stingray, you count how many d sigs are going to hit during that set. Instead, he's pulling out the Bryn, maybe the Axis for something like this. But at the moment, Boomy is showing why you could just traverse and fly around the temple pretty easily as Tesca with these boots so far. And those side airs coming through, just arms booming from the boots, and he can't even make it back to the stage. It's a quick 35 second stock coming up from Stingray. And this is, uh, at least in North America, the first time we're getting to see on, on stream the new 1v1 map, Western Air Temple, which I'm excited about. You get those platforms that are alternating the heights after the start of the game, and we'll see how that plays out here, where I think that as far as a spear downlight connoisseur, exactly. you really enjoy those changes depending on how well you play around them. That's exactly what we saw, I believe, during South America, where yeah. uh, multiple times the platforms were fall just in range, and then you see someone go for a D-Light reset, or uh, just go for a punish on it where they thought they were fine on that platform. And you know Stingray's going to have that already lapped out. So I'm very curious what Stingray's got prepared with the axe there. He was switched over to a little bit, and Boomy just uh, beat it while unarmed. Hits him with the neutral signature off the top and evens up the game 2-2. Two to two. Uh, Axe has an interesting uh, buff to it going into this patch where you get those extra two frames of stun. Uh, and I... And so going into this game, uh, I'm wondering if you'll be able to get some kind of follow-up with the Gravity Cancel Downlight or something like that. Yeah, possibly. And uh, one of the things that is kind of stressful here as well is uh, the fact that you're starting off this match against that new legend. You may not be completely prepared for it. And you know Boomy will be prepped. But so far, Stingray hasn't really shown a weakness in that. Uh, he's, uh, he's been phenomenal on his, uh, on his spear so far. We haven't really seen too much of the axe yet. And that's what's making me curious what we see about the next game. That's if he even matters, because so far he's still up in the lead. Now, Boomy falling with uh, that stock there. Stingray pretty far into the lead. Neutralite connects. Another Neutralite comes through, and Boomy going off stage with the boots now, is really having trouble getting something started against Stingray here. Side stick comes through, gets that cider, doesn't use the active input to travel with it, catches the jump with the neutral signature, which I think would cover all the platform heights regardless. Um, 
But with that downlight coming through into the down signature, Boomy is getting further and further behind here. He's got to get the stock finished off. And Stingray, okay, there's the down to catch his Stingray fading back, sends him flying backwards as well. Tesca has so many of those active yes. input options from almost like all of his signatures. That's so what we saw Machete using very well uh, from uh, sometimes from off stage. He would just slide up, get that DSIG active input, toss you the other way. And he actually didn't use active input on Sarah too much, but it's such a good active button at ledge that it just covers so much. Kind of like those neutralites that Boomy took about three times in a row. Now let's see if Boomy can get an edge guard here. Recovery comes through. He's one solid hit away from Stingray, just taking this game pretty convincingly. Uh, Nairs from the boots coming in, trying to catch the landing. Stingray just trying to get down underneath those platforms. And Boomy doing a great job controlling center. Uh, dash forward, dash back. Stingray just waiting for that recovery. And he finally catches Boomy jumping. And that's what's going to cause Boomy to go down in game number one. Yeah, that was a primarily dominant game off the spear, which is like we said before, he is the spear legend uh, amongst North America, and you can see that <laughs> well, zero, about that. Yeah. zero damage. Which, uh, I, I, which, which does prove to me that Bryn is like a, he wants the stat lineup and signature mm -hmm. lineup for the spear. He doesn't want Lance in this particular matchup, yeah. either as the boots. Now I'm curious that if Boomy is forced off of uh, the Tesca, which he's not forced off of yet, if that will change from Stingray. You know, considering the fact that uh, the uh, Vector was uh, kind of struggling when the Lance was out, when mm -hmm. we saw that matchup lineup, I believe it was Wes, uh, they, they, with the yeah, boots. Versus use, yeah, yeah, it was primarily the bow that got the job done. The Lance was kind of getting whiff punished a lot by boots. So I could see that as a solid counter pick option here from Singray, and so far it's been playing out perfectly. Yeah, boots are actually kind of interesting when I think about it to where the how they want to play out their punish game. Oh, he just did it. Bro, he, Stingray is that type of player that just 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 goes for it sometimes and you aren't prepared that's that same fear that you get out of d6 from uh from orion and he's already he's essentially untouched here on this first stock uh yeah that was a crazy early stock for the side thing i think the, the thought that i was having before that side even connected was that i think boots are curious in the sense that their punish game is similar to lance mm -hmm. with how you just want to keep going forward and forward um and maybe that has something to do with it but we just to see the matchup play out, out some more but as it stands right now even with that neutral stick connecting. Oh my God, that was almost such a good play. Oh. But he does get sweat beated and he's not able to get that hit to get the chase dodge back over to the stage. So Boomy answering back pretty quickly, uh, but he's still in the orange. It's been mostly, a, it, up to this point where he switched, it was mostly a gauntlet game. Oh, and now that Nair comes through. Stingray falls down with the down air and the side air. Sidelight connects and tries to go into a Nair. Falls down with that down air. Great punish from Stingray on that, that downlight as well. And Boomy is now a downlight side air, downlight recovery away. He does sneak onto the stage with that side light, but he gets stared off the side of the stage. And Stingray, edge guard scenario here once again. Oh, can he get his first damage with the axe? Yeah, the neutral light comes through. <laughs> I got at least once back in there and immediately tossed it away. It's like, all right, it didn't get the KO I wanted, so it's gone. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just done with this. But uh, we're already, I mean, now now that straight hits here should do it, as he just barely misses, but Boomy's all through it and got the dodge. Weapon throw down onto the stage. Gets caught by the neutral light as Stingray was trying to jump in place. And Stingray, or Boomy, does dodge underneath the weapon throw. Uh, goes back over to the gauntlet. Stingray is waiting for something to spawn through here, but Boomy's doing a good job coming back into this game. D-Light down here, weapon throw, picks up the boots. Can Stingray do anything with this? I mean, Boomy, okay, there's the D-Light neutral stick. That was huge because Boomy was really coming back from what was a huge lead. Yeah, that was a immaculate weapon start that he had going for him there. And essentially, basically, all he really needed was to let him pick it up anyways, because it would have gotten to the axe, but that would have primed him, of course, on the next one to have access to that spear. Um, I, I think Boomy's starting to progressively get better and better here at challenging the Spiros. We see another recovery, not get the knockout, but it, he is keeping it his turn, Taza. And now he already has him back down after what was basically a zero to knockout to start. Yeah, that recovery was pretty great. Stingray looking for a weapon here is the axe, and this is where I think Boomy can really go on the prowl. Nice job with that side air, uh, flying forward to try to reposition with it, and Stingray holding on to the axe a little bit longer than I thought. I was expecting him just to throw it away just to get the next weapon to spawn sooner, which is something that you can do. The less weapons that are in hand, the faster that things come out of the stage. I, I Boomy think <laughs> has taken advantage of this completely and has taken the lead now. Yeah, I think we're, I think we've, we've reached that point where, yeah, you need to throw that thing away, put it in the trash right now, because it has not been getting any hits, and Boomy was just with punishing it like four times in a row and now Boomy is uh, not only with punishing that but he's getting in on the spear way more finally makes a mistake in front of a sidelight but nothing else really comes of it oh neutral light clashes there Boomy still in on the boots he's got to be careful the boots have got to be really damaged right now I think after 
one or two more hits, they'll fly away, and he realizes that. So he goes over to the gauntlets, gets ready to pick up a fresh pair. Uh, Tesca's signature is while they're really good at repositioning until a certain point of damage, they don't send you very far. Yeah, so outside we... of that side sequence, to be honest. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I knew it was coming yeah. soon. It was just, it, he's hovering around. Oh. And that, the D-Sync won't be enough just yet, but will he be able to find another That's side sync? Doesn't even need it, gets the D-Light into the recovery. And Boomy, after being behind so far to start that game, brought it all the way back, basically, on the heels of the gauntlets. Yeah, the gauntlet fundamentals really coming in there uh, very strong. There's some talk about how, and, and we're even seeing this, it's interesting to me, the gauntlets doing more damage and having more impact in this game than the boots when it comes to Boomy's particular playstyle with Tesca. Um, we're going to see that D-Light recovery, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, right on this last stock which is just the bread and butter when it comes to being able to knock out with the gauntlets. They have, to, they have to work a little bit harder in terms of what their their auto combo is for taking out stocks compared to those weapons like sword mm -hmm. or boots that have D-Light side air. Um, but it's still a very good option coming out there from Boomy. And, and that's interesting to see because I think that like, there, there was a little bit of, a, of an overreaction to losing that neutral light uh, knockout option. Uh, but Boomy seems to be doing just fine with it on the gauntlets. Yeah, that's honestly, like, the fact that he got them warmed up the way he did, too, was huge because before he just had literally no answer to Spear, and then he had an answer to both Axe and Spear. And Stingray is still trying to get the Axe warmed up at the moment. It is at least getting more hits, He's and, of course, that straight hit factor has already put him up to orange. This has all been on the Axe so far, and the boots are coming out here, and Stingray still holding on to the weapon, being like, okay, I do have this prepared for something in particular, and I just want to see a little bit more of it. Falls down with the Nair, looks for the downer as well, and Stingray walking forward with that side light, Attacks on a little bit more damage. He's got Boomy stuck on that platform. And something I've noticed for both players is that they're doing a very good job uh, punishing their opponent when they are on that platform and preventing them from getting down on the center stage where they might be more comfortable engaging in neutral. Yeah, big time agree. The soft platform uh, control has been amazing on all parties involved. There hasn't really been one that's more dominant than the other. Considering the fact that Spear is in the hand of one of the others too, that Ooh. it's still that way. When we see Stingray strike first here, he wasn't able to hold the lead before, but I feel like this game with the ax kind of popping off a bit at the start, I feel a lot more comfortable about seeing right here in game three. Yeah, Nair comes through. Didn't get anything off of that hit, but he goes for the neutral light right afterwards. He's been using these Nairs to catch Boomy's aerial attacks a lot more. Downlight side air comes through. That will take Stingray off the left side of the stage. That's such and a then satisfying switches over to string the string for me to watch. I, I I know I am in point a party of probably like one on that, but I love watching that go off. It's uh it's so smooth and just the way that the the boots are starting to pick up now for Boomy. Yeah. You mentioned before most of the even though the presence of the boots kind of got him around, it was primarily the gauntlet in that previous game. Right, yeah. And, and now the boots are starting to show off as those finishers. Downlight side after the side light, though. And the weapon throw catches the dive kick. Boomy has to go low. Ground pound down air. Both options are really great for the axe here. But Sting ends up sliding back onto the stage. Boomy comes back. He realizes the edge guard's over and tries to starve the weapons out. Side light, D light. Oh, no. The Ooh. ground pound gets the read. And Stingray can't get the recovery as Boomy dodges straight up. And look at what an edge guard for Boomy. Boomy's like, hey, this is what happens if you don't finish your food off the side of the stage. Is That's it. It rings true. We have to bring it up at least once an event. Boomy is one of the most difficult people to edge guard in the history of Brawlhalla, period. Now, this is going to probably be a closeout now. You occasionally make a mistake. It better, it better but be. <laughs> you, but like you said, after what happened last time, you better not let him back on. Otherwise, you're going to take too much damage for it. Yeah, good job. With the double dare from Stingray. Switches over to the spear. Good read on the dash back. Hits the cider and follows Boomy all the way to the edge of the stage. Tries to get that dodge, diagonal dodge in with the nair on the spear. But the, the radius on that spear nair is a lot tighter now that, that the, the uh, threat zone has been reduced mm -hmm. since that last patch. Stingray, however, still doing well with these recoveries. Boomy in that difficult state of trying to get back down onto Stingray. And he just can't do it. Double nair could get a third here. <laughs> Boomy jumps all the way around. It, and now the roles have been reversed. Tries to get back on the stage, and Boomy just starts kicking. Yeah, like you said, even with that threat range being Ooh. reduced, it's still an incredible air-to-air -air option. Uh, Boomy's starting to get things going. We are at deep in the red on both of them here. Looks for the read, does not get the read he needs, and that Nair is going to come through. Could be huge here. Oh, he wants that landing, the Sarah, and he gets it. Boomy puts up the down light, tries to catch the landing, and Stingray with the axe of all weapons on Brin gets that damage above 600 and gets the finisher with the Sare. And we are seeing on those stats, I think that was 247. Yes, I was gonna say way more even game that yeah. time around. 247 on the ax to bridge to 343. <laughs> Very, very needed because Ooh. in the previous games, the spear was starting to get played around. As you can see here, he was able to close it out this time. And at the very end, when he couldn't find those stairs at all before, finally gets a bait out of Boomy so he could close it out and push himself up in the set. 
Okay, and we're going to game four, back against the wall. Boomy sticking with Tesco all the way through in this matchup against Stingray. And Stingray now showing me that the Brin is just a complete, like, I, I love that the, the, the Brin is the choice coming out here from Stingray because I think Axe as a weapon in general has been talked about just a little bit more than Hammer, which is none <laughs> at all. And, and, so, and so seeing him being able to use this really well to combat the boots and the gauntlets from Boomy is really fun. Um, Let's just see how this match plays out here because boomy has got to bring it to a game five. That down takes a great start. I mean, it'd be an interesting timeline here at this point where we have to normally, this would be a, no, a, a normal statement, but if Boomy takes out Stingray, that would guarantee that both Sandstorm and Boomy would be fighting for that winner's top eight qualifier in the next round. Yeah. But that depends on if you could take out one of our highest sheeted players, of course, PR number three in Stingray to try and prevent that from happening. Oh, and that down sig, what a great catch on the landing coming up from Stingray there. Boomy sent flying off the right side of the stage. Two stocks left for Boomy here. Uh, and then he goes down on these two. He's also going down in into the elimination bracket in winners round one of top 32. Stingray with the spear is doing fantastic. Avoids that weapon throw coming up from Boomy as well. Boomy falls with the nair, has the boots, and now going for that side stick, that down stick. He's, the, the reason you go for the down stick there are really great because you can send people off, has great force, puts them off the stage, you get those edge guards. But if you miss that, I mean, you are in quite a bit of, uh, of end lag, but that's a great downlight side air. You're talking about how much you love that combo and not mm -hmm. using the active input for the extra oomph is I a like great I like what he did before that too. He baited yeah. the idea. He put himself in a position where he was just going to sear in that spot. Mm -hmm. So you saw Stingray fade back a little bit to try and play around what could have been a sear or maybe an attempt at jumping off with a sear. But as soon as he already burned his jump backwards, immediately able to cover that with that D-Lights here. And uh, we've gone back to an essentially even game here. Yeah, uh, Sting, Stingray and Boomy both are trading blows about equally there. The neutral lights have been catching Stingray's landings pretty well. Boomy goes in for a crazy pivot down, sick there. And Stingray with the axe tries to dribble Boomy off the ground. Gets a nice rising dare. Neutral light catches the forward momentum there. I think axe, the, the more I'm watching this, this is something that I've, I've talked about a ton with axe in the past. When fighting Lance, I like the neutral light because it catches the moves that move forward. You stop them before it actually threatens you. And boots have a lot of that moving forward momentum as well with the down light, with the side light, with the side air. Um, and if you just stop it with the neutral light, you can stop a lot of people's game plans when it comes to neutral, but that side zig will catch that landing, send them flying off the left side, and Boomy will take the lead in game four. It was a whole jump scare, and I love seeing it. It's just every time, you know, sometimes you're just not prepared for the instant swap into that side zig, but that's going to be an immediate revenge KO. And uh, you have definitely m mentioned this many times before, and it's playing true where you said Axe was incredible at Lance shutting it down, slowing it down. And we, you know, th now we're kind of seeing why not just the uh, the spear signature kit, but also the Axe has been playing pretty well. So up to this point now where it's starting to warm up against the boots. Oh, and now it's last stock scenario. Stingray taking the lead a little bit with that downlight side air. Boomy playing around the platform. And honestly, I think the platform's been doing him a disservice whenever he's against Stingray's spear there. He's got to be mm -hmm. careful about it because it's not a safe haven. In fact, it is a combo haven for Stingray. Nair comes through. He's around that platform, and Stingray is just complete control over it. Nair, weapon throw up. The falling side air gets stopped barely by Boomy on arm, and he's waiting for that weapon spawn, and it comes in perfectly for him. Boots now on his feet. Let's see what he can do with it. Falls to Nair, and the neutral light just stops the forward approach. Stingray Stingray has got complete control over center stage, and Boomy trying to go in with that down like gets hit by an air. My God. Boomy. Side air hits. Weapon Bo throw. <laughs> no dodge on Boomy here. Edge guard could come through from Stingray. Boomy's been playing Temple Run for the past, oh. like, solid 30 seconds and more. He kept running away from the giant boulder that was the fearful nature of Stingray. He was a massive obstacle. He could not slow down. He kept pushing him into that corner. You said it, he was controlling him on the platform. And even though he didn't get that follow-up near on that last one, he followed him back down after he panicked and jumped away. And he Ooh. never relinquished that turn. And that gives Stingray that three to one victory. You know, there's something really cool about that down signature from Brynn as well that I just saw there in that moment. Boomy was trying to punish either a dash forward or something in place, because like when you use the neutral light, you step forward and then you kick. And a lot of Tesca's moves on boots in general put your character up a character space. And the down sig starts in front of you, reaches forward, and then reaches back. So Boomy couldn't even jump out of the way in time with his dodge being gone uh, to avoid getting hit by that signature. And I think that uh, Stingray with this Bryn pick uh, I like it. It's looking really good. He had a lot of answers to the way that Tesco was being played, and Boomy 
was changing the way that he was playing, switching from a boots-focused gameplay to a gauntlets-focused gameplay to even catching landings with the side six. And Stingray adapted to every single bit of it and came out on top with a solid 3-1 victory. Yeah, and that was after the start where basically the axe wasn't doing anything at all. We talked about the one legend, uh, or like the one weapon legend for a bit there. That, with that, that spear, was game one. It was yeah, zero damage. And it, it worked until it wasn't, and then it the axe came to play when he just needed it in time. And that was just phenomenal. It was just phenomenal gameplay and that's, from him. Uh, that's like a top top player level thing that I love to see, which was, it was, mu I think now, now I'm like confident in this. It was much less that the, he couldn't use the ax. It was more of the, you haven't done anything to make me want, need to use it yet, right? Mm -hmm. And that's one of those things where it's like, once you show me that I need to use what I have prepared with the ax in this matchup, then I'll start doing it. And that happened as we got further in the set. But game one, Stingray won that with Spear alone. And yep. so that's really, really exciting moving forward into the Winter Championship as we're starting to see that in North America, Spear seems to be reigning supreme. It's working incredibly well right now for pretty much everybody pulling out. We saw Sandstorm get the W with it. Of course, we saw Kaya before from Impala. And we're going to be seeing more Kaya coming up in a second because I just took a look down at the bracket and my brain originally was locked in today. you like, ooh, we might get some Sandstorm Cody. That is not the case. We are not going to be seeing that because we're going to be seeing a matchup coming up that's a little bit different, which you'll find out of course, after we're done, which you can actually see behind me. Spoiler alert. We're going to go to a short break. And when we come back, we're going to be moving into the winner's qualifiers for top eight. Don't go anywhere. You find yourselves outside of town, but you yeah, sense you danger. It's the dark yeah, sorry, warlock. Man, I brought Volcom. that water. I put it there. Because I usually am there. No, 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 no. A I... hero must rise up to meet this challenge. Well, there's who could it be? I will face this foe, the great Jay Young. The hero blades, levels up, and unlocks new rewards. But the hero cannot defeat Volkov alone. I call upon my team of great adventurers. Sidra, the beast master. Hugin, the bard. And Kaya, the cleric. They'll need items and familiars to succeed against the great Volkov. Now that the heroes are ready for battle, it's time to roll for initiative. The battle begins. Are you ready? Three, two, one, brawl! Adventure awaits in Brawlhalla's Battle Pass Season 7. It's all fun and games until someone rolls a one. Ah! Watch out! I have a cannonball! Ah! Oh, where's my cannon? Ah! Can you have my cannon? Ah! Cannon? Ah! <laughs> you good? <laughs> And we're back here with the Winter Championship, where we'll be getting into Winner's Quarters, where we're going to be fighting out what's happening with the whole Spear Meta deal in here in Winter <laughs> Championship. I'm very excited about it, because we were talking a little bit before this matchup coming up, which we've got uh, uh, 
I think it's right there. Boom. I'm like yes. kind of in the way of it. Sandstorm's going to be on stream again, and it's going to be against anime. And you might be like, what, anime? The whole genre? No, <laughs> not the whole genre. Anime fan, I think it used to be anime fan 1266, if I remember correctly. Is just anime now. Yeah. So we, we, we're getting that nice little thing. This happened a lot in, in Europe uh, where people were truncating their names to being like easier to cast. And now anime is over here uh, fighting up against Sandstorm with a really great upset over Cody Travis. Yes, a 3 0 upset at yeah. that, taking it over Cody Travis and going to be lining up Sandstorm into yet another Kaya. So we uh, just saw how Sandstorm was able to perform incredibly well with the Arcadia against the BCX world champ in Impala with that Kaya and kind of like the, the face of Kaya for the most part. But the character is just still doing very well, even with the changes that you mentioned before. Right. And uh, anime, the fact that they were able to take the 3-0 over Cody just goes to show that this is not going to be an easy feat to try and get into that winner's semis uh, side of bracket. Now, much to Sandstorm's benefit, um, there's not really any better Kaya practice that you can get besides, I guess, flying over to Europe and fighting Akno than Impala. Right? True. So, so he is very warmed up for this matchup coming up if that's going to be the legend that anime is going to be locking in. Um, I am seeing a little bit of a different thing on our screen right now, yep. uh, which is exciting. They're going into stage striking, but let's just take a look at the head-to-head oh, -head here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anime so is really fighting for this uh, this top eight placement here. With the comparison for top 32 placements, only four. So anime doing a really great job at the very start of the season. Uh, being a player that I did cast before, but never even, like, considered going into top eight, mm -hmm. this is really cool to see him make it this far. And obviously, it goes without saying, this would be a, a remarkable upset for him. And we're looking at, forward. even though it, you know it's, it's Sandstorm, it's still PR27 Sandstorm versus PR25. So that means that one of these oh, two yeah. at that mid-20s range is going to make winner's top eight in the PR1 slot. Oh, yeah. Or the seed slot. Uh, this the is, seed one slot, this I is technically say. an upset for Sandstorm. You know, <laughs> we by, but by PR, if, if it, happens, it technically is an PR, upset. It's, a, it's just a, it's it's amusing to think about these things. Uh, um, <laughs> however, <laughs> it is a great sword showcase. Great sword showcase. Say that three times fast. Uh, yeah. As uh, the diamond head is actually what has shown up. Guitars have come into the picture, which, like oh. we said before, we're gonna see plenty of guitars. Uh, we saw we actually saw quite a bit of this from uh, Luna towards the end of last season as well. Yeah, so uh, prefacing this match here, I'm very interested to see how anime uh, adapts to this matchup coming through because despite Sandstorm being PR27, that is from inactivity. That yes. is not from lack of ability. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Sandstorm has put in a lot of time and is essentially playing Arcadia in a way that nobody's seen before and going up against the anime man, uh, or anime, I'm just I'm already autopiloting. <laughs> On anime with the diamond uh, head is going to be a tough match indeed, but that neutral that comes through and that is a nice little bit of adaptation that came through from the very opening, which was like a 19 second stock to a great sword sidelight finisher. So it's essentially, yeah, there was all it was all Sandstorm show at the beginning, but uh, you have to be very careful about that neutral stick. It covers an incredible amount of range. It's really good on anti air, and so the the fact Ooh. that. That lead has dissipated actually pretty fast. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say that he was looking good for a second, and then Sandstorm struck back immediately to put himself basically in the same lead he had before. Yeah, Sandstorm, nice side air coming through. The down sticks are going to keep anime airborne, uh, and we've seen that spear players in general are just masters of covering the single floating platform. I mean, we just saw Sandstorm box anime off the side of the stage like four times there with spear neutral air, with side air, with neutral light. Neutral uh, lights have been phenomenal at the ledge like the entire time for anybody uh, who's been rocking it so far today. And uh, the anime fan kind of struggling to get around that, but the recovery still won't be enough just yet. Yeah, so this is the first uh, bit of guitars that we've been able to see on stream today for the winter championship and sandstorm already adapting quite well to that first knockup the anime got onto him but the cider will come through which was that uh he's taking advantage of diamond's amazing neutral signature yep. covering his head where most guitar legends like outside of lucian can't yeah uh, it's a mini game that you now go into because you are now going from what was a dodge around recovery to oh now i have to worry about neutral stake and recovery and you have no choice you have to guess correctly yeah and spot dodging or jumping up okay well that was a great finisher there from sansa but uh jumping up or dodging in place can be risky too because guitars can also just be like hey it's not like i don't have recovery uh, so they can follow up with a lot more there. But that was uh, that was a pretty dominant game you, from Sandstorm. You wouldn't believe me when I say that these stats right here are true. When it's 217 to 247 with the Greatsword being the one at 217, just because the Greatsword was so on point mm -hmm. that when he got his hits, it usually led to a closer. Ooh. As we see again right there, he the Greatsword popped that off. If, you, if he autopiloted there on that side air, I could see a world where he was just trying to get the hit right away. But when he noticed, hey, if I turn the Sarah around, 
I get the knockout as opposed to bouncing him off the platform. That's how he gets that that uh, that last stock there and that game number one really solid play. And I think this is more of like the um, the hypothetical strategy with Arcadia coming out into play that we're seeing right now. Whereas against Impala, it became like a really unique like. Yeah. Godlike player versus godlike player situation. Here it's like you do a lot of the damage build up with the spear, you get the finishers with the great sword, and sometimes get them even earlier than you would. That was literally the battle characters. of the D Sig in that last uh, set against Apollo. Oh, Whereas goodness. this one, yeah. we've seen it, but it's mostly just been the great sword show. And uh, this is now we get to see that great sword that he was kind of talking about saying it's really strong right now. And of all places, we've ended up on Small Brawl Haven as the second stage here. I'm, oh. I, I have extreme amounts of curiosity is the way I will put it on how we ended up here well, uh, let's, after let's that find first out. game. So, so something, something that Diamond Head ha has is amazingly early knockout potential. Uh, that incredibly high force. And then on the Katars, you catch with that side sig on Brawl Haven, and you're gone in orange no matter what defense that you've got. And it's the same case when it comes to the gauntlet signatures as well. Now, we've seen mostly the Katars from anime, which I believe is going to be the focus here if we're following that, like, thread of Katars are, are meta. But uh, we'll see if anime can find any of those signatures here. As he goes forward with that side, like, there's the side stick looking for that over the edge. Nair boxes Sandstorm off the stage, and that ground pound goes so low that Sandstorm actually reacts quite like panically. Yeah, that was, a, that was a last second dip out of there too. And he's been playing really well around both the Psysic and the D-Sig from the Katars at the ledge. So the Ooh. idea of going for the Katars at the, uh, the ground pot the last second was good, but he gets the first stock here. And this time he got it without having a very bad uh, great sword stock happened to him. Yeah, I like that turnaround with the down stick there as well, uh, using it in a similar way to him, how Impala uses the uh, the down stick on the spear. So just seeing those fade backs is really cool. And now Anime really doing great with the guitars. Falls in for that side air. That down stick tries to go for a landing, and Anime is just stacked right on top of Sandstorm. And we're seeing a solid lead from Anime uh, going into this game two. Neutral Sig will finally put a stop to that, though. Yeah, that, that first stock here in game two is the telltale sign for me of how that Cody Travis set went. Now I understand how he was able to zone break blasters consistently and get underneath that and make him feel uncomfortable. But here goes Sansom going for the pogo at the oh. end to try and get a little bit Guys more out of it. <gasps> oh, and he gets him. That's amazing. Okay. Turns around, pivots the side sig because it has a reversal yep. in the reversal element to it. So, like, you want to be able to punish with the side sig there at the edge of the stage. You've got to be that on top of it. And he saw that that dodge was gone. He was sweating. Mm -hmm. That's the stock. That was all because of the fact that Sandstorm decided to go for that pogo at the end. He decided right. to go for that extra bit. And that was one less resource he had. So, that was a guaranteed punish for anime. And now he has the potential of finding himself a game two here. Okay. Sandstorm trying to fight back with the siders there with the spear. Anime landing on the stage and a good gravity cancel downline into Nair from Sandstorm means that more damage will come through, but look at that. Blasted away with the down ticket. That's a two-stock anime. All right. I gladly stand corrected. The PRs might be accurate. Well, also, <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, you said at the beginning, you were talking about that KO potential of Diamond Head here on Brawl It's Haven. really good. In my brain, I went, bro, you just had such a hard time against Greatsword. Why would you give yourself no soft platforms? But instead, it didn't matter. It was 3-6. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it just didn't matter at all. And uh, now we're going to go over to a slightly wider range here with Demon Island. Yeah, uh, let's see how this changes here. This is the Great Sword Runway stage. Yes. Uh, and so, so much in a counterpick fashion. All right, well, we're at a stage where Sandstorm will be able to breathe a little bit nicer. I think the one thing that anime has. Uh, <gasps> oh, the down ticket to the Sair was so sick off of that combo. Let him cook. Oh, he man. Was going in further, but uh, it's still now, uh, this is. In that range where you have to watch out for the great Silent Enders. finisher will do it. Oh, I thought that was going to be it. He goes in for the neutral light, catches the landing. He really wants to get that dodge. A lot of attacks from the great sword will do it now. The new uh, range of knockback from the neutral light finishers as well sends you off the top, guaranteed. Uh, and knocks out a little bit earlier than before, which was a nice little buff to the great sword. So we'll mm -hmm. see if Sansa is able to get it because at this point in time, uh, anime could go down to a lot of attacks. Yeah, anime has gone down to one singular button in neutral air, but it's worked. He hit him four times in a row. Uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Keep Ooh. it going. And now he has him in position. No, <gasps> that was really good. I was actually curious before because he was going for slide cancel neutral stakes almost every other time in that spot. Instead, he walked off slightly and then immediately hovered back on after what looked like it would have been another attempt at a side cancel off stage. Instead, goes back on stage. Oh, and there's that neutral light finisher that I was just talking about there to be able to equalize things. But man, that was so sick because that was, that was the first neutral stick that we saw too, where he wasn't relying on a neutral light opener. Mm -hmm to lead into it. He just called Sandstorm out and it knocked out as early as it possibly could have. That was an amazing, uh, just being cognizant of how much damage his opponent has with when his character can knock out is so fantastic. Recovery comes through, 
Sandstorm spot dodging just defensively, hoping that Anime doesn't get in. And that dash back to bait out the down stick was huge, but Sandstorm still capitalizes. Uh, you got to be careful about <laughs> the last time that happened, you got caught with a, <laughs> a side stick at the ledge, oh. so you do not want to get caught again. However, he is starting to build up the damage through the Katars one more time. However, D-Sig won't be enough yet. Tries to slide off, see if he can oh. catch him. And that was beautifully executed. Sandstorm never went for that mix-up before. Only ever just went for the second dip. That was so well played. It's the first time that I've seen Sandstorm do it this year, but honestly, the gravity cancel sidelight as a knockout is like a, a, a classic to me. Starting, he, I, I, he's done it so much with unarmed sidelight just to be able to get that extra bit of oomph when somebody's out of their jumps, but with the great sword, if you gravity cancel a light attack, you get a slightly weaker but still strong version of your finishers. Uh, anime hitting right back there with a the knockout up the top, but Sandstorm is showing how powerful the range of the sidelight finisher when gravity canceled can be. Uh, and we're back to an even game here in game three. This is looking so similar to that Impala set as well, mm -hmm. where it has just been going down to the wire after what was for a second there, that game one was painting a very different picture, but anime has picked it up a ton. This is the most, we, I think we've seen gauntlets be out in one consecutive session, yeah. uh, but it could still get the job done here if we could just find one good neutral air and at least get him up to, uh, to orange before he dips out. Oh, okay. Side air hits. Anime gets underneath the down six. Side light Nair goes and gets the side light Nair again. Goes for the falling side air, but he didn't get the fastball. And Sandstorm catches the landing. Side six punished. Is that going to be it? No, the down light finisher comes through. Ooh. The crystal dodged out of the way, but the down light recovery. That's it. Sandstorm barely clutches game number three on what was feeling like the most amazing gauntlet combo I saw all year. That was Ugh. so scary because prior to that moment, they were both pretty reserved in how often they would just kind of rush. Yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, gas pedal went down. And what an amazing Ooh. play there with that GC sidelight to just go ahead and close it out. But this okay. right here, this is the anime. This. this is an anime highlight into Sandstorm getting the knockout there. Really great job. Okay, that down light finisher I thought was going to be it. But D-Light recovery, Sandstorm, that has been winning him games. His ability to pick out his opponent's drift when they're trying to land snipe them with the down light and get that recovery or side air, whatever's more appropriate to get the knockout. If without that, Sandstorm would be struggling in these matchups. And that's just how prepared he is with the weapon against all kinds of opponents as he's now up two to one against Anime in the winner's quarterfinals. Yeah, big time agree. His anti airs with D-Lights have actually been second to none so far, like pretty much this weekend, which is crazy considering how many great spear plays we've seen so far mm. but uh right now we are in what would be the elimination side Whoa. match for anime and the last time he was put in a position where he went down one he looked incredible going into game two. Oh, if anime slide charge that neutral stick the other way he could have possibly gotten it sansor makes it back to stage neutral light and a recovery what a classic coming out from anime on the guitars there takes the lead here on demon island on game four interesting to note Despite that last game going to a loss, anime is okay coming back to this stage. Um, yeah, really it just, that, and it was close. It was that close. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that it was. I think that anime understood that even though it was slightly closer, oh. he was still able to reset more often than he, uh, with with uh, Sandstorm in that game. Nothing really went too south for him. He was just barely off of winning that game. Yeah, Sandstorm really put on the pressure with the down stick. We saw that in the last set. We're seeing it there as well. Catches him with the gets the jump recovery. What an awesome combo. Arcadia is so unique when it comes to Legends and Brawlhalla in the sense that your signatures really are just setting up for Look, your knockout moves. When we went to break, I opened my phone and right away I saw after the Impala set, Sandstorm, the only word. D Sig. And that, <laughs> that has been the theme of what we're seeing. Arcadia's D Sigs have just been so good That's at just gameplay. pumping people out and making them get hit. And also, you have to back off. You can't just yeah. rush him down. You have to respect the, it. The second that you get into these situations where neutral game is being played, Sandstorm is saying, okay, this is Brawlhalla neutral game plus. <laughs> Add the tweet in there, right? You go the down stick in there, and it's really forcing opponents to consider that because you have to play around that hitbox so well. That weapon throw so close to being not real does actually connect with anime. Oh, neutral light side light comes through. Can he catch this landing? Of course he can, Ajax. Of course he can. The Soon down as the light dodge the was burned, man, he said, oh, this is a free closeout. It's so difficult to get around Sandstorm in those positions, and now he has one stock that away was, from getting winner's That was eight. like some Queen Nye style punish, too, with the delay and sig. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, Arcadia's got that. But anime hits right back, knowing as much as we were celebrating that punish from Sandstorm, anime has been right on top of Sandstorm's heels in this game number four. He's, they're both 
So he's one stock away from making it to a game five, and Sandstorm wants that 3-1 because Anime, if he gets the win on this map, I, I don't think we're going back to Brawlhaven, but it looks like any map can do it when it comes to how well he's been playing with the Diamond Head. A big agree, and this is a cred. Once again, much like last game, it went down to last stock last oh. hit, so you can't get to company. Oh. Weapon down, he's going to no, be able to come down. The spear. Oh, the spear. Sandstorm. No. He went for the weapon <laughs> and didn't touch the stage. <laughs> I think that's what happens, right? Hold uh, on. We, let's, we ha we, we, let's take a look back and yeah, see what we're happened looking, here. We're looking, we're looking. All right. Gets this down tick is so good. This is like every Caspian player's dream. Gets the weapon throw as Sandstorm's throwing his own weapon, and anime hits his head. And here I thought, okay, well, that's the edge guard being over, right? He touches. He doesn't actually touch. He goes and grabs the weapon, and he goes, oops. <laughs> And just falls. He was so close. He was, he was, he so, was close. so close. He basically like you, I, he he absolutely like like sniffed the wall or you something. Got, like gotta, I don't know there's how a, his there's face a unique did animation it. for when you touch the wall. You gotta wait for that. And he ends up playing a little too quickly. He wanted that spear that badly. Like went and in, it cost him. Went in for the free sample for the food and then dipped before they could ask him for payment. It's like, but he wasn't around to stay close enough. And now we have a game number five in what was looking close to being a game four victory for Sandstorm. And you gotta be feeling really good for that because no matter what happens, we take those if you're anime. Yeah, that was what a, what a clutch. And in that edge guard scenario, I mean, despite Sandstorm not touching the wall, it came from anime being amazing with the down signature, which was basically designed for that exact situation. Oh, and Sandstorm not expecting the down to hit, doesn't get the cider follow up afterwards. It might be okay. Of course it is, just swings and bats anime off the left side of the stage there as he takes the lead here in game number five. That batting average is looking phenomenal so far on this great sword throughout this set, and it is uh, pretty much what has kind of been the only like slowdown to the Qatars from anime because it's mostly been an anti air game with that spear before. So, but speaking of anti airs, he's already taken quite a few. This burn dachi just misses the landing on it though. Yeah, anime coming through with the side lights. Gets the Nair, puts down the neutral light, goes in for the side signature. If he pivoted it, that could have been okay. Uh, but Anime, this is the most that we've seen him fall behind since game number one. He really needs to find his finisher here. Neutral sig forces Sandstorm to go low, tries to get that recovery, and Sandstorm's just staying grounded. And that down sig, okay, that pummel comes through, but we're in a new age of gauntlet neutral light. You're going to need more than that if you want to get the knockout. And that recovery is exactly what more he'll need to get, bring it back to a 2 2 score line. We already seen that he's able to make uh, some pretty impressive strings with gauntlets at that. So Sandstorm cannot be too comfortable here. The anime getting in there. I mean, got a, a, oh, I like that. Try to cover the I panic like it, out yeah. so he doesn't get caught on the way down after that dare. Yeah, you know, Sandstorm manages to punish it, but I did like the idea quite a lot as well. Goes forward with the Nair, catches one landing with the neutral light, catches two landing with the neutral lights, goes for the dashed up cider, but he falls into the down sig. Sarah comes through, Sandstorm has edge guard opportunity. He knows that he swim, but anime lands with the Nair, and he side airs right above the down sig threat, but doesn't matter. Sandstorm with the true combo of Greatsword Dare Nair takes anime off the top and brings him down to his winner's bracket stock and hits him with two giant weapons on the way back. Two volleys off the top of the head, and that is uh, going to get, hopefully it doesn't get into his head as we are sitting here on what is once again the potential set point for a Sandstorm as he's trying to get something started here. Avoids the neutral stick, gets over there, goes for a D-Light read, but now he's in a really Weapon bad drill? spot. The weapons on Side light. just oh. gets him out. Oh, he goes with the down light, expecting Sandstorm to fastball down, and Sandstorm makes it back. Hits one Sarah, and Sandstorm now in complete control over the stage. Doesn't get the read on the dodge. Anime goes Ooh. all the way up the neutral signature, and Sandstorm just barely whiffs the down stick, and that side light finisher might be it, Ajax. Is he going to be able to get by this? He gets up over the top, and he just misses. The neutral center recovery won't be enough just yet. The spear is out. One more recovery from spear should do it, and the oh. gauntlets won't be enough just yet to get him at least the last stock. The neutral stick comes through. Sandstorm boxes him away with the neutral light, and that down stick, which he got a ton of miles off of on Brawlhaven doesn't work out and that gravity cancel down light finisher actually my favorite move in great swords kit it's so sick you use that in the air you get the twirling motion but you fall down so you cover a little bit of the air and the ground as well and it's a powerful move to boot and sandstorm finishes off that match in style as he goes on into winter side top eight here at the winter championship i am so happy to see this performance from him because he's been Talking a lot lately, like if you see the YouTube channel, you see that he has been working on the Arcadia of mm -hmm. late, talking about how it's a potential answer, not only going into boots, but just potentially into the meta in general. And it is working so well. And kudos to Anime for Ooh. making that as solid as that was. That was so close multiple times to yeah. Anime moving himself into set lead. You think back to that game three where he just barely missed out on winning on Demon Island. Well, we get to see some cool developments as well because there was some discussion that I was seeing on socials in Brawlhalla where it's kind of like, oh, right, yeah, Qatars are good right now, but there's more legends 
regions than just a Surrey, which we were seeing over the weekend in the other regions, and seeing anime push uh, Sandstorm to Game 5 as hard as he did on the Caspian or Diamond Head uh, was really awesome to see, and doing it with both of the characters' weapons as well. Yes. Really, really exciting. But yeah, Sandstorm off of pure Arcadia has Game 5 his way into Winter's Side Top 8. It has not been easy, Ajax. He no. is proving it, but it has not actually yeah, been no, easy. It has not been easy at all. And a reminder that that is the Seed 1 position of the bracket. So you figure, you know, like Seed 1, usually in terms of how it goes, has the easier path, quote unquote, mm -hmm. for their trip up. But well. that hasn't been the case. Cody falling to anime, he, uh, him taking out Impala, that guarantees, again, that's a top eight finish for him. I'm also feeling pretty happy about my predictions so far because even though I said I went off a of bias, there are three of my people who are getting ready to try and get into top eight. One of them coming up next. Huge fan of this kid for good reason. Mm -hmm. It's going to be Radish going up against Fakey. Okay, so the, the big uh, call out here is that Fakey got into this position by having a 3 1 victory over Faison. And so that this this match uh, could have been uh, Radish versus Faison. It could have been Cutie versus uh, Fakie. But we have Radish versus Fakie here, PR 34, and Radish PR 4, right? So we've got a lot of the top cut in, in, in North America right now coming up into these winter quarter matches. I want to see what Radish is playing here because I was looking at the reported I've legends I've been hearing throughout. Tesca from some people, yeah, yeah. but I've also been seeing reported Petra, I Mordex. Do I do see Petra and, reported and in in this whole last I'm thing against Cutie, so. I'm seeing Petra locked in right now. So a thing to talk about, which I haven't been able to talk about much because we haven't seen much Orb, is that Orb did get a nice little uh, adjustments this patch. And the big one that came through that I saw a lot of players talking about um, happily is that Orb Nair now has a little bit of extra stun on it so that you can true combo into side air from it. So that's something that I'm wondering if Radish is kind of like, eh, Gauntlets, sure, they lost some stuff in singles, but the orb is feeling good enough with as much force as Petra has that I want to go with it into the championship. I mean, to be completely honest, most of the time when Radish is really going off, like his Gauntlets have always put in work, but it's mm -hmm. when the orb is on fire because that's when he's controlling the ledge with the massive signature kit that he has. Three, but two, now that you have to not only just rely on hunting for side uh, side lights into side air, you have that new option available to you. That's only going to buff someone like Radish. Yeah, and so now we've got ourselves, uh, this is R Radish coming in from 2022. This is the legend that I identify Radish with, uh, the Petra main for sure. And Fakey, a player who I have not personally casted very much of, but have watched before, is coming in with the Hugin, uh, Bo, and Scythe coming through here. We saw in Europe uh, a really great performance from mm -hmm. Knees on this character as well. And I know that on top of all the talk that we've had about Spear, about boots, about guitars. What do you know? Also in there is Scythe and Bow. It turns out that there's quite a lot of weapons right now that are up for contention as what is the pick for Winters. And we've been getting to see a lot of it. You know it has been the theme of today's tournament? Yeah. D-Sig. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> D-Sig range coverage from, I mean. You, Down-Sig. Down-Sig. You always have to be so careful oh. about uh, Hunin's range that uh, she could cover from all those. But here's Radish again at ledge oh. and just waiting it out. You already got put the fear put into you from the D sig before and this catches you with the neutral sig on your yeah. way up. So so it's not new that Radish likes to use the spirit bomb at the edge of the no, stage. Right? <laughs> like that, that is not that's not like I know it's the theme of the tournament. It I was so to happy, by the way, when I finally could just say on official terms, Hadouken! Every time it comes <laughs> right, out, right, right. that's all I saw when I saw those moves. But um, oh, oh it, that's another also thing that's Radish always... Classic. Yeah, that is a pure Radish classic, is GC Neutral Sick from the ledge to say, get away from me. Yeah, <laughs> I love watching my Radish and Fridays all games. <laughs> like that, that's going to be happening all the time. Holy cow, Fakey uh, getting hit by another sideline sider there, and Radish is destroying in game number one. Now, yeah. I'm going to be careful... Um, as an unbiased commentator, not to dismiss this performance too much because just like with Sandstorm versus Anime, Game 1 was also very much in favor of Sandstorm. I literally refuse to count anybody out yeah. this weekend. It's Winters, for yeah. one. Uh, the the All the things change in Winters. And uh, with someone like Scythe, something like Scythe, you could get Scythe. It's like one good stock on good reads. There's the first mm -hmm. one. So you can't be too comfy. Uh, I get the feeling we're going to stay on the Scythe with that potential of trying to get a right. zero to knockout. Yeah, and you're absolutely correct there. Bo gets tossed aside. Radish now back over in the orb. He's been doing so well with it. Side light, side air, nair, and the recovery. Trying to take advantage of that extra little bit of stun frames. Uh, and Bakey. Dodges out of that side stick, gets punished by the Saren instead, and Rage can go for some down sticks, some down airs, some 
<laughs> some down lights, why not? Have anything that can cover both the edge of the stage and the ground as Fakie's just trying to get one of these combo starters on the scythe. The neutral and in the air, it doesn't connect Ajax. Well, he's, uh, he's doing his best trying to build something up. He has taken a bit less damage, but now that's starting to change heavily. Uh, you have to watch out for DCK oh. ledge up. It's inbound eventually. Uh, misses the side light, so he tries to go for the extender and getting that D light, but it hasn't been enough so far yet here on this site. Yeah, neutral six and down six coming through. Landing comes through as well. All right, I, I think it's happened, Ajax. I think the adaptation from from earlier in the game has occurred. We're just you know down a stock and a half, and that's going to be the game. But I'm really looking forward to game two here, where yes. Radish took a very fast first two stocks, and now Fake he's kind of like. Okay, I get it. You're really, really good. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna change the pace of the game. I actually think back to the sets with Hipka during Australia, where there was points in time where we were up here. Me and Duke were going, okay, look, we know that Hipka's losing, but bear with us. There's been a lot of adjustments mm -hmm. defensively that are showing us that they're probably gonna get back into the set because they were losing pretty heavily the first two games, and then they reversed 3-0'd. That end of that game gave me a lot more faith in Fakie, because even though he wasn't able to close it out, it got a lot slower, and he wasn't getting hit nearly as much. Oh, and look at that. Opening it up with the first weapon pickup, immediately getting a four-hit scythe combo there. Radish off of the Nair gets the jump ground pound, but Fakie with the downlight doesn't get the dare afterwards, but nice job with the sidelight, using that active, active input to kick him up, trying to catch these landings on the ground as well. Neutral light, miss spacing, but sidelight finding purchase as he hits that Sare and goes over the edge guard here. Radish sweating. Has yeah. to dodge out of the way. Downer takes him down. Radish low on jumps. Ground pound hits and Radish did he even touch the wall? Of course he did. And Fakie with a great start here in game number two. And this is exactly yes. what I was looking forward for. Exactly. This is why we were leaning into that. Like, just be bear with us. Yeah. Fakie's kind of turning it up a little bit here in that it, last game, it, and it carried right over here into game number two. It's a very real thing for different kinds of players in competitive Brawlhalla where you just have to, like, get beat for a little bit before you look at your opponent and you're able to match the pace that they're yes. playing the game so that you can play the same game with them. And Radish is one of those very fast-paced players. And he just answers right back with yeah. a very fast-paced stock to get an answer there. Took a little bit on stock two, but um, so there are some players who do thrive off of game two not game one, because mm -hmm. game one is just, how do I learn, like, what am I learning from you? What are yeah. your habits, and how can I adjust to that? Especially in best of fives, you have that, you have kind of, you have kind of like that, that free game, even though you don't want to give up a game, you have that one to get the data. Oh, and look at that, daylight looks like, yeah. And then it, once you get into that, that happy balance, well, at least for me as a viewer, it's a balance. For the players, it's very, very stressful. <laughs> <laughs> of, 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 Fighting back and forth to see whose game plan is for, superior. For us, everything up here is perfect. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, but like, we're not stressing out. Let's bring but me, right meanwhile, now. <laughs> Radish is kind of like, hmm, I gotta, I gotta adapt now because Fakie's game plan has uh, worked out for the majority of this game number two. Yep. And with that, he's finally getting those neutral lights into Pivot Nairs to connect. Dash jump, fast fall, down air hitting as well. Radish gets hit by the down sig. And it's look at how much damage comes through. The theme of the day is D-Sig. It's covering so much Radish from people. Uh, but Fakey uh, trying to keep this lead going, and he's doing it him actually. But um, Radish has shown, of course, time and time again from last year, Ooh. got a seasonal championship multiple times getting the fifth, including at BCX. So you also can never count out Radish as well when he gets put in these positions. I love the down stick from Hugin as well. We just saw two variants of it. One, if you hit it on the stage, it will bounce off and then hit off the stage. But if you just hit use it in the air, it goes diagonally. You can even bounce it off the sides of the wall there. We'll see if Fakie uses more of that right now because Radish is now finding himself in the position he put Fakie in in the last game. Great dare. If you use it right low to the stage, you get to use that backflip where you land mm -hmm. that landing animation, but the dare hitbox still goes off, catches Fakie off guard. It's a really precise maneuver to do, and Radish is a master at it. Uh, brings the game back to one to one, but this is going to be a tough edge guard to come back from. Yeah, it's going to be uh, it's beyond Fakey to try and make sure that he closes out. Now, Sider comes through. Is he going to be able to get him on his way back up? Gets the neutral air. Won't be enough just yet, Taza. He's got to land, though. Can he land? Fakey goes for the recovery. D light recovery. That's going to be it. Fakey brings it to a game number three in a really great comeback where the, the adaptation that I saw at the end of game one, I am very happy to say we got to prove in game number two yep. by watching Fakie's performance there. And it was all on the scythe, like you said. Having a number as high as 413 when it comes to scythe damage means you were hitting a lot of moves. Yep. Scythe I, does not do a lot of damage. I feel like Bo just kind of got outplayed by the uh, the orb in that previous game. So scythe needed yeah. to wake up. And that's exactly what it did. I believe I saw them lock into Brawl Haven a second ago. OK, um, that's going to be, in my opinion, a Raidish favorite counter pick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah like, we did. So that, and that's exactly what I was feeling, too, because yeah. A, this is one of Radish's favorite
favorite counter picks. Mm -hmm. It's either this one or you'll see Demon Island because he wants that small side to make that D sync work better. Dude, so they'll eight, take Demon you're, Island you're away. Eight force orb. <laughs> 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 you, you want this. I'm not trying to say that every. Uh, very, uh, like, on paper, every legend benefits from when they're hitting their opponent to knocking them out faster. It just becomes what moves are you relying on in your game plan to get those wins uh, that I look at when I look at who's favored here. And I don't yep. think Fakey, with the scythe or the bow, necessarily needed a small stage. I think the way he was winning is going to work anywhere. And that's why I'm giving that favor over to, to Radish, if Radish could win yeah, that's any a, neutral yeah, exchanges. That's if Radish could, exactly, if he could get in. Uh, this is the stage where I, oh. well, neutral air won't be enough just yet either, but... Um, this is a stage where Radish loves to chase deep into the skies with orb recovery to get sneaky plays on some early knockouts. Oh. He's going to have to try and hunt for one potentially here as that dare closes it out and Fakie keeps the lead. Okay, Fakie, that was fantastic with that dare. We were talking about how you have to be precise with orb downer to get over the edge. It's pretty much the same with bow, only you have a much smaller projectile than a giant ball. I mean, like, well, relatively. <laughs> Orbs of small weapon. Anyways, you get what I'm saying. <laughs> Bow down air is really hard to hit precisely. <laughs> the about the look of, like of just lost confusion you had when you created look, that sentence. Look, it's like, look, like, look. I was like realizing because like, it's like, wait, is it big or is it like? <laughs> well, because when you throw the orb, you're like, man, I wish I had a better sized weapon. But you know, whatever, it's fine. It's Ray okay. It's about how you use it. As he air. goes and gets there off the side there with the side air, and he gets the very first. Uh, actually, not a first lead, but he doesn't even it back up. And now. It is evened up, as you said, but only in numbers. The damage here, uh, not quite the same. And Fakie's able to find a neutral signature here. I saw, oh, he goes for the neutral light in air instead. I had, well, there, there's the neutral signature. Okay, so I was going to talk. I've been waiting for that. Like, I've been waiting for yeah, that for yeah. a while now. I was going <laughs> to talk about how we haven't really seen him opt for it too much, but something that you can do on a stage like this, uh, where there's not platforms to escape to, is if you think your opponent's going to jump out of the neutral light on sight, you can just catch up with that move, and it's a pretty good move at knocking out the top. It doesn't have, like, the... Uh, the Koji downsig effect where it's like uh, you already send them to the survival knockback mm -hmm. angle at the top right of the stage. It's just off the top. It's it's pretty great. And Fakie's now one stock away from going to 2-1 in this matchup, but Radish could even this up really quickly. Fakie does dodge back to the stage. He's got to be careful about the Radish downsig and down airs. That dare just missed. Like, literally frames off of just getting that connection. And there's a big, Whoa. oh, actually Whoa. not a big punish. There's only just a delight. I can't believe that downlight works. That's I awesome. <laughs> He he's, found the Radish counter. He's he's beaten uh he's beaten the GC neutral like twice now at ledge too. So yeah. that, that's huge. If you could stop Radish from doing that, that's one of his best options out of disadvantage. You're just gonna make him completely question everything that he's done wrong. Like I can't <laughs> I can't neutral stick from the ledge. So, what, what do I do? Oh, he side six the other way. It's, I, it's crumbling. I need to unplug. <laughs> it's just not right. <laughs> but uh, we currently have Fakey sitting in a I won't say a huge Whoa. lead, but uh, it is now. Yeah, oh. now now it's gotten a lot better. Oh, okay. Fakey missed a pretty critical jump in that string. I, when I saw him get that dare and he was guiding Radish off stage, I was like, okay, all right. And he doesn't get the jump afterwards, and then Radish was able to get the edge guard. But here we're at a situation where I don't think Daylight Recovery will do it. He needs to get a few more hits in before we can start yeah. using some of the bow bread and butter knockouts. But he's just got to not worry about knocking out and just like just play for those neutral wins at the moment. Because Radish right now, I can see it. He's so laser focused on getting as much damage as he can off these attacks. And uh-oh, when the neutral sig works, mm. Daylight yeah, and when, Recovery. When oh, works, Ajax. Yeah, all of a sudden, he's feeling himself. And uh, I this think is, he can knock him out with any sig here. I agree. Oh, that side, side just, Sider, this won't be enough just yet. Web toss up, send him down. And oh. he just gets away from that. But he's in a very, very scary That's spot. Sarah will take it. Radish brings it all the way back. And we said it. You. You just needed the you just needed the GC neutral stick to hit. Yeah. And all of a sudden, he just went full power. Well, and even before that hit, um, wow, the damage was incredibly low that game. I I I, I had this. I don't know what it was. It's just I've watched Rage enough to where it's like uh, even if a player is like That's one insane. stock to one, and you're in white and they're in red. The way Radish was moving was kind of like, oh, he knows that this is his game that he's going to win. Dude, I don't I don't know if I've ever seen, in my history at least, of being up here, a match where somebody did 359 compared to 631. And still won. And they won. And it, and it wasn't <laughs> off of uh, like a, a weird early knockout. Yeah. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, all right. Okay, Sorry. So it was the wrong. Confirmation is because the stats... We're not correct. So all right, all right, makes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That okay. makes more sense. Because I was like, I was looking at that. I was like, that didn't make any sense. It's <laughs> like, like, okay. I mean, I guess. Hey, you said force orb. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I still fine. think that it is true 
that Raidish did less damage. I think and so. And I well. still think that it is true that Brawlhaven was a Raidish favorite counter pick. And I also think that in this set, now that we're up two to one, we're not going to go back there. Fakie won't allow. No, uh, not at all. That was really, really close, and Fakie was in the lead the entire time. So now let's see if Radish can take uh, the adaptations that he made in that game three and bring it to a three-one scoreline here, because he does not want to give Fakie a chance like that ever again. I'm looking mostly at Orb V Bo. It, it was the same yeah. thing that happened in the earlier sets, and then it happened again at the end, where it, I think Fakie fell into that trap of trying to simplify his damage too much. You saw how he was kind of just only looking for jump stairs to push him into D-Light recovery range. That kind of allowed Radish to go off. It's like, okay, you are way too scared to try and hit me right now, so I'm just gonna rush you down. And it worked out against Fakie. Nair gets to the landing. Oh, I thought he was gonna Nair again. Okay, he does. He does. He was just delaying it. Let's see. Oh, sweating. No, went for the side light on the landing instead. That neutral six, so good. Wow, Fakie just followed Radish's landing. For what was it felt like about 20 seconds? It was. And then finally just said, like, you're never going to land. You need the iframe. As soon as the weapon spawn came out, too, it's like, all right, yeah, no, not at all. And uh, so very well played by Vicky. Oh. Surprisingly not done yet, yet, but that might be enough. He's like, if you catch him over on the side, he like ground pop. No, just going to give him that respect. Not really in a prime position to go for it. Okay, and that's three times now that Radish would have gotten the stock on Brawlhaven. <laughs> and that, that's, that's, when I'm looking at that, that's the difference uh, between how I've watched these two play in this matchup. When Fakie goes for his knockouts, he knows when the knockout's going to work out on the stage that he's playing. And when Radish goes for his really hard-hitting moves, he just wants to hit him. He doesn't yep. care what, what, what the result's going to be afterwards. Radish um, is one of those players where he sees you at zero damage. Like, yeah, I can knock you out. Like, like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, I, I, well, that's I, what I, happened last game. <laughs> that's for sure. Down air to side air. Didn't hit. Voids that side light opener. And this is pretty good from Fakie so far. Yeah, Fakie just trying to get like, simplicity is key has kind of been a big theme of the weekend as well. Oh, still oh, recovery? No! Oh, just missed. That is was that so it? close. We get the downer again. It's going back and forth. Goes for the ground pound, releases it early to get the hit, and Radish with no weapon has to avoid that dare. He's sweating. I think I hit the stage, and he's gone for it. That's one stock left for Radish. Really awesome edge guard. Almost a catastrophe. Made yeah. it back and then turned it around. It was close, but Fakie kept calm and collected that whole time. Made sure he got that volley off the stage three times in a row. Didn't let him get back off of any resources. And now he has what was, I'd said, a good lead, but that might disappear momentarily. I say it does immediately. And that was the first time he went for that mix up. He's decided to glide off the side where normally he's been jumping back up and daring. That was I, really I'm good. I'm making a note to watch that in slow motion again because I think you're right. It was a down sig into like a. Uh, he he just like touched the wall. And, and then slid, yeah. down or ground pound, which is so freaking hard to do because you're more than likely going to get your down signature. You have to wait until the frame that you are off stage for that to work. And it caught Fakie so off guard that he just fell to it. That's, that is that's an, crazy. We talked earlier about how Impala has like a lot of Kaya specific tactics that he goes yeah. for because that is like he is a solo Dude, legend and, for that. And, and this is exactly what we see out of Radish. Radish is running away with it too. And whenever Radish lands one of these crazy maneuvers that are just unique to him as a player, he just goes off with it. And look how much damage he's done to Fakie as well. I feel like the entire game is in his control. Sidelight side air hits. Fakie sent flying. He's got to be low on uh, on having that side last. That's it. Sidelight side air does it. And Radish, after that amazing ground pound knockout, finishes off Fakie's last stock of the winner's bracket like it's nothing. That's why he is in the top four here in North America. And he's going to be moving into the top eight in the winner's side of this championship. This is why Look I'm a this. big fan of this kid. Watch this, watch this last second. I want to see. Oh, no, oh he, he, he doesn't. It. Okay. it was just so. It was fast. It was so close that it looked like he did because of that turnaround. But it was still a really good mix up in general because prior to that moment, he only would go for Dare being yeah. reset back on the stage. And that was a big game changer because we said before how when Raida sees you at any point, he might try to knock you out. I, I he do, just had that bad stop right before that. I'm glad our eyes both tricked each other into thinking that I thought he landed last I thought stage. he did. I, I really did. I, okay. I, I'm not, I, not even That's just to build up cool. story. It, that, that last second turnaround made it look like he touched the stage for a second. I was like, was how did you pull that off? Still a very good ground pound. Caught Fakie recovering off the bottom of the stage. And then afterwards, gave him all the momentum that he needed. Radish is like really fun to watch in those situations because once he gets that stock, instead of like feeling like he's at a disadvantage state with like the fact that his opponent's coming back to the stage with iframes and all this other stuff, no, nah, he's just ready to keep going. What are you look at these? Look at these sets, bro. Look at these sets. So th these have been these been not th these yeah. been all phenomenal. We yeah. haven't seen like any 3 0 stomps. We've been only watching amazing I was getting, sets up to I this was point. getting ready for 3 0 stomps. They didn't happen. No. I was like, <laughs> surely against anime. No, everybody that's here fighting, clawing their way for, for top 32 are all doing it with their own unique way of playing, right? We have <laughs> a gauntlet orb main sticking with that at the beginning of 2023. We have an Arcadia player where Arcadia has before only been piloted by the likes of Crocky. Uh, we, we have a diamond head player 
for the Qatar meta instead of going into Asuri. And then we, we just got to see that matchup there between Hugin and Petra. Like, that's so incredible coming out from it. And much to my surprise, Boomy was one of the players that I was thinking if he was going to be piloting the boots, uh, it, it was going to be a lot tougher than that. And Stingway just came out and completely stopped it. I mean, to be honest, like one of the things you want to make sure you get before it completely stops is the winter merch, by the way, which is happening right now. That's going to be ending on February 12th. Do not miss out on it because it is, is a brand new exclusive. Where's Sparky when I need the math of how many days that are left? Wait, uh, nine minus I, one minus I, one, seven. Less than seven days for the winter merch. Brawlhalla.com. I'm just going to believe you. I don't feel like doing math right now. I think that's it, what it is. It is the most basic of math, and I'm like, I don't want to look stupid in front of chat. How do you but subtract one twice? Ah. Difficult, Ajax. Ah. That's why we're, ah, true, we're true, commentators true. and true. not mathematicians. Yeah, I don't belong I don't belong uh, up here right now. I'm, yeah. I'm goofy. But also, a uh, reminder, it is at brahala.com slash wintermerch. Uh, it is going to be ending on the 12th. It is a limited time offer, specifically limited. Do not miss out on that because the, uh, for one, the hoodie just looks incredible. And two, that blanket, it's just it just looks too good. I, I, first I, of its I, kind. I, it is the first and only cozy. of its kind. I need it. It very is very cozy. soft. It must be had. I am continuing to look at the people who are in charge of that in the back, reminding them that I want Please put, please put Anyways, my order in. Anyways, check that out. <laughs> and then while you're checking that out, we'll be right back after this short break. of how good Impala has been at bringing the game back. Yeah. One good mistake away from Ancienza They're from They're both closing one it. mistake away. I actually He's looking for the signature finish. There's the recovery and Impala pulls well. I like his attempt at falling off with the neutralized that time. He hasn't really gone for that oh. before. Now here comes the great sword. So does he get a recovery? Does he get a good read on him? Down He's like, recovery. recovery and he got it. Yeah, that was so close. But Sandstorm just needs one more good read and that'll be it. Here comes the spear. Does he go for recovery soon? Who knows? But right now Impala is going to fall. God, that was almost such a good play. Oh. But he does get sucked back around. Oh. And that he can't take over enough just yet, but will he be able to find another side stick? Doesn't even need it. Weapons out. Sidelight, D light. Oh no, the Ooh. ground pound gets the read and stingray. I love seeing it. It's just every time you sometimes you're just not prepared for the instant swap into that side stick. Edge guard could come through for a stingray. Boomy's been playing Temple Run for the oh. past like solid 30 PR. It, 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 it technically is Five an upset. PR, it's, a, it's just a, it's it's amusing to think about these things. Um, <laughs> however, it is a and recovery, and you have no choice. You have to guess correctly. Yeah, and spot dodge here, Jonathan. We're seeing a solid lead from anime uh, going into this game. Two landing on the stage, two grabbing that down like it's there. More damage comes through with the stage. It hit four times in a row. Uh, but April, don't fix it. Keep it going. And now he has a position to go. Now six side like Nair goes and gets the sun there again. Goes for the long ball excited, but he didn't get the fastball. It stands from catches the landing. Sides and punish. Is that going to be another you know, down light finisher coming through? Ooh. The crystal dodge out of the way with the down light recovery. That's insane. Big agree. And this is a crowd. Once again, much like last game, it went down to last stock last oh. game. So you can't get to come. Oh. Coming off down. It's no, he's not. Oh, he's still. 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 He's
What started with thousands of players has been whittled down to 32 or less. It's been whittling and it is continually whittling because we've got so many matches going on. Of course, we've got matches over on the side stream as well. Sparky, what's been your favorite moment so far? Uh, probably seeing Sandstorm still playing well and taking out okay. Impala. That was uh, that was a joy to see, to see the, not necessarily as a dig to Impala, but really as a plus on the Sandstorm side of the column. And also getting to see him do it with Arcadia. We've seen a little bit of Arcadia. We haven't seen too much success with Arcadia. Uh, we have a tweet from Sandstorm that we want to throw up there for you. D-Sig, absolutely true. Uh, I don't think anybody could have said it better than the champ himself, the former champ himself, who is still on his journey through this bracket to hopefully finally break that winner championship curse that he has never been able to attain. Yep. I mean, uh, this, if any, is going to be his main opportunity to finally get that winter championship. One of the, the few titles he has not obtained, like you said. Uh, but it really does boil down so far to that downsig. We've seen it a lot coming out from that Arcadia. Chat is really not happy with the fact that he's using a lot of those downsigs, but he's using it very effectively. And it's been interesting in the fact that, like, it's been a widespread of characters overall, not just within Absolutely. a couple of people. It's been like we've seen the Arcadia, we've seen the Kaya, we've seen the Tesco, we've seen Orion, we've seen a multitude of different characters. And we're probably going to see a few more, some of which we are used to, and some of which might be a little bit different. Our next set is going to be Luna versus Anonymous Alex. Now, Luna in his previous set locked in the Caspian. That was against A.Yo Blue. And then before that, Anonymous Alex's previous pick was a Jay Yun. So we are going to see some more great sword here from Anonymous Alex, although it will be on a completely different character that you play completely differently aside from the, uh, the crossover on the weapons. But like you saw with the D-Sig, using that trap you're not really doing things like that with jay yun so even though it's still a great sword legend we're going to see a radically different play style coming out compared to what we saw from sandstorm's arcadia it's it's fun in the fact that um both of them started off in the brahala competitive scene as taros main they were kind of known as like their taroses but then they they've diverged and anonymous alex went over here and is now playing jay yun and uh, we've got Luna over here, and he's now playing all sorts of stuff, Caspian included. Caspian was the thing that he, uh, of course, played at the World Championship. But, of course, that's not going to be the only match. We've still got plenty more. Let's bring up that schedule to see uh, what other matches are going to be down the line. Of course, we've got Luna and Anonymous. That's up there. And then up after that, Stingray versus Meg D. And then after that, it's going to be Sandstorm and Radish, uh, I believe, once we get into the top eight of things. Yeah. Yeah, so even aside from this set that we're about to watch, Stingray versus Meg D is going to be an interesting one as well. I mean, and then we're going to get to see, I mean, we've already seen some Sandstorm. We've already seen some Raidish. Loving seeing those two players go up against one another and see what happens. But before that, we have Luna versus Anonymous Alex. Now, for those who may not be fully familiar with Anonymous Alex, he really made his splash. What was it? Was it a last chance qualifier or was it Arcadian? I want to say it was an Arcadian was like one of the first big things. Um, but first, let's talk about Luna, the person who's okay. got a little bit of a higher PR, has won more medals overall, four gold medals, one silver and two bronzes. One of those bronzes 
at the World Championship 2022. Now you're seeing the Caspian on screen for you. He's already reported a Caspian. He's reported a Caspian 20 times in uh, his previous career. So he's definitely no stranger to this legend, but when you compare that to like the 59 reported Taroses and of course the 76 reported Mordexes, he still has a serious chunk of his career on this legend, although it isn't like his top two. Yeah, on the other side, Anonymous Alex, you're seeing the Jala currently on the screen to represent him, but of course he's played the Terrace in the past, and today so far has been locking in the Jay Yun, has yet to get a medal. He's only gotten one ever top eight placement, and right now he's got to get through someone who is uh, considered one of the best in North America to get another top eight placement. Now, we are seeing on our screen that Luna is actually going back to the Lucian that a lot of people expected, and he has already played today, so that's not a surprise whatsoever. It was really just looking at the Luna versus AO Blue set, that where that Caspian came from. So he's swapping back over to the Lucian, probably wants some longer range weapons while also having that close range slice and dice when he has the guitars in his hands, but he can rely on those side likes to poke, hopefully get through some of that range that Anonymous Alex has. Yeah, this Lucian is kind of an interesting pick. Again, like we've talked about um, a multitude of times, like Katars have kind of come back into the meta. Blasters, not so much. They've been this kind of fringe weapon that not too many people have really stuck with. I think Boomy's kind of been the known Blasters player. But even then, today, he was playing the Tesca. I still see people rating Blasters reasonably high on tier lists, both like relatively, because a lot of tier lists that come out are usually like S and then like A+. Plus. A and then A minus because the weapons are at the end of the day. I mean, they're kind of close to one another, relatively speaking, but blasters are usually put in a pretty good spot. But like you said, we don't really see it. Luna tearing him up, finds the side air blaster KO. One of the most regular things that I'm thinking about when I think about like an old school Lucian player. It was always those side air KOs, the occasional neutral signature. But that was before like D-Light Recovery had its heyday as the main thing. OK, he goes for the D-Light nice. into the down air. Did he dash jump that? I don't know if he did. Yeah. That's usually what you go for at the lower health. It didn't seem like he moved far enough to actually get the dash jump out of there. Um, I I think he went for it because I don't know if you can do it just raw with a jump dare. But afterwards, I really like that pivot and air that he did afterwards. Just try to get extra damage after it. You'll see a lot of Blasters players go for like a gravity cancel D light off that dare bounce. But Luna bringing in a little bit of difference with the way that he's bringing out his Blasters. Over to the Katars now as he throws out a down sig off the soft platform to give himself a bigger lead. He's doing classic Lucian stuff. We already saw that down signature KO. That's like one of his most popular signatures on this legend. We've seen good blasters play. We've seen good, good guitar play. But he also has a very large amount of movement speed, so he can get in and out of the range. He's just like he's just blasting. He's literally <laughs> Danny DeVito going in there, and so I started blasting. And Alex has nothing to deal with this. I I don't think Luna's really missed a shot in a hot minute. He has been hitting every single blast. Throws out the side signature, not gonna hit that one, but still so many shots put out from Luna and they're all connecting. Alex finally finishes off this stock of Luna, but that was just the first one of three. And he's back over on the greatsword, something he wasn't doing very well with before. Unfortunately, that's actually going to drop him down. The turnaround that he was looking for to continue that string to the right side. Luna back with the guitars. Alex is finding a couple hits here. The dodge gets through. But nice the down sig again from Luna on the corner, the classic of the Lucians is going to clean up that stock. I feel like I wouldn't have expected that down signature to come out because that's such like, that's like a Lucian thing. So like in my ranked games, I'm going to expect that coming because that's what Lucians do. Orion Spear Neutral Sig, that's what Orions do. But here, I wouldn't have necessarily expected a player like Luna at this level to just throw that one out there. And maybe that's what really caught Alex off guard. I think one thing for Alex is like, he was high. He was jumping up. He thought he could potentially be above that down signature and just maybe didn't have that familiarity with how high it goes in that arch on the down sig. He kind of got his feet crossed up there, unfortunately. But like you said, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Like we saw this, I think, yesterday as well. There was someone who was really utilizing the Lucian down signatures. And it's like one of those things where like it shifts out of the meta and then suddenly it'll be back in the meta because you're like, well, that's too obvious and yet it still works it's also it, the the reason it's not necessarily like the best move is because of how obvious it is but it's also obvious because it's 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 a good it's still a good move at the end of the day it's it has a lot of movement yeah, in it it moves yeah. you towards yeah that's just that's just a huge that's a huge wedge that's just he 
He did all that. With he one, basically one went stock. 80% of the game, probably 90% of the game on that first stock, finishing it up, showing some fantastic Lucian play, but we're not getting any legend swap from Anonymous Alex on this whatsoever. He's hoping, I mean, like we know he has some more in the tank. I don't know how deep his legend pool is. We don't see him on stream too often. So I don't really know if he's comfortable with anything currently, if he's been practicing anything Three, else that he can really two, draw on. One. But if I'm looking at last game, Virtually nothing was that successful where I would necessarily stick, especially with the greatsword. But who knows? Maybe he figures something out in the last few moments and it didn't lead to a victory in the game, but will lead to a momentum shift in this game. I did feel like he was starting to find uh, a little bit more success with that greatsword. He was starting to find more hits here and there. Right now, struggling to get more than just that opener. He keeps going for the reset right after the opener, expecting Luna to change up that dodge, and he's just not catching it. Luna's spacing is, is really good right now. We're seeing Alex whiff a lot of moves. Luna is punishing them. We're also seeing Luna just constantly attack. He's throwing out so many hitboxes all the time. There's a nice little three-piece for a punish. The punish game from Alex has really been the thing that's weakened him so much, at least in last game. It was Luna throwing out attacks constantly, all the time. Picks up the KO there on hit. Of course, Luna's going to get the hit. He's going to do damage. He gets the hit stun, all of that good stuff. But even when he missed, he would just jump and throw out a down air. He would throw out a side light, anything like that. And Alex was unable to punish so many of those whiffs. Yeah, Luna's so good at covering himself. And now you're seeing those hits. Bro, his oh, blasters are looking it. crispy today. He's going to fall for that. But honestly, that could have been something absolutely gigantic there for Luna. I think he's, he's feeling himself, and he's feeling himself for good reason. He has the confidence so far in that first stock. He had a solid lead on that. So he did throw away that stock a little bit, but I don't think he's going to pay for it too much, except we're seeing some good damage coming out from Alex. Luna probably going to be looking for those blasters soon. Yeah, I do want to credit Alex with a great punish on that whiffed uh, recovery from Luna, right? Go over that GC downline into the recovery as a way to pick up that stock instead of just like trying to swing from below. But right now, Luna starting to add up that damage again. Back to the blasters. The weapon toss from Alex going to guarantee that landing. You saw that little jump into a dodge down to get back grounded on the floor. That got him out of the way. That down air came out from Alex. Little poke with the side light, jumping the side air. Hits the down air. Oh, you saw him chase dodge, but he went for the side air instead of going for a recovery. That was just like a 50-50 on where he thought his opponent would be. Happened to go for the side of there. I don't think a recovery would have hit either, uh, just for the record. But now, Alex spawning back in without a weapon, has the sword. That's what he got the first KO here on uh, in one of the previous games. That's what really denied the three stock at the end of it. Well, he does end up landing that downlight side air, has some control, but doesn't pressure Luna too much in that offstage. Instead, kind of just let him come back onto that wall. Might be just looking for some consistent damage, hoping just like a downlight recovery will eventually whittle away the stock. I'm really liking Luna on this legend. He's doing a lot of things really well that are inherent to not only Blasters, not only Katars, but Lucian as well. He's utilizing the movements. He's just so quick. He's so quick. He's all over the place. It's just so difficult to track. He's in and out. Alex doing a fantastic job, though, of keeping this relatively even. He probably has 80 to 90 damage maybe on the second stock, maybe 60 to 70 as well, just right in that past 50 range. Finding a little bit of damage, but so is Luna. Has the Blasters out. Neutral Light, nice pair. Okay. Alex actually going back grounded after that doesn't get caught by the Nair. Yeah, I think Alex started to recognize Luna really likes to go for that pivot Nair off of those end lights, off those side lights. And so if he starts going low, might not hit, but the side sig will, and Luna takes another one up 2-0. Now, if we're looking at the 573 damage that he did, we are going to divide that by three, okay. giving us 191 damage per stock. That's actually really solid for a Lucian player, especially because he's not just getting like gimmick d KOs on the edge where you can KO in that like later stages of orange. So 191 per stock against a tankier legend when you are a legend that doesn't have that high strength. That has always been the thing that uh, has been like a big outlier with Lucian in his stats. High movement speed, but really low strength. Yeah, his, his stats are kind of like that stairwell where it's low strength and then kind of mid uh, dexterity and then he gets high defense, even higher movement speed. Insanely fast, you'll see him in those like those uh, arcade modes where it's like, oh, yeah, movement speed's like the only thing I need. Yeah. I, just, I, I gotta run the ball in, in Brawl Ball. And that's where you'll see Lucian a lot of times, but uh, that's one of the reasons why his damage is 
arguably less efficient than what we're used to seeing, but still pretty good considering yes. it's a Lucian. It's yeah, like one of those once you space. add that actual context, and if he is in the strength stance here, mm -hmm. that's giving him that like perfect stairwell, that four, five, six, seven, which is one of the reasons a lot of people really loved playing Val whenever Val came out, was that like really nice stat line, of course, combined with everything else that Val has to offer, but just a very comfortable legend to play as the overall general feel. And that can be similar here with a Lucian player as long as you're comfortable on those weapons, which isn't necessarily the most common thing because of the blasters for a lot of different people. But we are seeing Alex start to get more momentum. He's getting more runway with these uh, with this great sword. Nice. As he catches the movement of Luna, gets the weapon toss. Luna still has some more, and yep, he will get to the wall safely. Picking up the sword. See if Alex can get Luna into the red, find this stock. He's doing a fantastic job here. And there it is, just like that, 45 seconds into the game, Alex seemingly figured out at least so far what Luna was doing with both Katars and the Blasters. He's getting the dodge reads here, a nice little four piece to start this one off, full stock lead here, going the way of Alex here, and he needs it. He's down 0-2 in this best of five. Yeah, you can really tell Alex is finding his groove right now with this great sword. The fact of the matter is, he's gone from getting one hit into whiffs into now he's getting four, five hit strings. He's converting into so much more damage. Luna needs to find this KO. A downlight recovery should do it, but he needs to get that downlight. So at first I was questioning whether or not it was the smart decision to stay on this Jayon. Now I'm seeing why, exactly why Anonymous Alex wanted to stay on this legend. And it is because of the greatsword. Because if your greatsword is not being successful, I think there are very few reasons to play this legend if you're relying on the sword. There are so many other sword legends you could be going for, but this is why Anonymous Alex has chosen this legend. That greatsword needed a little bit of time to warm up. Oh, but it is uh, definitely not melting in his hands despite the fact that it's a popsicle. He does need to find another weapon, though. Luna needs to take this opportunity to start adding up that damage because an Anonymous Alex did get some fantastic damage built up with the Greatsword. Luna denying the weapon pickups, keeping the Katars in hand, and Alex does land down with that neutral air, but still no weapon spawns. Luna's covering, oh! but Alex catches him with the side heavy. He definitely caught Luna off guard there. Luna probably thought that he could throw that weapon toss up, maybe move a little bit back towards that weapon and grab it. And no, the second that toss came out, uh, Alex was probably already buffing that side heavy, buffering that side heavy so he could get that range. That's going to be really his longest range option. If he goes for a D-Light, not nearly going to go far enough, even if you dash D-Light. Yeah, weirdly enough, just those like dash in heavy buttons from the unarmed players can catch a lot of people off guard. Like they're just not expecting you, expecting you to just run up and smack them in the face. Luna did manage to add up a decent amount of damage on the second stock of Alex, but again, Alex is back at it. He's getting the damage put out on Luna's final stock here. There you see a little bit of that lower strength coming into play. He did ha hit that from basically the middle of the stage, but I think if you were a higher strength legend, like maybe a cross in there with all the strength that he has, you probably could have gotten the knockout there with the blaster side air. So hopefully that doesn't bode poorly for him, but if it does, the anonymous Alex fans are going to be uh, enjoying themselves here. He has a solid lead as Luna is in the orange coming here at last stock. Possible winner's side stock here for Alex, but he's in a pretty good spot. Yeah, he's definitely poised to at least take a game off of Luna. Luna, again, trying to play a little bit of unarmed here, trying to deny those weapons, but Alex wants a sword. Again, that consistent KO tool for the Jay Yuns out there. A downlight recovery might not do it just yet, but he's definitely got the control. And he's swapping back to the sword. I was a little bit confused why he went for that, but that's exactly why. He seems so much more comfortable with the signature kit on the sword than the great sword. We saw one signature kit, or one signature usage, I believe, he did all like a great GC sword. down sig on the great sword yeah. that hit. And aside from that, we saw him pick up, I think, three different KOs with the sword itself. So, yeah, that's exactly why you saw him swap to that at the end. You saw the side sig earlier, and then you saw the neutral sig there at the end. Yeah. And it's uh, really come down to that great sword as that damage build for him. He's, like we've said, built up a lot of momentum. He's really started to figure out how Luna's trying to react out of it. And again, it's it's very challenging to do. Luna is, of course, a very strong competitor coming in PR number two. He's very intelligently changing up those dodges. He's not going for the same thing. And yet Alex is ready every single time. He's like, oh, you're going to dodge out this time. Catch you. Oh, you're going to spot dodge this time. I'm going to go in, turn around, neutral light. He's doing a great job of catching when Luna changes it. And he's showing why people pick Jae Yun. If you want to play that great sword, Jae Yun is always a solid pick because he has that sword. If you want to build up the damage on great sword, 
that's a perfectly viable option. Usually the thing that greatsword players have the most trouble with or that they complain the most about is not being able to find those finishers to get the stocks. That's not as big of a problem when you're comfortable KOing on the other weapon or you have a very strong signature kit with the greatsword or that other weapon as well. Jay Yun has both of those because he has the utility of sword and regular D-Light recovery. That's a super normal thing to KO with. D-Light side air, all of that, but also the signature kit that Alex is using really well. There is Luna going for the beautiful blasters three-piece that you do in low damage when you pick up that D-Light. Not able to hit the down air, though, there. And again, Alex starting to find more hits. This time, it's on the regular sword. Oh, that's going to be good. I love that jump up for that dare, but the end sig doesn't connect, and Alex gets behind him. I think Luna got a little bit too big for his britches there, trying to go for the neutral signature. When Alex was only in the orange, I think if he turned around and went for the dare and added up more and more damage, that would have gotten him closer to red when it's signature time. But that also could have been like the perfect spike angle to get that orange KO right over the corner. Yeah, I'm not sure if like Luna's maybe fired up because he lost that last game and he's trying to bet big on some big plays. But right now, something consistent might be a little bit better oh. for him as he doesn't hit the recovery. That's twice now that we've seen him go for some a non-standard starter and then try to chase into the recovery. But he does still manage to finish off that stock, but he's, he's one hit away. Alex backing up, playing very defensively here, putting a lot of space in between the two. He's going to have some of the range advantage. Okay, nice GC side light. No crazy like GC side heavy to bounce off the wall yeah. like we saw in some of the previous regions. Just that easy GC side light. Has the weapon advantage, putting a lot of space still between him and Luna. That gave Luna a little bit of room to move over to the weapon. Alex went over to try and defend, but Luna still picked up the blasters. They are completely changing the way they're playing now. Yeah, definitely leaning a little bit more into the sword. Luna not playing as aggressively, does get a nice double down here, but still not finding the same momentum that he had earlier on. On the other side, Alex is finding all the momentum as he goes into that neutral light. Now we're seeing a little bit more explosive gameplay coming out from Luna, but even just there, you're seeing there put a lot of space in between. I think that's Luna realizing that Alex just won last game. It seems like his, his great sword and his sword is really starting to figure out the game plan of Luna. He doesn't want to go to a game five, obviously. He wants to get it here. He wants the three one. So he's going to be careful while also using the pressure that Lucian as a legend has. Oh, but the side sig and Luna is again going to take a stock, but he's not building the lead that he wants. Even in like the first stocks, right? Alex immediately cleaned it up. This time he's got the opportunity to do it again, but Luna's denying weapons. Oh, double chase dodge on that. A little bit rare. He threw that away? Right away, he wants I don't, a sword. I don't necessarily blame him from doing that straight away, even though he disarmed himself. Because like the way that Luna was starting out this final stock is like he he was playing back with his katars as well. He wasn't just going all the way in. He would have his moments where it was like, okay, I'm gonna dash jump in and get ready to go. But there was a lot of time where it seemed like he was a little bit afraid of the possible like D light into the neutral heavy or D light into the recovery coming out from the unarmed kit of Anonymous Alex. Yeah, I mean. Luna definitely had to respect the uh, KO tools that the unarmed brought, and Greatsword didn't really have those same uh, just immediate attacks, but right now the Greatsword is hitting everything. Luna gets disarmed, and sick thrown out, and again, Luna can't find the punish on it. Okay, nice three-piece. He doesn't turn around the dare there, went for the guess on where Anonymous Alex was going to be after the beginning part of that string. Ooh. He was low enough to not get caught by the D-Sig. Punish this time from Luna. Catches him with the side air. He's still getting the hits in, but he needs to start finding that KO. So close. Punish. Both players last stock red from the center of the stage. Is he going to have enough movement to get back? There's going to be no threat from Anonymous Alex. I think he's putting so much respect onto Luna right now. That's got to be it, and it is. That is the true combo there. That was Luna's game to lose once that D-Light hit. Yeah, a real nail biter of a finish, though. I mean, I got to rewind back to that edge guard uh, on the, the tail end there, where, like you said, Alex kind of just watched Luna get to this wall. He just st stood there and was like, hopefully I'll get something consistent, a down light recovery or something. Goes for a ground pound here. That was a big bet, and Luna had the punish for it. I mean, even the damage numbers, like you looked in the top right, it was last hit red for both of those players. Both of them were probably looking for their finishers. For Luna, it was the D-Light recovery. I mean, honestly, for Alex, because he had the sword in his hand, it was also a D-Light recovery or D-Light side air, depending on where he was on the actual stage. The damage between those two, 602 from Luna to 597. That's five damage difference between those two. That's how close that game was, which is really impressive for Anonymous Alex. I got to look at what his seed is coming into this.
I'm not sure, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm uh, focused really much on this uh, average damage per engagement, 28 damage per engagement uh, for both sides. Again, kind of telling that tale of how evenly matched the two of them were. That's seed 10 for Alex coming into this one against seed two of Luna. Of course, Luna being PR1, one of the best players going right now. Even though Impala did win the most recent world championship, I'm not taking that away from him whatsoever, but Luna is, of course, in that discussion as well. He's going to keep moving on through this bracket like you, like I, like almost anybody's predictions that I saw. Still moving through the bracket, still alive. Yep, he is going to be going into the top eight of things. We've still got one more person to find on the winner's side of top eight. Will it be Stingray or will it be Meg D? We talked a little bit about Stingray, but Sparky, let's uh, talk about Meg D. So Meg D is one of those players. Uh, I don't think anybody is going to be surprised if they see really long Meg D games today whatsoever. Meg D is a player who can play with like either flow of games. He can play in your face, he can play quick, he can play fast, he can also play very slowly. He can grind those games almost to a halt. Let's see what the viewers have to say. Oh, that's Ooh. an 81% for Stingray. Gotta say I agree. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it would be that dramatically one-sided if I had to just like gut check between the two of them. Yeah, Stingray's a strong player. Yes, he's been incredibly consistent, but on the other side, that's Meg D we're talking about. That's number two at the Midseason Invitational. That's someone who definitely has the capabilities to take out some of these big names. To see it that, again, widespread between the two of them, a little bit of a surprise for me. It's also a Qatar player in a Qatar meta coming from the side of Meg D. So we'll see how that plays. Of course, there you see right in front of you, Meg D coming in with, oh, actually, I'm looking at a different screen. So uh, I'm, if, when I say you, I mean you, dude. Yeah, me. You see it right there in front We're of you. Meg D coming in with the Asuri. No surprise there, even though uh, you do see the Caspian on the screen for these stats. But I was a little bit surprised to see the Bryn today from Stingray earlier, um, given that I don't, I'm not the most confident that Axe is as successful of a weapon compared to like many of the other weapons, including most of the ones that Stingray plays. He does play a lot of Ragnar. That's where we see the Qatar Axe crossover in that legend. I don't think that's a very modern legend either, but this is an interesting choice coming out from Stingray for today. Although we know he does have the Bryn, I still would have expected that Orion, maybe the Vector. Yeah, definitely like, it seems like Stingray wants a spear, and if you want to have a conversation about the spear, there's a lot of other characters that he could have gone to. We haven't seen too much Axe success overall this weekend. Not too many people have been playing it. Not too many people have been doing well with it, but at the same time, Stingray in his earlier set played it against uh, Boomy, yeah. and it worked really, really well when he started leaning into that Axe. Yeah, that was, uh, it was, I think, a, a tweet from Snowy the other day when he was like, oh, uh, bruh is picking Axe in Grand yeah. Finals. He does not want to win. And that's kind of my opinion on Axe and how it fits into the current meta, especially at this level. When you're that darn good at the game, every little weakness that you have on that weapon is going to be exploited by your opponent. But Stingray's doing a great job so far. Of course, it's off the back of that spear that we have seen him play in the past on the Orion and on several other characters as well. His spear mastery is looking amazing right now. And it's so interesting, like, Oh, there's the side sig. Almost takes out Meg D on the right side. Needs to play the edge guard. Goes for a down sig there. Very interesting option. I guess he was looking for the active frames because it's got a lot of them. Nice GC side light into the side air from Stingray. And uh, right now, he's, he's run away with this one. Now, Stingray, in his actual name on Brawlhalla, is making a bold statement. It does say top four in the world in Ooh, parentheses next okay. to his name. So uh, he's going to have to prove that, and it's going to start here at the Winter Championship because if he's not top four in North America, then he can't hardly claim that he is top four in the world just yet. That'll have to be uh, shown at the Winter Royale. You could say if you were top four in North America, you just have that much confidence in North no, America. No, I'm saying if he's not top four oh, in North America, okay, then there's yeah. no shot you're going to be top four yeah. in the entire world. But the way he's playing so far right now, staring down the barrel of a three stock against Meg D, and this is the grinding to a halt we talked about. Meg D is going to struggle to get in on Stingray with the lower range of the Katars. That's a nice way to start things off. Finally has Stingray into KO damage on the edge, but it Ooh. does not matter. Domination is correct. That was a Stingray game to lose. He had complete control at all points. It was all about the spear. 555 damage put out. 
And it's uh, kind of nice because we spent the first start of that game going, well, why is he picking Brin? He doesn't have that great of an axe. We don't have to play axe. And looks like he's just going to not play the axe for now. Yeah, like, so So then why are you yeah. picking Brin? No, there's the, I mean, I, hey, the I'm not going to discount it. it. He, he, he hit the spear side sig. That's okay. He did the GC down sig. Okay. Look, there's another side sig for aesthetic points. But check out how that's his a, graph again, is just the whole thing. That's a big old graph. And oh, look at that. Zero damage on the axe. Hey, Snow, are you going to tweet about that one too? He did less damage with all of his weapons. Yep. Yeah, that was uh, what was the what was the thing that came? Was was it domination or destruction at the end of the Obliteration? game? Obliteration. Uh, I was something saying that uh, Stingray completely handled Meg D. And if we look at past history between these two players, I would not have necessarily come to that conclusion if I was just looking at those numbers. Between these two, it is one and three in their career matches in official tournaments, and that is very much in the favor of Meg D. In terms of actual games, it's five to nine. So Meg D has almost won twice as many games against Stingray as the other way around in that equation. But again, it's Winter Championship. I know Ajax has talked many times about this, and it's like, for whatever reason, when we come to the Winter Championship, the person who had that winning record kind of does worse at the Winter Championship. We'll see if that keeps going as we get into our next game. It looks like we are waiting for the players right now, ladies and gentlemen. So let's uh, let's look at some more stats I from last game. See if we can find any interesting things. If we look at the damage per engagement uh -huh. between these two, 56 from Stingray, 21 from Meg D. So less than half of the damage per engagement. That's big. That's so big. Because 56, it's not even just like the two to one ratio. It's that 56 is also just a lot. Yeah. So Meg D could have put out 49, and that's that'd be still really good. But 56 per engagement is so much. That's like a, is that a it's basically a three piece on every single engagement. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's putting a, a whole color change in. Basically, every single time he gets a hit in. Because, uh, of course, we like we like to truncate like a health bar into those 50s. Because yeah. 150 is like optimum KO percentage. So you just get three 50s and then you're good. And he's doing a little bit extra than that. And it's just, uh, man, there's there's uh, so many things that he did right. <laughs> like it's just, he just controlled it. So do we see Meg D go for a legend swap off of this? There was no way for him to find any entry against that spear. It was it was essentially an impenetrable wall that he just could not get through. There were, there were occasional times when he got it. We saw a couple solid strings coming out, but he wasn't able to get that on the reg. That wasn't something he could rely on. But like this is a legend that we know Meg D plays. I've like, also seen like the Meg D Val. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if he wants to play guitars, that's probably the better choice. I would definitely move on to an Asuri. There are reasons to play Asuri. I don't think there are necessarily that many reasons for Meg D to specifically play that Val that we've yeah. also seen. Uh, especially with like how the meta, meta is currently, right? Like if you tried to weigh Gauntlets to Katars, I think a lot of people are, are leaning Absolutely. it into the Katars side. Yeah, that's that's really what I'm looking at, is the Gauntlets versus Katars, because both of those legends have sword, both of those legends have been played by Meg D. Yo, but non-zero axe damage coming out from Stingray on this one. Uh, actually getting a lot of great damage onto Meg D with this axe in hand. Meg D starting to find some footing, got a downlight recovery. Interesting option there. That's technically the optimum true damage that you can do, but there's a lot of other pressure options you can do off the sword. Ooh, his axe is looking so good right now. This is one of those weapons that, like, if you need to get three hits for a color change on spear, you can grab, like, two hits, or maybe if you grab those three hits, then that's giving you, like, a color change and a half. Yeah, you get a, a little bit more damage per hit on those axe swings. Uh, some of those side airs in particular can really chunk away. That's a punish opportunity. Meg D, he's really smart. He's going for the optimum damage options there. Down like ground pound onto Stingray. He knows he needs to make the most out of his hits onto Stingray. Adding up some good damage. Stingray tried to go in with a D-Light because he was looking for that option. The first one was stuffed by Meg D, but then the second one did hit, got the KO, has control of the stage, has control of the weapons, hits the side light, that's the dodge gone. He is just going to grab that second weapon spawn because he knew he couldn't follow up with like another side light or a double D light into a side air or anything like that. Meg D was way too far away from him, so he took what he could to come out as victorious as possible after that. Yeah, just trying to deny those weapons as well, just taking whatever advantages that Meg D gives him. This time he swaps over to the X. You saw him toss that spear away. Uh, hoping to get some more axe damage built up onto Meg D. Uh, but he's not playing axe the way that you'll see like a lot of traditional axe players go. Like they'll go for a lot of those like side light nair into dodge read, things like that. Instead, he's definitely playing like an air-to-air -air game against Meg D. 
Stingray's going to be looking for the weapon spawn. He's in the middle of the stage, so he can get to either side wherever that weapon spawn comes up. Luckily for him, it was on the left while Meg D was on his right, so he's able to grab it back to the axe in hand. So he's going to be looking for those big chunks. Loves those neutral lights on the ground. Neutral air for the juggling. Only hits one of those. Meg D, it's like, yeah, you see him hit three hits, and Stingray can just basically negate that with one. And he's playing it really, really well, even though Axe, of course, has those longer startup frames, which is why I'm not a fan of it in this current meta. Meg D, though, starting to take him apart. He might need to swap over to that spear ASAP Rocky. Yo, the side airs could have done it for Stingray. Meg D almost got that KO, but unfortunately just barely did not hit that final one. But the side stick from Stingray, Keeps him in the lead, and like you said, swapping over to the spear has been a little bit more effective. And he's going to stick with it here. You saw him juggling those weapons, opting for the spear. After that hit, the Katars come straight to Meg D. Oh, I'm surprised he didn't go to pick that up. I think he was really respecting what could have come out from Stingray if he immediately attacked out of hit stun. Yeah, not sure if he was, like, fearing a wake-up recovery or something like that from Stingray, but shouldn't take too long to finish off this stock. Just needs a recovery, just needs a side air from the right spot. Both players being extremely careful right now. Stingray has a nice lead, but Meg D could even up the stocks very quickly. You see him looking for the D-Light, possibly leading into the recovery, depending on where he is on the stage. Is there going to be weapon toss? Because there is one on the stage. He's not. And that's because he probably wanted to stay with Sword 100% to finish off that stock. Now that it's damage time, he's swapping over to the Katars because he feels more confident in their damage build ability, the string ability, everything like that, the comeback ability as well. So just getting around that corner, the GC in light, throwing out all of those active frames to catch Stingray when he gets back. Great way to finish that up. He's all but evened up this game, Duke. Yeah, and it's off the back of like really picking and choosing when he wants to attack. You talk about how Meg D can really slow games down. It's predominantly because he's really not throwing out constant attacks. It's not a barrage of hitboxes. Instead, he's waiting. He's trying to hope that you'll throw out an attack, and then he comes in and gets a punish with his quicker attacks on these guitars. And that's why Meg D is such a strong player when he utilizes that play style, because it's all about grinding down your opponent's patience and really having... Um, high, really strict requirements for when he actually wants to commit. Otherwise, he's in an unsafe position. Gets over to the wall there, but Stingray can't really put out much in the edge guard. He's just waiting for the weapon spawn to come back in. So Meg D being able to slow those things down, pick and choose where he wants to actually commit. Look at that, and there is a big commitment. He found the right spot, and that let him take the game. Yeah, really unfortunate. Again, rewinding a little bit to that edge guard opportunity from Stingray. Like, he was unarmed against Katars, and it's an Asuri Katar, so he's like, I can't do more. I want to continue this edge guard, but I don't want to risk that GCN sig. So instead, on stage, Meg D just catching the movement of Stingray. You saw the dodge, caught it with the downlight, and of course, he's going to go right on into the recovery, and that's forcing the character swap from Stingray. Yep. This is going to be a swap over to that Orion. He's getting away from the axe while holding on to the spear. He's going to come into like really what everybody loves. I mean, we say this every time, but it's because I'm a fan too. And this is what I love to see. I love to see the Orion coming out from Stingray, getting back to his roots. And we are going over to Small Brawl Haven. Let's see what the Lance is. Now, Kostelix did comment earlier in the day that there were, like, no Lances in Top 32, which at the time, that was correct. But now that has since changed with Stingray swapping over onto it. Yeah, Stingray, of course, loves to make Kostelix look like a liar. Uh. <laughs> yeah, hey, I'm stepping away from that one. You're, you're, you're putting words in his mouth. I, hey, I, I ain't got nothing to do with that. A uh, nice downlight recovery coming out from Stingray. We are on Small Brawl Haven, uh, so potential here for some quick stock KOs on uh, really either side. Yeah, this is really going to play uh, for both players because the D-Light recoveries are on Sword from Meg D are going to be able to KO so much earlier here, but then everything that Stingray has, all of the utility in that spear kit, as well as the signature kit. Bogo into the recovery. Still not enough, though. Over to the Lance. No signatures thrown out. Stingray, he's got that signature uh, down sig, right? He loves to do that right there, but Meg D's ready for it. A lot of side airs coming out from Stingray before this. Not a lot of nares, which I'm a little bit questioning of. He, he wants the KO, and the nair is not going to be the immediate KO option, so he's hoping to keep uh, to catch Meg D jumping in the air so he can get that KO, even from the center of the stage. Ooh. Nice dodge, nice movement, a way to get through that. Great punish as well from Meg D, now taking a lead about a minute and 22 into this game when the first stock fell. You talked about that wearing that Meg D can do, that friction that he puts on the opponent's mental. That right there, you can see Stingray is getting really eager to finish the stocks off. He throws out so many signatures, down sigs, the Lance side sig as well, and Meg D is going to get those punishes. 
And I'm, I'm reminded of uh, something that Experience tweeted earlier today, and it was like showing a picture of replays that were like five and a half minute games. And he said, like, when I'm willing to do this, then I'll be like the best in the world. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> then, then I'll be the okay. best player. And that's something that Meg D can do and does. And that's one of the reasons Meg D is so successful as a player, like he was at the mid-season championship. Because it, it's very difficult to do. Everyone can say like, oh, just like don't attack. That's all he's doing. But no, there's a lot of patience. There's a lot of maturity. There's a lot of understanding of what is going on and what could happen that goes into playing successfully in that way from Meg D. Gets nope. stuffed and the weapon toss, he's sweating, he's done. Nice wake up from Stingray. The jump pogo, saw the stars come out, went for the weapon toss just in case because Meg D didn't go too low there. And Stingray manages to get himself a nice lead where uh, it had been pretty even uh, so far. He's not gonna extend anything off the top. I think he was mostly out of in-air movement after hitting that recovery. So no major vertical KO there, but still a lot of damage has been done to Meg D. Stingray about a full stock head, one or two more hits, and he will be exactly a full stock head. Let's see, there is a weapon spawn in the middle of the field. Is either player going to go over to it? We might see Stingray make a move, but no, he's gonna stick with the spear, just guard that corner, protect the landing from Meg D. Falling side air, weapon toss doesn't connect. He's got some big weapon tosses here. Both the spear and the lance have some wide hitboxes on those throws, but Meg D gets inside of it, doesn't get the dodge read for the recovery. That spear toss that he just threw up and then picking up the lance into the immediate recovery, that was almost so nasty. That little bonk on the head would have put Meg D in a little bit of hit stun, would have thrown off his plans for movement, and that could have given Stingray the perfect opportunity to find the lance recovery KO. He's being so he careful about picking weapon. up that weapon. I'm, weapon. I'm surprised. Uh, I think he primed a specific weapon. He knows he's deep red. He doesn't want to put himself in a position where he's like coming in on a lance on his final stock here against Meg D. So he, he, he literally does not want a weapon right now. He, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess you're right. He probably just wants to do as much damage as he can for the last moment because he knows he's going to be knocked out soon. The neutral light from the middle of the stage, not going to do it. I mean, the one uh, downside to this plan of his is that he has significantly less range. You see him going for a lot of those dash downlights. He's not throwing out any attacks. An air won't KO. He needs that downlight for the GCN heavy or the recovery, but the side air from Meg D. Final stocks here, so we're expecting Stingray to finally want a weapon. He was probably just running around and be like, come on, hit me. I want you to hit me. Hit me right now. I want you to hit me. But <laughs> Megdi just really couldn't do it for so long. Oh. And there it is. He felt a little more confident in actually committing with the D-Light there. We saw one previously towards the end of his second stock that didn't actually make the hit. But really, it seems like at the end of the day, he was just looking for that D-Light into the recovery to get the KO off the top. The weapon toss bonking on the head there. You see him in sweat beads. 600 four damage but look at the split between those two. Oh no he did a GC neutral heavy excuse me when I said recovery but yeah you see it's it, this is a spear game yeah for sure it's very interesting um why he wants the Orion spear over the Brin like it's not like he's really utilizing the signature kit that well like he's thrown out a bunch of spear down six now we're starting to see that lance come out even um, then I feel like he's not using the down six as much yeah. as we're used to it's definitely interesting. I, I got to chalk it up to a stat line. Like, he'll have a little bit more defense and less movement speed is uh, maybe what he's looking for with the swap over to the Orion. Now we're seeing some nares coming out. That's what we want. Before, it was so many side airs hoping to catch Meg D jumping. But now we need to look for that juggle game. That's one of the strongest things that Lance has in its kit. Beautiful neutral signature hitting at the 45-degree angle. Maybe reading a D-Light the wrong way. But yeah, now we're seeing those signatures come out. Already saw an in-sig on Lance. Already saw a D-Sig on the spear as well. That's one thing that I think Stingray does very consistently is like, show a clear game plan in one game and then have a completely different one for game two. We've seen that, said that time and time again, where he comes in with the Brin, plays an entire game, basically no axe damage, then game two starts off with the axe and basically only wants to play the axe. Here in game four, Meg D doing a good job of keeping this one competitive and denying a possible 3-0 from Stingray. On this Asari pick from him, we are, of course, on the Demon Island No Soft platforms. Meg D again, a lot of jumping, a lot of fast fall before committing. His last two commitments have been two sword nares, and that's it. And there's been like five to six, maybe even as many as seven jumps in between each neutral air. So he's trying to play as carefully as he possibly can, that time falling with a down air after the whiff from Stingray. D-Light recovery, perfect height, picking that one up, getting the KO off the top, keeping it pretty even. Just forcing out the options of Stingray and then punishing for them. There's the weapon spawn. Stingray does pick it up. He had a nice lead going into the second stocks, and Meg D has completely gotten rid of it. 
Nice two piece, three piece. Putting so much space. He's at like the perfect spacing between him, between him and Stingray. Like that, that spacing like right there, he's usually a little bit further away so the cider doesn't actually hit. But his ability to be like three legend links, three legend hurt box links away where Stingray doesn't have the range, especially with the spear because he doesn't have that movement to get him closer like Stingray has with the lance. Yeah, and then great recognition from Meg D knowing like you don't have that horizontal acceleration that you might have had in the past on that weapon. But right now, Meg D. This spacing right there. Yep. This He's so good at getting to that exact spacing and then basically keeping that in tandem, in parallel with Stingray. He, Stingray moves forward just a little bit. Meg D moves back exactly that same amount to keep that perfect spacing when Stingray has the spear. Yeah, he wants the opponent to be the one to break that spacing so he can get inside. But Stingray does find the hit, that recovery. Meg D, final stock here in game number four. Needs to win this to take this to game five. Seeing the neutral airs coming through, hoping for the juggle. Megdi was inside of the second one in sort of that, like, uh, that's basically the eye of the storm of the hurricane where it's calm for just a moment before it starts to get crazy again. The three-piece coming out from Stingray. Megdi hits an air, needs the recovery here. Doesn't hit the down light. Stingray's the one with the punish. Ooh, he ends up getting down away from that side air that probably would have led to the KO. I don't know if it would have forcibly sent into the blast zone still in hit stun, but it would have set up for the edge guard, which probably could have been cleaned up with a weapon toss. Meg D is so damaged. He needs to find like essentially three different miracles. The first one is to KO Sting right here and get him on final stocks. Oh! Uh, the, the, the second one is not getting hit by that ground pound to then fall. Stingray takes it over Meg D 3-1. Uh, a, a rare change in mentality from Meg D in that final stock there. He got very eager. He really wanted that stock. You saw him starting to approach on Stingray a lot more. He was going in even there, dash jump dare, and Stingray's like, all right, turn this around, get the KO, put out the damage with the Lance, and win it all. He's going to go 3-1 and earn his spot in the top eight. And in that last game especially, when we saw the damage breakdown on screen during those replays, 429 on Lance. That is 54% of his overall damage was done on that Lance. That's why that swap from Bren to Orion was so smart. Even beyond the signatures that he was finding KOs with, it's that Lance damage that he needed. He didn't have to rely as much on the spear because, again, the spacing from Meg D against the spear was really good. But having the Lance, when you throw out that side air, if, if we have this spacing right here and I'm going to get you with a spear, like this is how far I can go and and that's where Meg D was every time. If I got a lance in my hand, all of a sudden I'm going with the side air. I'm here and you're getting hit because of that movement in the actual attack itself. Thank you for acting that out for me. Thanks. I, I really hey, thank, that. thank you. You were, you were a great scene yeah. partner. Uh, you know, and, and scene. And scene. Yes, and. But we are going to yes and our way into the top eight now. We've got four of our players in the top eight. And uh, Arguably no surprise to see any of them, but we'll tell you who they are in a little bit. We're going to take a short little break. It's going to be a surprise and a mystery. I don't know who it is. We'll, we'll, we'll find out after the break.
And the mystery will now be revealed. It's, of course, uh, names that you can see behind us. Sandstorm and Radish are on the winner's side of top eight. And on the other side, of course, Luna and Stingray. Uh, these are all names that we've all kind of known and have grown to love. They're names that we all kind of expected to be here at this point, uh, barring maybe a couple. Yeah, we were talking in the car uh, like last night and then also in the car this oh, morning like, about uh, where Sandstorm okay. was going to be placing today. Uh -huh. uh, I think last put him coming in fourth. Okay. Uh, I think he's going to come in fifth place. So oh, he's still okay. poised for that right now. Of course, on the top eight side on the winners, uh, Radish, uh, not a bad, uh, not necessarily a surprise coming to top eight here. Of course, you had Radish in your top three. Uh, Luna, no surprise whatsoever. And then Stingray, also no surprise whatsoever. So as crazy as Winter championship can be there are still some like pillars that are holding up uh the, the ceiling so it doesn't all come crumbling down on top of us yeah i mean of course there's still time for some chaos oh, to ensue we still have not determined who our top four is but we're gonna find out two people who are gonna be going into that top three in just a little bit and again of course we've got sandstorm and radish which interestingly enough like despite the fact that there are two names that at this point, people kind of know, you know, Sandstorm again, one of the household names of Brawlhalla. On the other side, Radish, someone who's really been on the come up. They haven't really played against each other. Which is, that's, I don't, like, like, I, 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 tr I trust the numbers. <laughs> I trust the numbers. I trust the science. But, like, up here, it seems like, come on, there's, there's no, there's no way that's true. It is true. I'm saying it's true, but it just doesn't feel like it should be true. It's 0-0 zero, zero in terms of official tournament matches. Let me look at uh, all tournament matches even that is just one one between these two how have these two players not really met well it's kind of like uh two ships passing in the night right sandstorm was one that left very early from the docks and then he kind of went off and did his own thing whereas radish came a lot later and he's kind of been on this set path and finally they're kind of getting near each other but there you're seeing Sandstorm again. He's the GOAT for a reason. He's won so much that the graphics <laughs> can't handle it. I love that his average win rate for 2022, even like his quote unquote, like you fell off year, or like yeah. your quote unquote wash because you're not the greatest that's ever, that, that has ever done it in that year specifically. Like he still had an 86% <laughs> win rate. That is, that is so insane Three, for a player two, like Sandstorm. One, Coming in here, of course, with the Arcadia that we saw from him previously. Now he does have a couple other legends that he is looking to play today. He told that to me earlier which was uh, really nice i really appreciate that hoping to play solo arcadia but then he also has a tesca and a mirage as the other picks of course the mirage over the mordex why probably because of that spear yeah his spear has been looking very good uh now you're seeing him of course on that arcadia those down six have been so effective on those edge guards radish actually started this off really strong he even got that down sig on the corner but he was not able to convert that into a ko one thing that works well for radish though against sandstorm with these down six is i think he has a little bit of a stronger uh air to air horizontal pressure than some of the other people sandstorm has run into today so one thing that uh, Radish was having a little bit of trouble with in his previous set was when he was forced onto the gauntlets, he was starting to struggle to find his way in. And there, there was one moment where like it was an entire stock where he was basically forced onto unarmed or really onto gauntlets and then unarmed. The second he picked up an orb, he got knocked out. Then he respawned back in and again was having a little bit of trouble finding his way in. Seems like he's not having that here. Of course, he does have the orb in hand. Going to make sure that he has a fresh orb he grabbed the fresh orb rather than the one that already had damage on it. His next weapon will be the gauntlet. So we'll see what happens in between now and then. Because if he gets taken out here like he does, the majority of this stock could be forced on unarmed and the gauntlets. Yeah, definitely going to be coming in here with those gauntlets. Uh, interesting kind of uh, change up in the playstyles, right? Like Radish used to do that orb and sig a lot. I don't think it's going to be that effective against Sandstorm. He's not one who's been over aggressing on those corners. Instead, he's been like sitting on the stage, throwing out those down sigs. So they're both just kind of putting out these timers to try to delay those uh, returns to the stage. And it's very similar to the way that like Volkov players like to guard Whoa. the edge with his uh, with his essentially a similar, but not yeah. the exact same by any means, little trap on the corner. Yeah, difference being that Volkov has to hold his, yes. whereas Sandstorm can kind of throw his out. Won't have the same force dump that Volkov's does, but he can follow up with whatever option he wants to. Gets above the signature, but Radish gets away from the punish and a side light side air. Not quite enough. Now, I wonder what chat is saying. Like, I know down some sig. people were complaining about the down signature, uh -huh. but like we're seeing some signatures straight up spam come out from Sandstorm right now. And we're seeing Radish deal with it pretty darn well. 
Yeah, I mean, Radish is definitely showing why this might not always be the most effective tactic he's been able to man uh, he's been able to uh, to handle the signatures thrown out from Sandstorm. Even when he's changing it up, he's not throwing out those down sigs. Those neutral sigs of his. Ooh, have that was a nice one. Down. But yeah, that was really great. I love that challenge. He went in with a dash jump side air, didn't hit, but the GC down light covers himself, and of course, it becomes a finisher because it's the great sword. That's one of those few moves that I'm trying to think about in the game that is a light attack that is a covering both sides for a grounded attack. Okay. I'm trying to think through a bunch of different moves, and I can't think of any. I'm, there may be one out there, and I'm just forgetful. But I can't think of any. Oh, great spacing there from Sandstorm, knowing to break that line of sight to get away from that neutral signature from Radish. Like you said earlier, he hasn't really found anything with that, because Sandstorm really isn't pushing himself into it hard enough. He's kind of staying back. Oh, but the three-piece from Sandstorm, and he's back to that spear. Radish over to the Collins gets the down light, but can't get the side light follow up. And he's, woo, that ooh, was a close one. Traveling around the entirety of the map. And of course, Sandstorm didn't make oh, any. Oh, oh. Ooh, whoa, that's rough. He wasn't ready. That's rough to see. But you saw Sandstorm not make any like major motion over to that edge guard. That's probably going to be the way he just like plays, uh, period. And he has the lead here. He has been winning in neutral, though. Radish doing a fantastic job of evening this one up. So Sandstorm might find it hard to get the knockout here. Oh, I take that back. Wow. Wow, indeed. That was uh, definitely a closer one than I think a lot of people expected. Like, I got to believe the viewer vote, was, a viewer vote was leaning pretty heavily into Sandstorm again, that fan favorite. And I do like that Sandstorm's kind of been forced to change up, right? A lot of times against his previous opponents, he's throwing out that down stick. He's waiting for you to come in. Radish not taking that bait. He's sitting on the outside, and he's generally challenging with an air approach. So Sandstorm's like, all right, down stick forces this air approach option. Now I'm going with a dash jump side air after I throw out that down stick. And we're seeing a pretty much even split coming out from damage numbers between the Spear and the Greatsword. 261 on the Spear, 263 on the Greatsword from Sandstorm. So a nice even mix between those two weapons. Radish, though, forced a little bit more onto the gauntlets this time. He's gotten a decent amount of damage put out there, but Sandstorm reads the dodge down. That means he doesn't get the second downlight. That was a burn dodge. Okay. Sandstorm back at it with the greatsword. Side light connects. Radish chasing. Doesn't go for the GCN sig that he did earlier. Sandstorm manages to hold on to this stock, but Radish catches the dodge. The delay after the side light leads to a recovery, and Radish has the lead. Falling there. Oh, he's able to swipe that right from under him. Over to the spear. Sandstorm with the N sig cleans up the stock. A little bit of damage put out from Radish. Okay, Sandstorm denying weapons. Back to the spear. We haven't seen those big strings from his spear that uh, we were seeing in some of the earlier matches as well. Like, he was doing a great thing of, like, downlight side air, GC down sig. Not really even seeing the opportunity for that against Radish. Side air coming in. Sandstorm staying wide. Gets away from that spirit bomb. Radish running all the way to the other side of the stage, using every bit of movement speed that the Petra has to offer. He is in a fantastic spot here, of course, leaning heavily on that orb. Oh, the recovery. Gonna clean up the stock for Radish, and the lead just mounts bigger and bigger for him. Over the spear, two end lights connect for Radish. That time, not even moving for it. There's that GC down sick, doesn't hit the dare. Radish is back. Now, unfortunately for Radish, like, he is still adding up a great amount of damage right now, has a fantastic lead, but when he did those back-to-back -back neutral lights, he got the dodge. So unfortunately for Radish, he wasn't able to like hugely string Sandstorm after he got that dodge with a neutral light into a D light and then continuing on from there. But he's still getting these hits. He's got Sandstorm over on this left side. Down light into the neutral air. Doesn't get anything off that bounce, though. Has the spear in hand. D-Light goes for the side air. Setting up the edge guard because the recovery would not have KO'd off the top. That time he does go for the KO rather than bouncing off the stage. Probably couldn't have hit the bounce off the stage because it was so close to the wall that a side air might have been weird. So that's why he's probably going for the recovery there. Gets away from that neutral signature again. Radish is unable to find that, but he doesn't get punished for it, even though it costs a dodge. Does find the KO, finds the game as well. Radish doing a fantastic job here. Yeah, Radish is uh, looking really solid against Sandstorm. Gauntlet's looking good. Orb, of course, still looking amazing. 204 damage put out on the Gauntlet's. 313 on the side of his orb. He was hitting those side airs. He was hitting those recoveries for KOs. And of course, he was still getting that damage built up.
All right, we're getting right on into game number three. Still no character swaps on either side. Uh, you know, I think I'm I think I'm pretty much down with that because okay. I am I am liking the great. Of course, Radish just won last game, so yeah. it's it, it's the Petra. Really loving the Petra from Radish. But for Sandstorm, I'm I'm still feeling I, st I still feel there's a little bit more in the tank on the Great Sword rather than swapping over to the possible Tesca. That is radically different. That he would have to like basically pick up and start running all the way from the ground floor. Whoa! Okay, just he's, he's done. Untouchable yep. zero to D. Greatish destroying Sandstorm there. This is, again, many people's goat of Brawlhalla. He's the person that the fans voted to win this one, and Radish is uh, untouchable for the game three start. He's many people's goat. He also just, like, is the goat. Like, yeah. if you if you have a different opinion, like, you're, I'm just telling you, you're wrong. Oh, dodges through that one. Also finds back-to-back -back unarmed neutral airs. Down air actually launches Sandstorm down there. Depending on how you hit it, sorry, the down light, depending on how you hit it, uh, will launch in different directions. Sandstorm manages to avoid that. Uh, the cider would have been fatal. Gets the follow up that time after hitting the trap that he missed previously. There's the cider sending Sandstorm over to the right. Dude, Radish is incredible right now. Sidelight cider, unfortunately, from the wrong side of the stage. Sandstorm just barely holding on. Barely also gets through that. The spot dodge was perfect to get through the sidelight. Yeah, just narrowly got through there. But the recovery comes out. Radish up three stocks to one sandstorm he beat the world champion to get to his spot here and radish is uh he's handling him a lot of dashes coming out Ooh, bad spacing there from sandstorm means radish was behind him when that side light came out recovery okay denies the three stock over to the spear this has been that comfort weapon for sandstorm I, you know, at the end of the day, the way Sandstorm is like right now, where he doesn't, where he isn't winning every single tournament in the world, I don't know if he has the comeback potential Ooh. on this weapon. He almost got the stock there. Okay, maybe yeah, keep I keep saying no. Keep no. Keep keep it going. Keep going. Uh, no, ain't no he's, way. He's ain't no bad. way Sandstorm comes back here. No shot. Yeah, of course. He's he's never done anything like this before, and uh, maybe not again. As doesn't hit the down air. Radish on the edge guard. And Sig doesn't connect, and Radish with another side air. He's celebrating a little there. early there. A little premature there. Okay. Sig. Sandstorm gets it. What I was trying to say was I didn't necessarily see the comeback potential specifically because of Spear. Not that Spear is a bad weapon, but because, like, when Sandstorm used to do that in the past, it was with Scythe. It was with those Scythe Gimps. It was with Gauntlet Gimps. It was with all of that. And we just don't ever really see that from Spear as a weapon. We see solid strings, great damage build, great utility in the kit, the edge guard from time to time, but rarely is it those like early gimps because you have so much control over where you are and where your opponent is with like Gauntlet Nair and all of the active input that Scythe has in the kit. Yo, but we've seen the Spear players this weekend be very safe about it. He might not get it quickly, but he'll definitely get it safely. As he is doing it, he is getting this damage put out. Radish is one Sarah away, but it's not going to be that one. Edge guard opportunity. Sandstorm goes up. Weapon toss guarantees the touch, but the neutral light closes it out. Radish is up 2-1. That was much closer than I expected it to be. And it was off the back of not like any one big explosive moment that was the game changer that everybody would point to, but it was just amazing neutral with the spear showing how how strong that weapon is in virtually every situation, which is like, yeah, there are people calling for like Tesca nerfs. There are people calling for Katara nerfs. There are also a noticeable amount of people calling for spear nerfs as well, which is why we're seeing so much spear this weekend. But Radish, man, the turnaround from Radish, amazing gameplay so far. Again, you're seeing on the damage breakdown there, 391. Radish is an ore player. That's one of the reasons he is playing this legend. Uh, got the, probably the, the best ore yeah. legend. I don't, I don't really know how, how people are feeling about fate right now. That would be like that the only the other, other one that I think like one, yeah. maybe in the conversation, but I certainly would would put Petra over the, the fate. Uh, yeah, definitely hard to argue otherwise. You don't see too many Thors. You don't see too many Dusks in that conversation. But right now, Sandstorm trying to make a conversation for a game five as he gets another downlight side air onto Radish. He's adding up the damage, but Radish is not having that explosive start that he did at the last at the start of the last game. So uh, this one might be a little bit tougher for him as he goes over the gauntlets. Radish is going to snake those weapons away from Sandstorm. He probably just did that to deny the weapon from Sandstorm, saying well, me on gauntlets and him unarmed is better than me with an orb and him with a weapon. Definitely a valid oh. idea. It's through the signature, but doesn't get punished. Radish 
Over to the orb. Going to be looking for side airs again, but he needs more damage. A Sandstorm is one nair away from getting that stock advantage over Radish. Edge guard, no down six this time. Sandstorm's been really good at jumping high and punishing. Trap. Oh, recovery. Okay, picking up the recovery. We've seen Sandstorm pick up some nice recoveries. We also saw that from uh, a couple, I think, picked up from Alex earlier on the Jay Yun. So the Great Sword recoveries, they've been doing they've been doing some work today, despite uh, the frame data that is not super favorable on startup for that move. Yeah, it doesn't have the best startup, but it does have a great hitbox and a lot of force behind it. Radish, there you see in that end light nerf, right? A lot of the Great uh, sorry, the Gauntlet players, the second they saw those patch notes, the second that it dropped, they were like, look at this end light. I can't KO at Bro. 130. Oh Every God. single person. I still can't get <laughs> over how like gloom and doom. This is the, the gauntlet apocalypse. It, this this weapon is nerfed into the ground and never worth playing again. That was so funny, the reaction from gauntlet <laughs> players out there. Yo, but Raiders still managed to get that KO with the gauntlet end light. But right now it's Sandstorm who's looking for another KO. He's gotten so much damage put out with the nice, spear. The end sig is going to take out Radish and Radish is down to his final stock here. Sandstorm clutch factor coming into play here with solid neutral, solid weapon denial, great trap usage, of course. The D-Sig that we saw many times in this set, many times in previous sets, even on Twitter.com forward slash GD Sandstorm. One thing that's going to be really, really tough for Radish here is uh, he's, he's still a young guy. He's a new player. He does not have the experience that Sandstorm has. And it means that when you're in this pressure cooker situation, like it's going to be harder to handle as Sandstorm is getting ready to go into game five. He hits the end sig. And now the pressure is on Radish. That was a two stock that he just picked up. The very, very command performance coming out from Sandstorm, showing why probably a lot of people in chat bet a lot of channel points on that player. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely a very strong player. Couple that with the fact that he's back. He's been practicing for the Winter Championship. He hasn't won a Winter Championship before. He took out Impala. There's so many things. Looking good for Sandstorm, but at the end of the day, this is game five. Radish just has to get through three stocks to halt Sandstorm's run. And we're going back to Small Brawl Haven. Now, one thing about this map, I think it benefited Sandstorm maybe a little bit more than Radish at the end, not just because Sandstorm won, but if we look at the damage that Sandstorm dealt, it was 525. Split that one in two thirds for each stock, and that is 175 that he was finding KOs. That is pretty darn efficient, considering you turn red at the very beginning at 150 damage. So he's like one or two hits past that, and or probably just a signature, and that's doing the 25 Ooh. damage after Radish has turned red. Yo, but the end sig from Radish connects on that corner. Sandstorm went a little too close to the edge, and now Radish is back on that orb, putting out those Hadoukens, just trying to cover that corner. Sandstorm does get back, side light, side air, Sandstorm, Yet to touch down, Radish with the ground pound. Nice. He'll get the stock advantage. Now, one thing Radish did over on the left side when Sandstorm was on the wall that I don't remember seeing him do that often is he threw one Hadouken, but then he also threw a second one. I feel like the previous times we've seen him, it's only been like one Hadouken, but that time he changed it up through the second in case Sandstorm was like, okay, he threw out his one. I'm going to jump up now. He's so far back from the wall. There's nothing he can throw out. Now, for Sandstorm, he still didn't get hit by it, so it wasn't a successful engagement for Radish, but you see the mix up there on the corner. Guard. Yeah, just trying to make sure the opponent can't get too relaxed, can't think that it's safe, even though you threw out one attack with recovery frames. Weapon toss comes out from Sandstorm. Radish just picking away at him. Sandstorm again goes for that dash jump side air. Radish is ready for it, gets him with a side air of his own, and he's adding up that damage. Hadouken doesn't go for the second. Now, if a weapon spawn comes in, I'm not sure if Sandstorm will pick it up. Well, he definitely will now that he's unarmed. But last game, he almost did triple the damage oh. on his spear that he did on Greatsword. Oh, oh, he finally falls into that one, and it's in game five to give Radish a two stock lead here. He is building that lead. He wants to get into the guaranteed top three. He wants to go to the winner's final. He just needs to get through one more stock of Sandstorm, but Sandstorm was so close to bringing back a three stock earlier, he might do it again. He's got the spear. Going to be able to spend some serious time on this weapon for the beginning stock of Radish. He's going to have to find that amazing neutral. He started off there with a nice three piece, didn't get hit yet. Still fresh. Now we just took two. That's a two piece from Radish. Downlight and uh, Nair. Downlight Nair again. Doesn't hit the side air. Sandstorm. Keeping the pressure going. He really likes to utilize those weapon tosses to keep that engagement going. There's another weapon toss. Keeping Radish on his toes. Pogo. Nair. 
Trading back and forth, but Radish has not hit Sandstorm for a hot minute, but there's two. The damage output from Sandstorm is good. Oh, he's going low. But the no damage dare. output from Radish is also really good. So even though like the rate is probably higher on Sandstorm right now, he has to still put out like four times as much damage. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, Sandstorm has one stock to get through three of Radish's. He's gone through two so far, but a side air and Radish closes it out. Three, two over Sandstorm. He's going to the winner's final. Great work from Radish there to take it out. What a huge opening in the final game. That's like one of those things where we'll see like a 2-1, or no, we'll see a 2-0, mm -hmm. and then of like a great player who has the two, and then like a good player who has the O. And then like in that game three, maybe the O player takes it, but then that very next game, that game four, the like quote unquote great player, the quote better player, they just completely destroy them. That happened this game, but Sandstorm was not the quote unquote great player, better player there. In this case, it was Radish. Yeah, Radish, I mean, he uh, was making sure that Sandstorm did not get that uh, that factor in. He did not close that one out. You can even see the graphs. Like, that was two stocks taken from Radish's one, and then he started to mount more. But there was always that palpable threat, that uh, that fear that Sandstorm could bring that one back. And even look at this final one. That is almost an identical graph. Like, you see this portion right here, it's basically the same as this. Then you have a flat area, you have a flat area. You have a little bit of steep, a little bit of steep. Flat, 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 flat. Then top at the end, top at the end. So that final stock, they were essentially at the exact same pace, but Radish was just so far ahead that Sandstorm had to do twice, three times, four times as much damage in the same amount of time than Radish did. Radish had to get lucky like once, and that was that side air that took out Sandstorm at the end. Sandstorm had to get lucky every single time. They said that when they were trying to catch Pablo Escobar, and look, they ended up doing it. They did. They uh, they were very successful. Uh, but we are, of course, still in the top eight winner's side. We've still got two more to find out who's going to be going up against Radish in the winner's final. Will it be PR number one, Luna? Will it be PR? PR number three, Stingray. Uh, this is, yeah, uh, I would have liked to see this in the winner's finals, but no, we actually get to see it in the winner's semis, and we're going to get to see what the viewers, Ooh. yo, right down the middle. Do we know how many votes are in yet? Like, maybe we're just waiting for some more votes to come in. Leaning towards Stingray, but it is, oh, they just started the vote. Okay, so, okay, it's going to end up changing a little bit here as more votes come in until it sort of solidifies, but it's going back and forth. The, the margin of difference between the two is like only a few percentage yeah. points. Basically even. The interesting thing jump. is it, it had been leaning Stingray for the most part until somebody decided to bet their entire channel points history, uh, but it had generally been leaning Stingray, which is a little bit surprising. Again, like Luna, he, he's PR number one in NA, but it seems like the fans believe in the Stingray. Yeah, I'm wondering if uh, the the initial lean towards Stingray was more like people thinking ahead of time mm -hmm. or whether that's influenced by what we've seen from both of those players specifically today. Because like me, ahead of time, I would definitely say Luna. That's what I put in my predictions. That's what you put in your predictions. But based on some of the things we've seen today, that could have changed my mind. And it looks like Stingray, even though you see the Orion and the Lucian on your screen, we're seeing again the Bryn as the first legend coming out for Stingray here in game one against Luna. Yeah, if history re uh, remains the same and tells the same tale that Stingray has been doing, it'll be pretty much an all-spear game for game number one, and then maybe he'll switch to the Axe. But Luna on the other side, not going in with the Lucian, not going in with the Caspian. He's coming in with the Tai Lung for game number one. This is a regular Luna staple coming in here. Not a lot of people playing more decks anymore. It seems like the popular opinion has fallen off a little bit on who the strongest legend in the game is, and that's a reflection of the meta. A lot of people are thinking Boots. A lot of people are thinking Spear. A lot of people are thinking Katars. More decks is none of those things. Yeah. I mean, he's got feet, but definitely no boots on top of them. I think he's actually, like, straight up barefoot. Uh, check out his wiki feet. But on the other side, Stingray is getting pieced up by the scythe, but Luna manages to get back safely. Now, Stingray is starting this one off with the axe that he didn't have too much success with. He had some, but it wasn't consistent enough for him to stay on the brin against his previous opponents. So you see him swapping pretty quickly over to the spear. Luna. Getting some work done, setting up this edge guard, oh. that down air, and the weapon toss. It interrupted the recovery. Probably didn't need the weapon mm -hmm. toss at the end of the day, but he had it there just in case in order to confirm because he knew he would get weapon spawns on the stage and be able to go over onto his gauntlets, his weapon of choice here to start this next stock off. 
You saw him kind of take a page out of the Meg D book, outspacing those side airs of Stingray on that spear. And then once Stingray dipped low enough, he was like, all right, now's my uh, positioning. I can go in with that 45 that Scythe's so good about and hit that down air to deny the wall touch. But Stingray does find the Axe KO. Back over to the spear. Luna's going to be spawning in. There is a weapon spawn. Luna why, Luna took so long to grab it because when you pick up that weapon, your iframes are going to end. So he was worried about taking a hit immediately upon picking up that weapon. Oh! And he knew he had a little bit of time to use the iframes to, so he could pick the perfect opportunity to grab it. That's going to be a punish. Nice side air into the neutral light. Luna over on the corner. He has the potential for a gigantic lead. He already has a pretty big one that bounced off the stage. Probably not what he wants. Recovery back to the stage. Probably just to touch the wall. That ends up taking out that neutral light into the side air. Yeah, the side air will KO for Luna, and he wants to stick with the scythe. That's generally been the MO of the Mordexes out there. Is like They just really want to play the scythe, and then Gauntlets can be that consistent backup tool if they need it. But a nice wake up from Stingray keeps Luna from getting too much momentum. That side skin goes crazy. Like, that side skin looks like a weapon. The <laughs> other one, like, uh, I, like, I love the pretty, like, autumn one with the little, like, lantern yeah. on top. It's, it's beautiful. But, like, that side, that'd be looking like a weapon. Yeah, sometimes you want just like that, uh, the weapon that looks like it hurts a little extra. Nope, nice. Gravity cancel Silite, though. Doesn't get anything with that weapon toss. Side Sig gonna get punished from Stingray. Nice double Nair, but those Nairs will not KO for Stingray. Luna with a huge lead, just a little bit under a full stock. D Light side air. Stingray very much in the red, has his choice of weapons. Almost was afraid that he wasn't going to get to pick up that spear before it was deactivated and despawned after it hit that little bounce off the soft platform. Luna able to grab the scythe. Shouldn't take too much uh -oh. for him to end this stock unless Stingray finds something absolutely massive. There's the down air. No weapon toss because there's not one on the field from the pickup immediately. Down light doesn't go for the forward yeah. kick there instead. Wanted to get the read for the KO. Uh, the forward kick would have had more variable force, but maybe just because of the positioning, because they're a little bit on the right side, didn't want to risk that potential of just like launching them and then having to reset again. And you see uh, on the screen in front of you, a pretty decent split. Of course, it was Scythe heavily favored, 317 damage to the 212 on the gauntlets, but still a solid amount of damage on the gauntlets coming out. So it's not like if Stingray forces Luna onto the gauntlets, he's going to be without a paddle there. Yeah, he can swim, he can float, he can ride his boat and all sorts of different situations. But right now we're seeing uh, some wide variety in the match. Zolt? Got yeah, oh. yeah. Oh, okay. We love to see the Zolt pick from Stingray. Tell me this about it. This is something I was hoping we were going to get to see today. Of course, after the recent cannon buffs, I just looked, oh, he's looking so he look big. That's a big boy. <laughs> Dude, how's that axe so big? so far. That's not, that's not a real, that's a great axe. What is he doing <laughs> with that? That's the buster sort of axes right there. Oh my goodness on that screen behind us. But I wanted to see uh, the possibility of the Zol. Okay, maybe okay. I was wrong. I'm I don't sorry, think Stingray. you'll see that possibility. <laughs> I misguided. <laughs> I misguided you. This one's on me. I do like a Zol pick right now. I'm really loving the destructive force of Cannon when Cannon players use it really well. I like Stingray Zol as well. He was using that much more in the beginning stages of 2022 than we saw him using it towards the end. So I don't know how practiced he is, specifically currently and the way you're playing against the way other players are playing currently compared to some of the more legends he's been playing recently. I mean, at the end of the day, it's still a character with an axe, which like we have not seen that much from Stingray. Even in the last game where he was on the Brin, didn't see that much. He gets a side air every now and then he'll get that KO. But for the most part, like I would have rather him go for something spear heavy or just cannon and anything yes. else. I, I, I definitely if if I like a Zol pick, but really I like you to be a Zol player that does like 99% of your damage on cannon. I yeah. like a cannon Zol player because I still am not confident on where Axe is fitting into the meta, especially with fast moving weapons or sort of like mid moving weapons if we're talking about spear. It's not as quick as guitars, but it's not as slow as an Axe. Well, right now at the very least, he's swinging big. He's got the most strength in the game. So he's hitting pretty hard. He's actually beating out Luna right now in that damage department. Luna gets in, gets a side light, but doesn't get the movement. I'm actually really liking a Zol pick on this stage as well, because you saw him use the neutral signature earlier, even when that uh, soft platform moves up a little bit to sort of that like Miami dome height versus yeah. the down version, which is closer to a crystal temple. I like the coverage that the neutral sig has on that. It's able to reach up high enough while still putting enough distance between the user and the person on the platform, their target. Yeah, there aren't that many signatures that will cover both heights of those platforms. 
but Stingray does find that side air, and he is 100% sticking with this axe for now. Maybe, uh, again, recognizing that he is quite damaged and the next weapon will be the cannon. He might be playing unarmed for a hot minute here, and yeah, doesn't even look okay. towards that weapon spawn. Okay, Shades of Fiend! He's going on top of the weapon spawn. Like, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I definitely don't need it, except he's not SpongeBob. He actually doesn't need it here. I don't need it. He might be thirsty, but he doesn't need it i mean even the fact of the matter is like despite the fact that he doesn't have any boots on <laughs> he's, still, he's still kicking <laughs> why is he running around unarmed like he's fiend <laughs> playing hattori brother you're playing zol man and he's making it work who is this guy got to three exclamation points didn't even matter still putting out hitboxes he is kicking up Bro. luna the recovery finally gets a KO, but look at Luna's health in the yeah. top right. This, like, the way Stingray is playing and the lead he has with that unarmed uh, section that we just saw, it really felt almost like a dev stream exhibition match. <laughs> Not that he was, like, wiping the floor with Luna, but the way he seemed confident, the way he was styling on Luna with the unarmed kit. Maybe he just, it was the same thing that we saw previously. I can't remember Ooh. who it was, but he was just going to fight unarmed until he got knocked out, so he got the weapon that he wanted upon next pickup. Oh, it was Stingray? Yeah, it's, oh, okay, yeah. That's just a Stingray. Same, thing it's do. the same guy. It's yeah. literally the same guy. <laughs> That's just his thing. Is he? He's a very cognizant of his next weapon spawn, and he wants to make sure. Oh, I'm deep red. I'd rather just play unarmed, get whatever damage I can, and then worry about that respawn weapon. And it's working really well because even when he is unarmed, he's still putting out the damage. Yeah. I didn't quite catch it. What was the, it? The damage split between the three weapons is he did 349 on Axe. That's not a surprise. He did 64 on Cannon. We didn't see very much of it, so that's not a surprise either. But he did 175 damage that's unarmed. That's a stock. That, that, is, that is essentially a stock. If you end that with a D-Light Gravity Cancel Neutral Heavy on something like a lower ceiling map like Brawlhaven, that, that, that quite literally is a stock, and he was doing it so well. That tactic, we don't see that tactic very often and when we do see it it's rarely like that good yeah. it, it'll be like Taz mentioned it yesterday we talk about it all the time like Koslix who if he's playing like a Scarlet he'll pick up the hammer when he's deep in the red he'll he'll do what he can he'll try and swing it but then he'll get knocked out usually pretty quickly but the way that he was able to extend that all of that damage coming from the unarmed kit showing that his unarmed is a threat as well that was spectacular yeah I mean he's putting out unarmed damage on his cannon, and he's putting out cannon damage on his unarmed. But right now, it's all about that axe, which has been working so well for him. It worked incredibly well in the last one. It's still something that like we were kind of critical about, because at the end of the day, we don't really know where axe fits in the meta, but it's fitting in Luna's face right now. Yeah, I'm not sure with the way that Stingray is using this axe, whether it is a axe has a more solidified and confident place in the meta than I previously thought or if this is like a specifically Stingray thing. And if other Axe players picked it up and tried to do it, they would not be as successful. There we see beautiful neutral light. That gets the dodge. Goes in with the Nair. Doesn't quite place it perfectly. Not sure if it was just kind of throwing out there when he could and then turn around and hit the Axe recovery like he did, or if he just happened to miss that down air a little bit too early. Either way, he got the stock, has the weapon he wants. Yeah, Stingray is chunking. He's getting that damage. Luna is not finding any of the dodge reads that he wanted earlier on. This is looking so incredibly good for Stingray right now. This has got to be really tough on the other side for Luna because we know he was disappointed by his BCX placement. So between then and now, you know, he's been like, okay, I'm going to show up. I'm going to do work at Winter Championship. I'm going to win that one. And that'll be my return to being the top guy in North America. The potential is still there, not only in this set, but also in this tournament because there is the elimination side of the bracket. But Stingray is wanting to send him down there nice and early. He wants to take this to a game four after he grabs the 2-1 on this set. I mean, he's definitely poised to do so, has built up a lot of damage on Luna. At the end of the day, it's still a Mordex. It's still Scythe play. It's still got that potential to steal stocks, but he needs to shove Stingray into the offstage. And right now, Stingray in the unarmed is looking like a threat. So I love those three hits or those three engagements that Stingray just did. You saw the GC, uh, or you saw the D-Light into the GC neutral heavy, which he actually didn't hit. But he did that because you saw the recovery coming right after that. That didn't have enough KO. That's why he went for the neutral heavy, the more risky option. Then later on, he felt like he had enough damage to knock out with the D-Light into the recovery, so he didn't want to risk missing the neutral heavy like he did previously. So really incredible uh, choice on which actual finishing move he wanted to go for, even though he happened to drop the D-Light in the GC neutral heavy. Great recognition of the situations. Luna, though, needs to find a new situation. Stingray, again, sticking with the axe. Neutral Light connects, gonna launch Stingray. Not gonna lead to much, though. 
the gauntlets uh, seem to be at quite a bit of a loss here for Luna to find his way in. There's the neutral light over on the edge, not going to KO. Gauntlet players screaming in pain, all in unison right now. It's like a thousand voices, or probably more than that. It's probably like a million voices screamed out in unison. Uh, but they weren't silenced. They're probably still screaming. Yeah, probably still screaming, and uh, definitely uh, Luna screaming a little bit here as there's one stock left to determine who's going to have the lead going into these final moments here. All right, Scythe Opportunity catches the dodge, wants to keep the pressure going. There's the dare. Doesn't hit the downlight. Stingray gets back with the help of a chase dodge. That 360 recovery from Axe, keeping Stingray in this one. But this is the explosive potential. That edge guard over on the right, it took a little while, but it was that explosive potential. Oh, dodge is gone. Okay, it's probably, yeah, it's definitely going to be back now, but now it's burned. He's got to be careful. Neutral light, if he picks it up in the right spot, that's going to be a KO for Stingray on that Axe neutral light. Luna being very careful. Got to be careful about that neutral light. Got to be careful about those side airs as well. Luna throws away the scythe, picks up another one. The side air doesn't connect. Neutral light thrown out, disarmed. He's going to be on Stingray. gauntlets, though. Stingray's got so much potential with his unarmed as well. Oh! oh! <laughs> Stingray with the instant unarmed recovery to take off the top. It is going to be a 2-1 now in favor of Stingray. We're still seeing the numbers heavily favoring the Axe. And, man, uh, like I don't want to second guess the Zol pick whatsoever. I, I, it's just interesting that if you're going like uh, he's playing Axe, there are other Axe Legends out there because he's not playing Cannon. He's not really using too many of the Axe signatures, but man, his Zol Axe is looking magnificent. High strength Axe. He is getting so much value off individual hits, and Luna on the other side is not getting the multiple hits that he wants to kind of convert into equivalent damage. And that's where Luna is starting to struggle and where we might see him make a swap to something different. Of course, we've seen the Mordex uh, for this set, but he could go over back to the Caspian, back to the Lucian, or maybe even back to the Taros. Now, if we are looking at the damage numbers from last game, that's where the inefficiency is going to punish uh, Stingray at the end of the day. Even though he still got the victory there, he had to put out 676 damage, almost 700 damage. Let me do some quick math in my head. That's like two, let's just say, uh, 280. That's like, I'm just going to say it's 230. Oh, it's a little okay, bit less yeah. than that. 225, Roughly. something like that. Yeah, it's 225. I don't know. I had trouble with that. That's easy math. 225 per stock mm -hmm. when you're playing Axe which KOs earlier than your average weapon. Also has Zol, higher strength than your average legend. So it is taking him a little bit of time to get that. If he does that against other players, he might end up struggling deeper in the bracket. But we also could just see him notice that and then go to a different option as this legend. We were talking about his legend pool over on the pre-show earlier this morning. So he has deep pockets to yeah. pull from. He's definitely got a lot of options, even if we wanted to just maintain the X. Of course, we've seen the Brin, but there's been a lot of conversation about that potential Ragnar to come out. Again, guitars are kind of popular in the meta right now, and the only person who's really finding anything uh, functional with the Axe right now is Stingray. So yep. maybe he could bring out that, ra uh, that uh, Ragnar. After seeing this Axe right here, I, I, I don't know how current of a legend Ragnar is. Virtually nobody else is playing Ragnar when we see like the other more, you know, maybe modern legends that have like active input on their normal weapon kit or they have active input on their signatures or they have those more like interesting, oh, these signatures interact with a wall in this certain way. Things that Ragnar doesn't have, which is probably why we haven't seen Ragnar played in a while. If Stingray swapped to Ragnar now, brother, I don't care. This axe is incredible. I, he can play any Axe Legend he wants to, from the best one in the game to the worst one in the game, and I have no qualms whatsoever about that. His Axe is looking tremendous. Well, Luna, hoping that sticking with the Tai Lung is going to be the solution to Zol's Axe from Stingray, because there are no swaps and no more opportunities for Luna. This is game number four. If Luna loses this, it's going to be Stingray going into the top three to fight Radish. First weapon pickup is kind of both players weaker weapons it's going to be the gauntlets from luna and the cannon from stingray okay that's the first like i feel like that probably did as much damage uh total as we saw from cannon last game which was 65 damage total last game yeah he's already he's already done that now that he has luna in the orange yeah, he's definitely done more damage in this game with the cannon than he has uh in the past but it's back to the axe the neutral light not quite enough but he's still getting some great damage over to the cannon throws it away Still maintaining that weapon control. The side air 
Luna is struggling now. The way Stingray is starting this one off, it's going to be really tough for Luna to come back. He has weapons that give him that potential, something that we were talking about that Sandstorm with the Arcadia might not necessarily have, given that his greatsword really wasn't working at the end. So those explosive options from the Gauntlets, from the Scythe as well, you saw how quickly he made work of that stock. Luna's first stock probably went down in 30 seconds, and I think Stingray was like at the beginning stages of Orange. All of a sudden, 30 seconds later, Luna gets the reverse KO onto Stingray. Oh, and he's keeping it going. Kept him in the open air, but Stingray did get past. He's back to the axe. Sidelight does beat out the startup. Neutral light catching Stingray. He's getting these hits in. One thing you're seeing Luna do a lot of is fading back the other direction. Like, he'll throw out that neutral air, but you know he's holding the opposite direction of Stingray. So he can sort of fade away in case Stingray tries to come in with an axe side air to punish or anything like that. So he can get out of the effective range of Stingray, using that drift in the air as much as he possibly can. Side light. Nice. That was the burn dodge from Stingray, so we can go into the side oh. air. Doesn't hit the side light. Stingray's still living. Over to the gauntlets. Neutral light, not going to KO. Likely going to need to hit a recovery or a side air here. Doesn't hit the recovery. Maybe a ground pound. He's playing deep on the wall. He's playing if that ground pound came out like you said, he wanted to play as deep on that wall as he could so that he has as much time as possible in order to react to it. D light into the neutral air, the classic KO combo. And he's sticking with the cannon. This is a deep red stingray. That means he's going to either be playing cannon or unarmed until he respawns Luna. Needs to finish the stock off. Don't let Stingray get too much extra credit here. This is his winner bracket stock right now. Nice side dodge air. through that okay. side light over the corner. That got Stingray back on the stage, but he wasn't there for long. Luna evening this one up. This is one of the more even games we've seen. Now, one game did end last stock red between these two players. Stingray has the ax. The next weapon for Luna, he's going to be looking for it. It's a cannon for Stingray, though. Luna the one, he's fighting unarmed. Denying those weapons. There's the weapon spawn over to the scythe. Cannon in hand for Stingray. We haven't seen that much cannon come out from him. That doesn't mean he doesn't have one. Neutral light, neutral air. Based on what we've seen so far, though, I would give the edge to Luna. Their health is essentially the same between these two, but it's Luna's stronger weapon against Stingray's weaker weapon until he picks up the axe almost immediately when it landed on that soft platform. The neutral light lands. Puts Luna off stage, burns a lot of movement, getting that soft platform, doesn't hit the neutral light. He's starting to take damage here. Side light, side air, puts Stingray off stage. Can he convert this to a KO, the recovery? Ooh, that went high. Movement. Yo, doesn't oh, hit it! Luna, and he's done from that right there. Wow. He went for the ground pound. That's twice. That's twice he goes for the gravity cancel down light, chase dodge ground pound, and doesn't hit it and let Stingray turn that around. He had the pressure, he had the position, he just needed to get that ground pound, but the pressure was a little too much oh. and he doesn't hit it. And Stingray gets the KO, he gets the three one, he's going to the winner's final to fight Radish. That's so tough to watch because I really like the weapon toss he did right before that. He threw that weapon toss high in case Stingray wanted to queue up that axe recovery right away to sort of move him upward towards the stage. That would have been the perfect height because he did that later, just a little bit later, and it was at the exact perfect height to where that weapon toss from Luna was. So he just happened to make the wrong guess in the moment about when Stingray was exactly going to use that axe recovery. He hits that. He's the greatest player in the entire world. At bar for bar, greatest player in the entire world. Unfortunately for Luna and the Luna fans out there, it didn't work out that way. Stingray takes it with that turnaround axe side air to hit his opponent, completely exploit that situation, take the victory. Yeah, great recognition from Stingray, seeing the positioning, saw the opportunity, and he closes it out. Three, one, the axe play in particular, just doing work. For Stingray. Of course, he did a little bit more with the yeah. cannon. 251 this time, so he was able to put out some good damage. But really, it's been all about that axe in this matchup against Luna. Yeah, we saw a nice spread between those two weapons. So he can rely on that cannon when he absolutely needs to. But of course, the comfort weapon is the axe. An axe in Sandstorm's hand, or not in Sandstorm's hand, in Stingray's hand, I, I'm now 100% okay with. This It's essentially like the low defense pass that we give to Pugsy. Like, mm -hmm. Pugsy can play a three defense Jala in 2v2, and that's okay. Stingray can play axe in current meta. Until other people prove me wrong, I think Stingray is one of the very few people who can play axe in current meta and still be top three, still take tournaments.
Well, of course, we have seen uh, so much great action. Of course, we got to see two matches in our top eight of things. Sandstorm falling to Radish. We got to see Luna fall to Stingray. And even just a little while ago, Stingray, who beat out Meg D to get into that top eight of things. We've still got plenty more action, of course. We've got the elimination side of top eight coming in just a little bit. But we want to remind y'all again of all that merch because the time is running out. We want you to go over to Brahalla.com slash winter merch and pick it up before it's too late. It's seven days. Tazza was correct. Seven days. It's like the movie The Ring, but instead you'll just... It's honestly is worse than what yeah. happens in the movie The Ring because like now you're going to be without Brawlhalla merch and that I can't even imagine a world where that happens. It, it would be a, quite the horror story to not have some Brawlhalla merch, especially unique to the Winter Championship. But uh, I think that's going to do it for now. I think we're going to take a short little break. And when we come back, we'll be bringing you the elimination side of the top eight of things. Sparky, any uh, parting words? Nope, that's all I got. All right, stick around, and we will be right back. Over to the guitars now. He's throwing in a couple of hits here. The dodge gets through. Nice yeah. done. this stock he's doing a fantastic job here and there it is and and alex does land down with that neutral air but still no weapon spawns luna's covering oh alex. is he gonna have enough movement to get back there's gonna be no threat from anonymous alex i think he's putting so much respect onto luna right now that's got to be it and it is right with the lower range of the guitars that's a nice way to start things off finally has stingray into ko damage on the edge but it want to come back in so meg D being able to slow those things down pick and choose where he wants to actually commit look at that and then the first one is to ko stingray here get him on the final stock oh uh, even when he's changing up he's not throwing up those down those neutral six of it oh, that was a nice one i'm i'm still feeling i, I still feel there's a little bit the greatsword rather than swapping over to the possible Tesca that is radically different that he would have to like basically pick up and start running all the way from the Rainstorm ground. Storm has one stock to get through three of Radishes. He's gone through two so far but a side air up immediately. Now Light doesn't go for the forward yeah. kick there. Stingray has got so much potential with his unarmed as well. Oh! Light side air puts Stingray off stage. Can he convert this to a KO? The recovery. Ooh, that went high. In. Yo! Got oh. it!
It's all fun and games until you face elimination here at the Winter Championships for North America. Things are heating up here as some of the biggest names have taken a trip down to the elimination side. But of course, here at the Winter Championships itself, you still have time to get access to that winter pack. Do not forget Ooh. to get that now, TWK. Why don't you tell everybody a little about it? Man, it's, you know, any time that we do these seasonal packs for all these championships, they always come with that nice seasonal weapon. Look at these icicle blasters. It you want to so be clean. the <laughs> coldest dude out there? Just blasting people up, downlight recovery with those things, it's over. It's a lock. Yeah, it looks phenomenal. Make sure, again, you do not miss out on your opportunity to get access to those. Every are a limited time offer, much like everything else going on this weekend. But limited time left for many people right now. Now, I won't lie, in the office, I was kind of popping off for a minute because I thought that I made a genius play of just being biased today and picking my oh. favorites for predictions. It got really close, but one thing I did include in my tweet was amongst that pick of Luna, Radish, Sandstorm, there's one name that I felt was going to possibly make a big ruin for that. And that was Radish, and Radish did ah, exactly ah. that, taking out Luna, which guarantees that no matter what, one of the two of Sandstorm and Luna will not make it to the top three finish. And that being said, that depends on if they're able to stop everybody else in their way, because the Elim side is looking stacked. Yeah, I mean, it is actually kind of wild. There's been a ton of insane upsets that happened just going into this top eight alone. I mean, we're looking at this first match is going to be between Anime and Fakie, yes. who both just upset uh, experience and Boomy, respectively. And prior to that, you also had that W anime had over Cody Travis as well. Uh, so it's been amazing. Uh, you know, anime has been rocking the Diamond Head pretty much up to this point, of course, with the Caspian. Yeah. And it was looking good. I love the way he was mixing up neutral sig and recovery as a 50-50 rather than just a guess off of recovery. Yep. And uh, it's frightening. But one of the most impressive things I saw was how he was using slide cancel neutral sig off stage to make people freak out. And then he would move off. Burned your jump. Oh, cool. Moved right back into position and yep. caught him anyways when they were landing. And that's almost how he was able to take out Sandstorm earlier, but he couldn't. And speaking of Sandstorm, rocking that Arcadia all day Yo, long. Oh, all right, man. He, is, he has been talking about on Twitter how he's been on the grind, and it definitely shows. He's got yeah. the setups with the down signatures, you know, those traps. Nobody's really been punishing him with dash jumps over them just yet. Uh, I think in one of the previous sets... You know, Luna was able to do that like once. He hopped behind with the gauntlets, tagged him in the back. But he's been using that for great setups because, hey, if you try to burn your dodge to get through them, the spear 
is going to put you through a rough time. Side light down, light down, light side. Yes. And the great sword is going to put you through a rough time. Full chains. It also looks like a full change coming in because we actually guessed the wrong side of the elimination top eight. Which, by the way, this is still another factor we got to talk about. Sandstorm sending the BCX Yo. World Champion down here to the limb side with, of course, that signature Kaya, basically that staple, if you will, yep. of the Kaya face. But Meg D swapping around. It's always going to be a sword legend. That's just what you're going the to class. expect. But Meg D switching off of the gauntlet pick away from uh, away towards the Asuri, which has been not only an answer uh, from what we've seen to the Tesca battle boots, but mm. just in general, it just fits Meg D's play style. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he just had a uh, phenomenal set over Phazon down on the other channel, Pro Brawl Hollow. Yes. But now that we're here in just top eight, how is that going to shake up against Impala, the current reigning 1v1 world champion? I mean, that's the thing that looms over everybody's head, right? When you are the previous champion. And statistics yep. have proven that being the previous champion means you are not going to have a good time going into winters. There's only one person, according to what I have been able to check, yep. that has ever won BCX into winters. Impala is currently facing a similar position to that because I think the most frightening person in NA to find yourself in, Three, in a limbs is against Meg D most of the time because oh. you are trying to keep your like mental together. You're trying to keep your endurance up and Meg D just drains it out of you with that immaculate defense. Yeah, I mean, definitely one to kind of figure out your habits, right? Wants to slow the game down so that way he can pick apart your game plan and then kind of inject his own in place. Yeah, and that's what we were saying before with the sword, like simplicity is key. You don't need to do anything crazy, but so far with the guitars, uh, going for quite a few side lights, just try to keep things simple, get your damage in, but you have to be so careful in front of Impala with the bow, especially, because the bow is a big reason why that title is attached to him. It's also a big reason why he almost got that set against Sandstorm earlier as well. Yeah, and that's what's going to be really interesting in this matchup in particular, is Kaya has a lot of that range that doesn't let Meg D set up for the kind of, you know, figuring out your game plan that he wants to do, right? That bow down light can engage from so far away, especially against a weapon that's as short range as Katars. Yeah, and also one of the things that's fearful about Katars is when they jump, start jumping right over that D light and you second guess it, then you start mm. getting nared. But if you play around that like Meg D can, you're in a prime position to just, again, whittle away that confidence somebody has. I like the spear switch up momentarily, but still, Impala hasn't really won a lot of these neutral exchanges so far. Yeah, Meg D with a hefty damage lead. Impala working to make up that difference before getting knocked down. And, you know, Kaya actually has a decent amount of defense to be able to play through. Yes, exactly. That's one of the things that will help you long term, too, because Meg D is not that explosive player, but because of how good they are simplicity wise, they will pretty much be hunting for D-Lights here, D-Light recovery as you get around these ranges. Because of that inherent defense from Kaya, you get to live a little bit longer past any surprise plays Meg D might go for. Ooh, going for the side light into that dash jump down air read. That's one of the hallmarks that gets Impala so much purchase, leads to so much damage when people are trying to dodge up from the down light they're expecting mm -hmm. after every side light. I smell desync soon. I feel like Impala is uh, like been hovering around the right range to try and bait Meg D to get comfortable and then just go for it. Weapons off way though. Actually, I thought that might actually be the moment for it, but instead it looks like we're gonna be hunting towards the bow, not really feeling too comfortable with it. And that D-Light Zare is gonna go ahead and get the first stock. All right, first stock in, but Impala was able to even up the damage. He's got Meg D right in that knockout position, deep red, any one of Kaya's pretty strong signatures will be able to get the job done. Exactly, I mean, you already know that one of the things that we saw a bunch last year, even before BCX, uh, with that top eight finish that they had, I believe at Autumn's, slide cancel neutral sig, it was just an Massive. absolute menace to everyone on bow, but uh, so far, Impala's still just trying to hunt for this recovery, should just do it at this point, but Meg D's still avoiding it. Yeah, Meg D now playing a bit closer into the vest on a lot of these engagements, looking to get inside the range of the spear. You know, even the side air, the down air, they don't hit stacked. You pretty much only have the neutral air for that option. Even a recovery is going to get you up away from them before it actually becomes active. That's one of the most frightening things about watching Meg D on guitars is just seeing that now shift away to a more stacked based option. Mm. But that neutral air will finally get the job done. I will give credit uh, where credit's due on the fact that Impala ha barely took damage that time going into the second stock where before they were facing a decent deficit before they brought it back. 
Yeah, that's the kind of adaptation that we want to see, especially because we're in best of five sets here. So it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And you were talking about Meg D, always looking to trip you up at the end of the marathon. Exactly. That like Meg D will have the occasional time where it just kind of goes in uh, on one of, the, one of the given stocks. You just don't know when it's going to be. And so far, it's looking like it's stock two, but the D-Light into the Sarah recovery two, and Impala seems like he's picking it up a little bit here, TWK. Yeah, he's getting that damage now. It's just a question of can you get past this edge guard? Oh, Meg D giving him the respect of space. Right now, just trying to get back up over the ledge. Uh, Meg D giving him a lot of respect there. Going to avoid the Sarah, getting a nice reversal with the Nair, and that's now two. And this is where things start to get rough when you see Impala starting to get a lot of these stray Nairs. But this is as even oh, as you can yeah. ask for, but finally getting him. And Meg D facing his first. Not lead. I was gonna say. I was gonna say. Impala gets his first lead. I completely butchered that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is the first time this game that Impala has taken the lead. You know, it's taken a while to even up the damage, even up the stocks, and now he's got a little bit to work with. Mm -hmm. But oh, man, Meg D. He. I'm expecting. Yep. Keep the sword. Mm -hmm. You want that downlight side air, the downlight recovery, just strong, consistent knockout options. Exactly, and finally decided to dip off stage. I was curious when that time might come because Megdi's almost always just gone for a Sarah at the edge of the stage, and that's pretty much it. Sidelight, not too much else of a punish off of that, but going to switch over to Katars now, actually only just to continue to weapon starve. Uh, one stray recovery maybe does it, but Meg now Impala has opportunity to build some damage. Yeah, I mean, you, you bait out one dodge with that spear, and you get so much return off of it. Neutralites. Neutralites. Not yet enough. A good dodge right at the, pretty much like right on frame for that weapon toss to prevent that edge guard from happening. Pogo down to Impala refusing to relinquish the stock here. Yeah, getting a little bit of extra credit. And you know what? It's that little bit that just adds up over time. I love that option. That was really cool. The side light into jump, chase dodge forward, neutral air. Mm -hmm. It's one of the fastest things. I see him do it off of a gravity cancel or right on the stage edge a lot. That was one of the first times that I've seen him employ it mid-stage. Yeah, it's, it's actually so surprising to me to watch how similar their two playstyles are when we get to this point. But uh, Impala now has a good opportunity here over on the side of the stage. I don't really agree with the idea of maybe going for a ground pound just yet. Do not give up opportunities Ooh. as he closes it out on the side, and that's going to give him the first game. You were looking for that. I that was waiting signature. for that like a whole stock ago. But like the, just the hovering around that he was doing the footsie, uh, the, like you could see him just playing within range that he might just go for it. But he did do that earlier today too when we saw him against Sandstorm. He was kind of reserving it for ledge play and brought it back out here. Oh yeah. Man, so that side signature finding purchase and then the down Ooh. signature. Oh yeah. I know it, it got a little bit of extra Wait a minute. Yeah, All right, I, we yeah, got to yeah, see the yeah, character yeah. picks yeah, a little ooh. bit before you folks. <laughs> Meg D over onto the Ember. I was just talking about how if it's Meg D, there is a sword legend attached to it. It doesn't really matter who, there's going to be a sword. But we are wrong in this case. It's actually going to be the, the switch over to the Ember to keep the Katars and go into the Bow Mirror match. Like, I'm, yeah, I yeah. am very surprised by that. I mean, this, this is a little bit uh, more old school of a pick, I'll say. You know, just because that, that Ember neutral signature, it, it got a little bit of a nerf in the last patch, but, you know, it's still incredibly viable, still one of the better anti-air signatures in the game. I wonder if, it, I'm very curious, like maybe it's just to close the gap, uh, be able to get in on the side six and such, maybe try and change it up a little bit. I still feel like the sword was looking fine in the last game. I think the thing is that it felt like Meg D was a, not confident in going for closeouts, but instead Meg D looking at least way better here on the Qatars here in game two. Yeah, I think it was a lot of those engagements uh, where Meg D was only able to get like some mid-range options. He was only hitting with like the sword neutral light and the sword side light. Nothing that's really going to score you a knockout. Nothing that's going to get you too much stage advantage. I think he gets a better range matchup with the bow instead of the sword. And that's what he's looking for to complement his guitars. And something I didn't notice until just now as we see Meg D get themselves on the board. Normally, I have some pre-match stats about the head-to-heads, but before I thought it was going to be animated fakie. Now that I've gotten mm. a second to pull it up, yep. uh, these two have fought each other a lot more than I realized. And not to mention, and not only have they fought a bunch before, but Impala is one of the few people who sports a perfect record against Meg D. That is a 4-0 record oh. over Meg D. So that is showing, as Impala evens up this game, that he definitely has a fundamental understanding on how to deal with that passive play from Meg D. So one of those uh, bracket demons for Meg D here in Impala, and he's only gotten stronger. I over honestly the last thought six that months. Stingray was like the one. See, like when I saw Stingray and Meg D were lining up each other, I was like, that seems like one of the worst possible options for Meg D to have to fight. Because yep. Stingray is just 
He's just hyper aggressive at the right moments and he trips you up. Impala's on a different case with that where he will kind of do that like that with those neutral sticks, but he's played to make these pace this whole set. Yeah, this has been absolutely crazy. We saw that bone neutral signature coming out from Impala, now making Meg D have some second thoughts about taking to the air. I, I love that. The, the side light into gather information. Uh, both bow players have been using that pretty significantly. Meg D, uh, just a moment ago, was able to hit side. Oh, okay, there it is, that neutral signature. That's one of the main things you're going to see coming out from any Ember player. Yeah, I guess uh, just that anti-air option of uh, trying to make sure that Impala doesn't get these safe jumps in with those neutral airs like he's been doing to pretty much everyone uh, prior to this moment in bracket. But Meg D is getting the straight hits and gets the neutral lights off the Qatars. No whiff punish range for that, but still gets at least a two-piece, almost the third on that nair. Yeah, really just needs to build up that little bit of extra credit. We saw that work out in Impala's favor last time when this situation was a complete mirror image of what it is now. This is, uh, and there we go, whiff punish, for, uh, the <laughs> nice solid whiff punish, always within range. And the fact that he's shutting down Meg D, excuse me, Impala from doing that is huge. Because that's the thing we've always complimented oh. him on, and he's actually having a hard time finding those openers now with the bow. Yeah, neutral air apocalypse has a pretty tall ceiling, so that neutral air at the ground isn't going to knock out just yet, even though Ember has incredibly low defense. Paula just looking for any mistake, and that still, there's that tall ceiling you were just alluding yep. to as Meg D holds on. Look at them jockeying for position. The side light into jump, look for it. But now Impala, a little bit of a hill to climb. I'm not too surprised to that orange. we've converted over to the spear too, because it seems like, it just seems so much more difficult to find openings with bow right now. Meg D winning out on that bow uh, ditto, but there goes a nice three piece, well, neutralize, weapon toss, neutralize, and uh, this is a pretty dead even game. Yeah, Impala gets to play a little bit of that range advantage here. The neutral light, the side light, uh, even the down light to contest, I don't know, neutral air or down air on Qatars. It'll beat out both of them. Yeah, Meg D's, uh, actually, I just realized, Meg D hasn't been like a jump happy neutral air uh, Qatar, so, you, so well, as he does one right there. But it's, uh, I he, mean, but yeah, he's, he's, he's been pretty reserved for it. As more so their positioning rather than, you know, what attack am I going to be falling with? It's, I want to kind of bait you into expecting the anti-air. I want to condition you for that and then capitalize. Yeah, whereas in the next set, we will be seeing anime doing that oh a lot. Oh, And that, not enough just yet. But Impala has brought this all the way back. D-Light Stair will get it. And that is Impala bringing it all the way back into the long game. And honestly, that game in particular shows me why He's got the perfect record on him. He, yep. uh, I obviously, you know, hindsight 2020. Oh, he got the win, but it's the way he got the win. He was getting outboxed in majority of the weapon matchups up until the last stock. And Impala doesn't. It looks like he's not cracking mentally when Meg D is just kind of out poking you over and over and over again. That can happen to so many people. And Impala instead is sporting a 2-0 lead. Yeah, I mean this is absolutely huge. It's incredibly tough to come back from a 2-0 deficit at any point in the tournament. Yeah. Let alone the pressure now of being in that lower bracket, the elimination bracket, where everything is on the line and this deep in a tournament. They've yeah. been playing for a very long time already today. There are multiple things in sight at this point. There is, for one, greater prize pool as you go further up. Two, winter championship title. Three, a trip to the Royale because top three here gets that trip to Royale and Impala is one of those people Huge. as BCX champ, you wanna get that trip back there. You wanna show back up at the lands against all the best and the best and prove that that one time out at the biggest event was not just the one time deal. Yeah, so this is where we need to see, does Meg D have the mental fortitude, the nerves of steel and the stamina to be able to make this comeback? I will say uh, amongst all pretty much almost anybody in the active game right now, Meg D has some of the highest stamina uh, period for for a play. Yeah. Like he, he's oh, yeah. able to go the, the distance. I think one of the few other people I can think of was like Simple, uh, who is another one who can play the long game very well. But Impala is kind of checking him at that. Yeah, th this pick for Miami Dome, definitely an interesting one. You get, you know, some of that shorter ceiling than Apocalypse, if only because those platforms sit higher up and gives you more actual ground that you can mm. do something strong from. Yeah, anything to try and mix it up on the soft platforms in general. Just add one one way to try and get around uh, these uh, neutral layers that Impala has been getting you with repeatedly. And that D-Light recovery will be a great punish on exactly that as he gets the lead. All right, so Meg D starting the comeback here. He's got the stock lead. 
And now, look at that, just continue with, oh my gosh, Impala actually just clutched that out from Megdi's ankles. That was actually ridiculous. Like, it was perfectly on time. <laughs> nope, <laughs> that's for me. <laughs> uh, and now Impala is, uh, again, looking really good. Sidelight. Oh, GC. And oh does it finish? No, 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 okay. no, 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 okay. no, 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 Everybody's fine. No, no, no. Everybody's Look, fine. Okay, all right, all right. Look, I never like seeing that happen. I am not a fan of <laughs> seeing any type of mistakes that lead to a free one. Of course, as a player, you should always take those. But oh, yeah. uh, that is... Uh, Oh, we take those. Yeah, but, yeah, man, we, 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 missing we the jump those. side air there, you can see the nerves coming in. And then yeah, that's the difference between an even game right now. Back to the wall. I, uh, unbelievable. Meg D is living on borrowed time, but you, I mean, you take that as you can right now. And Meg D is not one you should ever give a chance oh. to stay on because he's about to potentially move up two stocks in a lead. Uh-oh, Impala fighting his way back into stage, snatches the bow. Now he's got the corner advantage against Meg D. Paula just doing his best to try and close it out. Misses on that there, but does not miss Snipe. out on the second one. Great job getting all the way down there, lining it up perfectly, and not being uncomfortable with going for it again. However, look at that damage that Megdi was able to get out of that, basically just from that one whiffed stare. Yeah, negated Impala's lead. And, man, this is just absolutely crazy. Still fighting his way back. I, I am surprised that that recovery didn't send farther. Yeah, stuff recovery uh, leading him to basically nowhere, <laughs> right next to the soft platform. Like, okay, let's reset. But um, I feel like, I you know what's crazy? I don't even feel too too comfortable with Megdi's lead because I think back to that last game. Even though he is bought the f he, he falls here, Me Megdi couldn't hold it down mm. the whole time. So if I'm yep. Megdi, I'm just trying to get as much straight hit damage. I need at least Orange to feel happy with the stock lead I have right now. So now you see jockeying for position. Meg D trying to use these dash in side lights on the sword to cover so much area. It'll cover a number of different dodge options from Impala, but Impala so far has been managing to choose the correct one every time, just going up back or up through. Exactly, just that, like, that good patience. Going for a near mix up that time, trying to get him to jump away for that recovery read, but side light, D light, Sare, won't be enough. It's a little bit too early for that, but the damage is not being applied, oh and there gosh. you go. We talked about the slide cancel so text. He loves going for all the time. That time going for it on the D-Sync to get the stock. Yeah, that was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, you were looking for much more of that signature throughout this set, and he's been bringing it out at those choice times where you've already kind of forgotten about it. It's yep. left the back of your mind, and then bam, there it is in the front of your face. I think that's what's so scary about him. And look at this. That's why I said before, I wouldn't feel that comfortable with that lead if I'm Meg D, because Impala brought it back last time, and in, it just right on cue, we're looking at an even game once again. But this time, it's Meg D on his elimination stock. See Impala moving around those platforms, trying to avoid the grounded game of Katars so that we can employ some of those quick aerials from the bow. Begdi just trying to touch the ground, just to touch that platform at all. Uh, but it has been a bit of a struggle as Begdi just keeps getting caught. And oh that's going to be my it. Gosh. A 3 0, -oh, essentially a dominant victory at the end. I know it wasn't a zero to KO, but it felt like one because of the way that Impala just refused to let him touch the ground. That was a big difference maker, of course, at least in that stock. But even without getting it there, it didn't matter because Impala just understands Meg D. And that, mm. by the way, moves that to a lifetime set count of 5 0 -oh over someone like oh Meg gosh. D. That is not easy to say. I got to tell you, that, that last stock here, Impala's aerial movement, his dash jump, fast falls, flip it around, it was looking exactly reminiscent of his BCX run. I heavily agree with that. Uh, I, I mean, you think back to, I, I think back specifically to the matchup against Godly, right? Yep. Where Godly has by far and away the best hover movement over anyone. Yes. When you are right, uh, when you are in a position in center stage and you see Godly kind of jumping around you and you go, oh, nothing I do can hit him. That's because his baits and his movements are so good. Somehow Impala saw through that and got it done. And I, for one, I really can't wait to see those two fight each other again. But, um, Ooh. but in Ooh. general, that last one there, that reminded me a lot of that too, because Meg D yeah. spent no time actually playing the game. He was playing a run simulator and the boss was Impala. Yeah, yeah, he kicked it right back into that same gear that we, you know, you can't play at that level all the time. You've got to use it as that mix up, but man, just bringing it out right there, a thing of beauty. It really was. And I am just, uh, I that made me feel a lot more comfortable for Impala getting maybe back into the final four. That being Ooh. said, interestingly, up next, what or well not up next, there's a different matchup next, but the next opponent that Impala has is Luna. 
and that is to get oh. into top four only. And you think back to BCX, it wasn't just Godly who had the freight train of Impala come through, yep. it was also Luna. Yep. Completely tripping us all up. I still can't believe this man looked at me in the eyes in the post game interview and said, Yeah, I was never worried. I still can't believe that, by the way. So That's, nonchalant. It just doesn't make sense to me that that was what was said to me, but it was still a phenomenal event. Absurd. And uh, I, I, I loved it. Um, yeah. It, it, welcome to Winter Champs, I guess. <laughs> I know, I know. But now the question stands of who else is going to burn their way through this lower bracket? Because now we're looking at anime versus Fakey. I formerly known as anime fan. Yes. He has been absorbed by that which he loves and is only stronger for it. He is just anime and that means you have at least like 970 episodes to catch up to the anime arc throughout Brawlhalla history. Impossible. Uh, but no, you can't. I am on One Piece and I am about <laughs> 380 episodes in. I'm making the trip. Oh. We're making it. All right. I finally committed and I love this show. All but, right. Uh, all right. That is my captain. But right now, aside from that, uh, and everybody call me a weeb in chat right now, uh, we have, <laughs> of course, that matchup coming up here and the Diamond Head coming out, like we said before. The Katars is basically when uh, it's kind of, kind of been like the main thing that it was looking at. And it uh, looks like actually a lot of people oh. are leaning in towards anime here. Uh, Fakey looked really good earlier, too, but anime was the one who almost put Sandstorm into a limbs as well. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, if you were watching that secondary stream on Pro Brawlhalla, you could see anime had a 3-1 over experience. But Fakey just knocked out Boomy in similar fashion. The Boomy believer Boomy believers are in shambles. I'm sorry, we are down, we are down bad. But um mm. that being said, uh Boomy himself also saying like he's gonna put a lot more time into it, get more practice. Yep, yep. But that doesn't matter because the L was still held. It was from Fakey and Fakey won this Hugin pretty much the only one we've seen uh, at the moment. Uh -huh. And one of the few Scythe Legends that we still see here in top eight outside of if we see, you know, Luna, Luna take a trip over to the Mordex. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But man, this is crazy. The two players punching so far above their weight, having to clash here in losers round one. Oh, big facts on eight. that. I'm glad you re brought that up. This is, by the way, top eight. Remember, top eight. When I say these two numbers, anime PR number 25 versus Fakey PR number 34. Uh, so both of them are going to get a nice boost to those numbers from the results of this event. Oh yeah, oh by far. And Fakey with an absolutely dominant first stock, 20 seconds in, knocking out anime. That's exactly what Fakey needed earlier today too. I can't remember who it was that Fakey was fighting. That was, I need to take a look back here in a second. But um, once, once Fakey got off the bow and switched over to the scythe after a pretty poor game one, it was against Radish. Started bringing it back heavy against Radish and looked phenomenal. Radish, of course, oh. figured it out. But Anime Fan, very similar to what we said earlier, his aggressive plays have been nuts. I think this is the makings of what could be like an eight minute set in total between these two. Yeah, I mean, this is gonna be absolutely crazy. I love the dodge reads that anime has just because it's like the, the neutral light, you're usually expecting the recovery. You were talking about him sliding that neutral signature. We've already seen that several times. And then even just an anti-air down light, he gets those confirms. He wants to bait out the dodge so the next down light confirms into the recovery. Yeah, you see right there. And also he's constantly pressuring at the ledge with that option as well, where you just, you think you're gonna be fine, especially on the island, you have to hover low. And then all of a sudden he just goes out there, covers your jump. Not even just with the neutral stick, but recovery too. Uh, but this is incredibly close at the moment. Does he get the recovery read? Ooh. Yes, he does. Goes straight for it. And that's gonna give him the lead. Yeah, he is trucking right now. This game is moving so incredibly fast. Uh, stock is falling like every 30 seconds. I said, yeah, no, the, the, the market is crashing with these two at the moment, but anime stocks are rising as he's currently in the lead, but that might be a borrow time thing. Uh, the theme of this weekend is D-Sig, and I wouldn't be surprised to see that come out pretty soon from Fakie as well. I actually thought it might be there as a whiff punish option, but Neutral Sig as well is something he used earlier a lot on Scythe as a big anti-air tool. That's a really good check to seeing those Katars constantly jump in. Ooh, manages to hook him with the long range of the down light. But Fakey tossing away his scythe. Is he going to go for that other weapon? Yes. The bow just in time to score a neutral aid anti. -air. Let's see if he can finish his food at the moment. Uh, currently, anime is just not letting him have it. Uh, that's going to close it out, though. Good string right into the D light neutral, uh, neutral air. Excuse me, neutral light. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> no. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, closing it out there. And uh, this is an incredibly close first game. Like I said, I know these, this one is probably going to be a very fast paced one, but it's still incredibly even. Yeah, I mean, they've brought it down. Final stocks. The way that anime has been playing, how many signatures he can land, the dodge reads that he's been getting on his guitars, 
any amount of damage isn't really that far off, especially when Fakey lands those three-piece bow strings. He can rocket his damage in return. Yeah, big time. Fakey was uh, starting to pick it up a lot there with the bow. But um, one of the things that started off this game was Fakey essentially speed running a first stock, and that was with the scythe. So the scythe is in play. That's a lot Ooh. of options covered. Just misses the recovery though to get some more damage. Oh, catches the landing with that side signature. Very good for high priority because, you know, he actually tosses the guitar out there. He doesn't have to move forward. He's not really putting himself in risk. He's just like, I'm a, I'm a poke. I got some The dangerous for that. fear of dealing with him. Like, you just think that you're safe at these ranges. And then right here, already committed. Dodge was burned. Oh. Knew as soon as he saw the dodge burn. Oh, free punish. Get on out of here. And I'm going to take game one. Yeah, that was absolutely crazy. So now we have a shift up on the map. You were talking about the short walls of Demon Island playing into their matchup. How is Small Fortress of Lions going to So, uh, interestingly enough, this is actually the exact stage that Fakie counterpicked to game two against Radish. So this seems to be, oh. a, this seems to be uh, a definite favorite. That said, though, Anime Fan also ended up here a couple times against Sandstorm. So it's going to be pretty common. But I think the thing is is that he wants those wall volleys with Scythe. I think he loves having ah, yes. that extra space with Scythe on the sides, and that's a big part of why I think Fakie decided to come here. Yeah, that is a lot of Scythe players' uh, favorite thing. You know, Fakie, he was trying to land so many of those in past sets. Uh, just from what I was watching today, where he had to go for multiple down airs. People yep. were able to dodge out before the ground pound, before the second down air. So, yeah, he definitely wants more of those clips. Yeah, and also just having access to that soft platform to try and get away from the Qatars at 80 points. That being said, if you make a mistake and you decide to hover and jump towards it at the wrong time, you're taking a neutral stick from Qatars. So far, it's been the gauntlet plate. There's that wall volley right mm. there. Is he going to close it out? No, just missed the side cancel. Oh, doesn't matter who goes out there and gets him anyways. That was close to disaster for Fakie, but he was able to come out on top. Well, you know, if I'm going to trust anybody off stage, it's going to be the bird. True. And that's where that sentence ends. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's I mean, it. what, what else it. you can say? Yes, we, we see. The we bird the is the fact. word, chat. Just so you know, the bird, the, the confirmed, the bird is the word. Uh, the bird just saw, gets uh, got set flying, uh, Chief. Uh, he's out of there. It was season to migrate, you know, mm. and then come back around, fresh stock. Can we go get that bird in, in deep fry? I'm very hungry. You, what, what? <laughs> Anyways, All so right, that's <laughs> what anime's looking for. He wants to deep fry this bird right now. So we got game number two here, of course, with anime, like we said, playing so well up to this point. And uh, the thing is, I don't see anime going for those same mix-ups yet. He's kind of just been straight up going for neutral sig, like right there. Yep. But uh, he hasn't gone for that sly cancel play that I was so impressed by earlier. I get the feeling. And all right, <laughs> all right, you. ask and ye <laughs> shall receive. Thank you so much for proving my point as he goes ahead and closes it out on the left side with the gauntlets instead. But I, if you could just feel that it was coming and he was conditioning it, he finally let it go. Man, neutral light into recovery, just getting all that extra credit damage and just continuing, continuing to juggle Fakey. It's like every time that Fakey's trying to get in, there's a neutral air waiting for him. Wait a minute. Oh, no. Lots of damage, lots of stage control coming out. That scythe recovery sending anime wide. Yeah, so we were mentioning before, the, the scythe plays from Fakey have really just been that clutch factor. Like, you're, you're about to get scythe. It's going to happen. You can't get away from it. But the bow's picked up a ton, too. Uh, going to get the stair, push him back on stage. But we're approaching that D-Light recovery range. Actually, we're pretty much at it now. Doesn't even need it, though. Just gets Whoa. their straight up read and gets the recovery to even up the game. All right. Once again, we find ourselves final stop. This is... This is I am so impressed by watching these two. Like, at first I was saying this is going to be a super fast-paced match, and it still is pretty fast-paced overall, but the fact that they're boxing back oh. and forth like that, one of them received the hands, though, and he wasn't happy about it. It is now Anime going up 2-0 in the lead to try and get that matchup. Oh, I was actually wrong on the side that uh, what I talked about before. It would actually be this match going into Luna. The other half of it is the oh. rematch of Sandstorm and Impala. Oh. Oh. Oh, we get that, too. That's crazy. That's, a, hey, yo, that's crazy. Yo, two times in one day I get to talk about CS Summer Impala? That's, that's fire. I love production. And I love these games. <laughs> and right now we have anime up 2-0 in the lead. What is your view? Because uh, to be honest, they've been so close that Fakie's just barely missing some of these games. What yeah. do you think Fakie needs to do in this next game to try and uh, like avoid getting knocked out? I think it's, it's usually towards the tail end of the games. Fakie ends up playing a lot more aerial of a game plan, and that's where anime really excels. He's catching landings, he's catching 
you know, anytime that you're looking to jump, he's got great anti-air recognition for his neutral lights, his down lights on Qatar, and that signature, that neutral signature does so much damage. Yeah, well, I, that's actually, that's... Don't again, forget, Diamond Head is a high-strength legend. Yes, and again, also, speaking of that, we are here on, we are oh here on Squall Brawl Haven. We decided to box. Oh, my um, gosh. And I agree with you so heavy because at the very beginning of the set, I talked about and complimented how Fakie was so on point with those Scythe neutral sigs as an anti-air option. I don't think I've seen it once in the set so far. And it might need to be the option that comes out, maybe. Like, any bag of tricks you got, pull it out now. Mm, yep, yep. So Fakie has the damage lead here, but, man, I am so nervous. Anytime people take a high-strength legend and try to fight against it on small Brawlhaven, I'm like, man, that usually doesn't work out the way you want. But Fakie, that down signature, starting to use that character-specific kit, is this going to be the turnaround? Anything you could do to cover both sides of the aisle. When you see a, when you see Diamond Head approaching you, you know most likely he's going to cross you up at some point. And having something like that, or the stop the aggressive play, will work well. This is not the biggest lead, but at least Fakie looking pretty good. The recovery, not enough just yet. You probably don't get another chance at that, though. Ooh. Managing to catch Ooh. Anime's landings now. Snipes him off. There's the sweat drops. Oh, wow. Anime saved his dodge for the very end to be able to get up and over. Yeah, that was good on Fakie, too, to not just kind of rush right in at that weapon because Anime just covering him with the side stick. And speaking mm. of, going to go ahead and get it right there. Uh, did take a lot of damage, but again, it's Small oh, wow. Brawl Haven. Yeah, it, it can don't turn need around. that much. <laughs> it just needs, like, uh, you know, just a couple dodge reads, and you're out of here. And speaking of trying to get him out of here, he finally made an attempt at it. Whiffed it, but finally made an attempt at it. And that, at least at most, gives a bit of a gut check to anime fan to be careful about how he approaches. That recovery catches him. I have to use a couple resources. Gets to the wall, Beautiful. but because he had to go down, he already burned the uh, jumps above him. That recovery read was perfect to line that up. Yeah, absolutely phenomenal. And now he's got just about a full stock to work with. Can he keep so, that is the big question. Uh, mm -hmm. Anime fan has been an absolute menace to him so far to try and keep any leads. Anime fan getting with side lights, neutral, uh, neutral lights into the attempt on the neutral sig just to build that damage up. But he is uh, looking much more confident as he approaches. Recovery actually will just mm. do it. And we have, yep. it is essentially an even game. I know, we're right back in it. So did Fakie build himself enough runway for the takeoff or is he going to crash and burn? He's going to need to make sure that he gets in the air and starts flying away with this victory pretty soon because at the moment, it is not the most comfortable position. Gets in with the side light, trying to build some more. Neutral light into attempted stare. Doesn't find its mark, but they are just kind of trading off back and forth at the moment. Yeah, and I mean, right now, Fakie had enough of a damage lead that this is working out in his favor. He's ready to score the knockout. Anime still needs a couple more taps to be in that range. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> He's trying to go for the biggest tap, the biggest bark on the head he could find. And here he goes again, going off stage, but he gets reversed. Here comes Fakie trying to go out there, get the snatch. No, he again, does not. Anime saving his dodge as the last recovery option. So smart. Oh my god, it almost gets a call on the recovery as well. We've got a very close game right now. Anime looking to potentially get a 3-0. Fakie trying to keep it, it, it still alive. It's anybody's period. game right now. One recovery from Gauntlets possibly seals it, but he got caught. Again, makes his way up and over. Fakie trying to catch the landing. Uh-oh, hard side light going to knock him off, but not out. The recovery, Ooh. not yet enough. They hit too deep. A little bit too low on the stage. Unarmed currently is Fakie. Going to get in and uh, get access to the bow. Going all the way off stage. Trying to get to oh reversal Sarah, but that gives that gives him a bad spot. Going under there with the recovery. That's not going to be enough just yet. It's incredibly scary right now. They've spent so much time on these final stocks. Neither of them ever find that. There it is. Fakie surviving. Still 2-1 anime's favor in the set. But Fakie. What a clutch finish to if that game you three. you would have told me that the way that that ends was Fakie going all the way to the bottom of the stage to get an unarmed recovery Ooh. knockout with how chaotic that last stock mm -mm. was, mm -mm. I would have absolutely not been a betting man on that case. No, no, but no. But instead, he bet it all on that play, decided to go underneath. Here we go. Weapon toss away, forces him to go low. There's the recovery. Has to jump up, and he stays right next to the wall. Had barely anywhere he could go. Fakie knew the distance would be close wow. enough, and it got the job done. And we are not done yet. We still oh, have no. another, at least at minimum, one more game. That's right. Fakey, can he continue that momentum and turn this round into a reverse 3-0? Possible. Or is anime just going to say, we're going on hiatus? Look at those weapon numbers, too. A lot of people so far today, we've seen a lot of, like, one weapon legend type play from people yep. uh, throughout each individual match. There's only a few who have been able to kind of cycle between both. I think I'd probably put that towards, like, Luna and Sandstorm, the most who've been able to cycle yep. between both. Fakey, but definitely one who had similar damage numbers between both weapons, whereas anime... 
heavily favoring those Qatars. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of been the theme for them all day, too. And yep. Angel saying, I know we said it a bunch yesterday, and it keeps being said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you, if it's working for you, keep it going until somebody proves that it won't. Oh, yeah. And uh, anime fan has been making, or anime has been making that work tremendously. But uh, Fakey was able to at least finally clutch a play out. I'm curious to see what they're gonna ban out to. Oh, uh, I think I, I, Small Brawl Haven was banned. Yeah, like, no, that, that was gone immediately. It's like, ah, uh, no, 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 no. That was too close. I'm not letting you have that. Uh, I believe I saw Demon Island. If I uh, remember correctly, that's what they committed We're to. We're going to find out. Those short walls yes. coming back into play. It's returned to Three, Demon Island. Two. All right, small walls, like you said, uh, which does slightly benefit Anime Fan in terms of being able to get those. Uh, that basically, just constantly throw out DCs at the ledge to make you fear the idea of jumping over and then cover you. But that also opens up some really potential big plays for Scythe to pop off. That's the thing. We've we've kind of gone from like one style of volatile map to the other. Yeah. You know, <laughs> small brawl even. It's like okay, it's so small for the knockout zones, it's gonna be volatile because people get knocked out early. Here, the walls are so short, and we have four of the best weapons at the game in edge guard potential. Yep. It's bow and scythe versus gauntlets and guitars. Nobody wants to try and make their way through an edge guard against such short walls. Here starts the beginning of one as Fakey Clean. finishes it. All he needed was one good call, and that got the job done. Very similar, actually very reminiscent to that first knock that he got to start off the set. Yeah, oh yeah. So back at it has to be feeling pretty good, especially having the momentum going into this game. That immediate, immediately tied up. Back. It, that this, it, these two are as even skilled as you can ask for right now, even with the fact that, sure, nobody had them the predictions to make it this far in terms of what they've done, but Winters just brings out the best in everyone, and they, I am I'm just loving watching I mean, is, I, honestly, oh, a little yeah. bit bias-wise, I, I kind of want a game five. <laughs> this has been so close. Oh, me too. I mean, this is absolutely phenomenal. You can really tell who's been in the grind on the offseason. These two were definitely hungry following the world championship. I mean, they've taken out incredibly high-skilled players to get here today. Ooh, and that was a huge whiff punish right there on the dare. As soon as he saw that he decided to commit to the dare, said, go. oh, that is a free whiff punish. Let me drag you right down. As long as I send you far enough away, there's a high likelihood you're not making this back. And fa Fakey, uh, holding a lead, granted, hasn't really been able to keep it very long after they get it. Yeah, so it, last game, he managed to build himself quite a bit of a runway, almost a full stock, and that went down to last stock red in one of the craziest knockdown dragout matches ever. And here, is that going to be enough? I don't know. He's got less of extra credit on anime now, and he's about to get knocked out by that down signature from Diamond Head. What a punish on that cross up. He knew he would jump over and whip and just get that. And that's two times in a row where anime fan minimized the damage going into this last stock. And speaking of that, again, we are on last stock situation. Anime fan getting the stare, moving right in, trying to go for sidelight. Doesn't really get anything started out of that, but here we are essentially even the game again already. Here we go, looking for the landing. Wow, a clash on the down light and the side light. I've seen quite a few of those, actually. I've seen stuff recoveries and clashes in center stage multiple times because they're both pulling the trigger at the same Whoa! time. And what an amazing what? call right there from Fakey. That is the first time we've seen that play Insane. at all from Fakey. And if you, we said it before, if you're going to pull out the last bag of tricks, you need to pull it out when you're facing elimination. Do not save it at all. And that sends, uh, that sends us to game number five. Yeah, that was absolutely crazy. Just reads for the... The high recovery sends him up there, and then the gravity cancel neutral signature as high as possible without spending extra jumps. That was literally like max distance on it, too. Just catching him as he went over the top of it, perfectly spaced by Fakie. You couldn't have asked for better. And like you said before, there's no shot we were going to see Small Brawl Haven for the rest of this set after <laughs> that last one. We have run it back, and the final destination for these two is going to be Demon Island. All right, Demon Island it is for that game five that you wanted. I, I, I needed it at this point. It's been <laughs> such a good set up to this point. And this is from Fakey. We mentioned before, you can't count Fakey out just yet, regardless oh, no. of the fact that Anime, fa uh, anime was playing so good. He's on so a two-game run right now. This you definitely can't count him out. We're looking at what will be maybe a reverse 3-0, and the winner of this has the uh, absolute honor of fighting Luna in the uh, just the limbs quarters, just to make it in the top four. 
Man, oh man, winter championship, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it happens every single year. <laughs> right now, uh, weapon advantage slightly in favor. Mm. I'm glad that I didn't finish that sentence. Oh, <laughs> oh all right. I was going to say it was a uh, favor of Fakie, because Fakie's been really good at kind of closing out the Qatars in the last few games, but the Qatars instead find that recovery to get the first one. Yeah, so the games that Anime won were really off the backs of any of those great confirms, you know, the neutral light into, hey, which way are you going to dodge? And then I get either a neutral, another neutral light, a down light, just so that way I can convert into the recovery guarantee. Now there's a recovery that's going to go ahead and find the mark, and now we're at two stocks apiece. Uh, I, I think everybody uh, in chat and me and you could just accept the fact that this is probably going last stock, last hit again. Just I would be surprised yeah. if it didn't at I, this I, point. I would, um, I would be mind blown if that didn't happen. But Fakey making an attempt at maybe trying to do that, had to back off, though. Didn't really have too much he could get after that side light. Yeah, smart. We've seen uh, a lot of things go the way of disaster. If you get a yep. little bit too greedy one time. I think back to Anime Fan options. in that last game where oh, he decided no. to go for that dare. Uh, where, uh, granted, if it hit, it looked like a genius, but he and ended up losing his stock for it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you really don't have that to spend at this point in the game. And good evasive dish just hovering right underneath that ledge. Not going to get caught by any of the spacing at the moment from Anime Fan, but Anime Fan, I feel like he's just trying to condition him to think that he's okay with that, and he's going to just punish him heavy with a jump over. Mm. Neutral Stick doesn't even need it, though. It said the jump over punish was, in fact, the recovery in Anime, moving himself up in the lead, probably borrow time, but he's holding a lead. Yeah, because we've seen Fakie take some incredibly early stocks in the last game and a half. Yeah, and on the heels of the bow as well, too. Finding the mark, Delight into neutral. No, he wants it again. He, 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 oh, facts. That it, neutral signature oh! was weighing heavy in everybody's mind. Well, I like the attempt at it, too. Again, another play he hasn't really gone for. Offside is a stage, but Anime is getting some more damage in. Not too much, though, actually. It looked like Anime kind of second-guessing, trying to continue anything over on the side. Fakie trying to find some stable ground to get a game plan started, but Anime just keeps hitting him off with these neutral airs. He's getting a lot of mileage out of this stock at the moment and trying to go for side cancel. Neutral Shake gets back on the recovery and look at that damage now applied on Fakie. This is starting to starting to creep a little bit out of, I won't say doable distance, but it's going to be a very difficult last stock. Yeah, I mean, we're, we are nearing that point where any little hit is just going to take Fakie out of here, especially on the edge. So he needs to play an absolutely flawless stock going forward. Exactly, and he uh, co committed very well on that, did not back off, made sure that the pressure or the fear of a ground pound was there so he couldn't get up uh -oh. to the ledge and immediately closed out as he gets over to the gauntlets and Anime prevents what was almost an immaculate 3-0, shuts it down and moves himself in to the Elim quarters, guaranteed fifth place and possibly even more upsets along the way as he has to go up against Luna next. Yeah, so that down signature, Anime was using a lot in that second stock there. I was wondering what the payoff of that conditioning was going to be. And here with the dash forward side signature, it's like I'm on the gauntlets. I've been wanting to keep distance this whole time. Down yes. sig, down sig. And then right when he needed it the most, that's when you unleash the side sig. And something to make note of, too, speaking of the signatures, I mean, even though there was 12 that were sent out, only 17% hit amongst that from Diamond mm. Head. Doesn't matter because it's a spacing tool. It's it makes people get scared. Uh, exactly, especially on the Legend Demon Island. But when it came to Fakie, yep. Fakie made an attempt at three and none hit. The previous games, they were lining up. I mean, we saw that closeout of that incredible GC neutral sig that closed the game in that previous set. Yeah. But second guessed a lot of the options to try and go for that, and therefore you were left only with Scythe. Scythe was kind of shut down that game where Scythe was the way yeah. to beat the Qatars before. The anime fan, anime, 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 picked it up <laughs> at the right time to get the dub. Yeah, I mean, that was just absolutely phenomenal. You could tell that Fakie was kind of rocked on his heels in that final stock. He, he was trying to just get back up on stage, trying to find somewhere that he could actually mount an offense and... Anime just kept pushing him back, pushing him back. He left the crowd speechless. Like, everybody was just like, you saw that, like, the chairs just had nothing to say. Like, it was chair stream time, everybody. But um, wow. still, uh, wow, wow, good channel. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that kind of uh, sets the stage <laughs> for what we have in our top six players. Yes, a rematch oh from earlier gosh. today. Literally the very first match Run. of the day here in Winter Championships was the Sandstorm and Paula match oh earlier. And I am super looking forward to seeing that because that one went down to the wire. Yep. Sandstorm, after he was done with that set, literally came out and tweeted D-Sig because that's exactly what it was. It was a battle mm -hmm. of D-Sig between both of them. But oh, yeah. 
the Arcadia kit is just so good at kind of checking the distance of Kaya yep. and make sure there's no burst that she could get. She's got that trap tool. You know, I'm going to cover the ground so that way you got to... You need to take to the air. You need those dash jumps. Touch if that you mist. want to be able to deal with this. Go in. And honestly, I would probably have ran into it enough corner. few times. I'm not going to lie. I definitely would go in. That being said, though, uh, he has definitely been uh, bringing up how incredibly hype it, or actually how strong he thinks Greatsword is right now. But we're going to see ah. exactly how strong anime was in that previous set because we're going to get it broken down by the one and only animus analyst himself. Remy. Let's go. Anime and Faker, both names that you know, but you did not expect to see here, but they did make it to the top eight, and Anime is the one that's gonna push forward to that top five. I wanna look exactly at how he used that Caspian kit. We all know and hate and love, but mostly hate, to see how those signatures played into his gameplay. We saw a lot come out, and if they pick Caspian, you're gonna see a lot of signatures here. Let's start with this clip right here, and right right off the bat, we just saw this coming. The n -sig dash, the dash forward and it's going to catch the dodge to the left. We saw it the entire time. We also saw some adaptation from Fakey. We saw later on through the set he used to maneuver behind Anime Fan to get that swift side light punish on the boat. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But Anime Fan kept doing this the entire time. It got a lot of value off sometimes, sometimes it didn't. But like I said, it was always more than one signature. You saw the side stick come out, it got punished. He didn't stop it there. He kept the guitars in hand. Side light goes for the N-Sig again. He was used to a side sig again. Then he gets the double down light into the recovery. It's that signature play that you interwine into your lie attacks consistently, consistently, making your opponent think, okay, everyone has six lie attacks. When you're throwing out Caspian Sigs like this, all of a sudden this guy has 12. So you always have to play around it. Anime did a really good job of keeping Fakie on his toes due to the signature kit. Right again, we're gonna see that end come out. And like I said, he went behind him, went for the punish. And he comes back on the ground and says, okay, I have other signatures. The down stick comes out this time, doesn't get punished. And because of that, he gets the swift punish on the backtrack of that, the side light, end light into the recovery, gets that KO off. Uh, just really amazing stuff with the signatures here. This one is one of my favorite cli uh, clips we have. Goes for the end stick again, gets it this time. Like I said, it's a mix up. He's gonna do it a lot of times. This time, switches the gauntlets. Hadn't used it yet, brought out the sides to get the uh, turnaround on that. Beautiful KO on the back side of things. This one right here, he picks up the gauntlets, goes for the side light, doesn't get it, catches that dodge and gets the recovery this time. And this right here is beautiful, the conditioning. The SIG is coming out, he has that angle, he knows how it works. Fakey is actually safe from it, he's not looking at that direction, but it's just reaction. You're going to dodge when you see a SIG getting charged up. He makes the wrong decision. He doesn't dodge into the signature, sure, but his dodge is gone. That's his aerial dodge. The side light comes out, catches him on that landing, hits it beautifully. Recovery is going to take him off the top. Beautiful signature uses just to bait out options, not even to connect with the signature, just free pressure. Options taken away right here again. I love this signature uses right here. Uh, you're going to see it. He actually weapon throws. The SIG comes out. It gets interrupted, but he's thinking, okay, I have advantage off of that weapon throw. I have time. You don't have time. You actually just knocked me out my recovery frames. I'm going to come in with that swift recovery. I'm going to take you off the top. It's really beautiful stuff from anime. He was playing really well the entire set. Fakey had his moments of glory. He had those big strings, those scythe plays. He looked good, but anime just looked better. Side stick closed off that set. He was doing a beautiful job using those signatures. Caspian, you hate him, you love him. You just saw him go on to top five. Really good stuff out of him today. I'm going to send back to the captain. All right, thank you for breaking down that signature usage from anime, that character-specific power that he's got in Diamond Head. Exactly. And also, you know, we look at this top eight here today. After what we saw with EU and company and also in South America, we saw Tezka show up, show up strong in a couple positions. But there is no boots here in ah. top eight in North America. It is the, the bows, the guitars, the spears, essentially, that are kind of running the show over here. And it's it's uh, for one A, it shows that. Maybe some more people need to put a little bit more time into it to get it done. It's but very new. Yeah, it's it very is very, new. very new. Also, kudos to that incredible play from Machete to get that W oh, uh, yeah. with them. So, a uh, very different look, but it's a look that we're used to seeing, and a look that we want to take a look at is the viewer vote, which is right here, Ooh. right there. Boom. Okay. Underneath. Oh, it's so, they're going the right a little bit way. of a but past history on this one, because these two fought. This is also uh, earlier today. Yeah, this is also their their pick to win the whole thing. Uh, hey, when they were doing uh, chat predictions earlier, Sandstorm was on top. I think yeah. it was Luna in second, and I believe Stingray or Radish was third. Uh, so, and they were pretty good on that game. I'm just yeah. saying. Oh yeah. Oh, Boomy, Boomy was third. Shout out to Boomy believers. Uh, Unfortunately, yes. we are down in the dumps right now. But I personally uh, didn't actually pick Boomy today, only because I knew that 
put in as much time as everyone else. But that, but it's uh, okay. It's gonna it's gonna come back. Uh, this, right. however, though, I the was feeling back. very confident in uh, the fact that Sansor might do well today because he did say he's putting a lot of time and he beat yes. the BCX champ. But again, I said it earlier: BCX champ versus T H E E the mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. champ, mm -hmm. the goat. Mm -hmm. The king of games of Brawlhalla when it comes to ones, especially oh, yeah. for Sandstorm. But this is now rematch time, and the last one was game five, so it's oh, up in boy. the air, and I think we got a banger in front of us as we get to hot set alert time, the rematch of Sandstorm versus Impala here in the Elim quarters. All right, so Impala on that trademark Kaya. Sandstorm breaking out the Arcadia for this tournament and has been playing it to maximum efficiency. And at that, he's had a lot more time to get the Great Sword warmed up because earlier it was looking good. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> Paula also cooking over here with the spear. I thought he was going to get a little bit more out of that, but it was looking good. And uh, the theme of the day again is D-Sig, and we're going to be seeing a whole lot more of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's going to be a big thing to get out over in this matchup, particularly during edge guards, it is very difficult to contest it from that position. You really just got to pick your spots and hope for the best. Yeah, it's incredible stall too, because you see how he used it a second ago. We were trying to stall, play oh around and wait. Gosh. But Impala striking first and fast to get the first stop. Yeah, and now we're going to see Impala gets to kind of set up. He got the weapon starve. Wow, Sandstorm just knocking him off stage. Not even going to have to think about it. And Sandstorm just looking for one good mistake. There you go. That is a confirm off of that. So you have to be very careful as you play around that, too. And the neutral mm. stick. He actually didn't use that that much in that previous set. I think I saw it maybe collect the total of one time. So here comes the late game conditioning. Yeah, that's where it becomes really interesting because that neutral signature, you know, you can just tap it and it's just that nice stab straight up. But if you charge it, she will actually take flight and go up into the air with it. Yeah, neutral stick that would make Jala proud. And uh, that is uh, <laughs> definitely an option that you might want to use more often because Impala has been pretty oh. comfortable with jumping over. But here we go. Here's the fear of the potential side stick at the ledge as well. See Impala doing that side light chase dodge and then read for reactions. This is game one, so you're going to use it for a lot of information gathering. Exactly, and uh, this is speaking of information that has been gathered. Sandstorm picked up quite a bit of it from that first stock. Uh, gonna get over to the spear, so now we're gonna get into decent gameplay oh, again. Yeah. Is, uh, oh, that was pretty close to not being that, as Nutrisig just barely misses. That is the payoff for the information. Hey, I sidelined you before and you ended up taking to the skies. Well, the neutral signature is the perfect option there. This is, I, I know we're in game one already, but I feel like this has the makings of what could be a classic set. These are, this is incredibly close. Beautiful we see the punish. That is three neutral areas in a row, but like you said earlier, that Apocalypse high blast on, oh. and it catches him riding right through, collision course, and he gets the stock lead. That is a very borrowed time life <laughs> that he has right now, but uh, let's see if, how much he can get out of it. All right, a little bit of extra credit, those neutral lights. Oh, again, perfect punish against that down signature. And he's out of here. Final stock. This is just game one you were talking about. Yeah, we're going to go with the distance. I, I, I hope we do. <laughs> I feel like we deserve it as fans of oh, how they've been playing. And uh, oh, it, oh, oh, my, my goodness. My. Impala then trying to catch the panic jump out, too, with the recovery. But now it's Sandstorm's turn. Trying to go over. Doesn't get the pogo to get anything started. But the Neutralite's finding the mark. Neutralite's into Weapon Toss follow-ups have been so on the money for Sandstorm against Impala. Yeah, just that little bit of extra damage, but more so the mental damage that it does. Just kind of setting you on your heels. And he just lined up at, uh, an edge tarp with that, too. He pushed him right off stage, trying to get to neutralites again. This is an incredibly close to last stock here. Already misses on the D-Sig. Not really a big punish from Impala. Looking for a potential recovery, maybe. No, just kind of giving him that respect and letting him land. Yeah, he's going to be looking for some sort of big purchase. You know, that neutral signature, the side signature, the down signature right at the end. That's twice in this game. And you see it too, as soon as Sandstorm slightly hovered over to the left, oh, you misspaced the wall just by that much. You mm -hmm. think that you, you you outspaced me? Oh, you're peeking? Nope. <laughs> Caught you peeking over the ledge. Now you're looking rather foolish. And that is, again, he's he just doesn't leave anything on the table. Here we go. Covers over, that burn, was catch the burn dodge. Actually, that just that quick string in and of itself was clean. But he's gonna so hover over. Down underneath, and he oh. was he was too far away. I think he second guessed the idea that if he dropped, he might not be able to get safely down to the wall touch. It might take yep. a ground pound or have to worry about another attempt at that. And every once in a while, people make a mistake, and Impala is not one to do that in front of. Yeah, I mean, he is going to capitalize on every single one. 
I just realized Apollo was three for three on signatures as well. Those two D sigs leading to KOs, and uh, he's uh, just been on the money. There was only one of them that barely missed the KO as well. That neutral sig on the left side of the stage before. So uh, Impala is being very reserved rather than going for the side cancel happy plays that we saw from BCX. Yeah, that's a that's a big thing, and Impala's definitely been controlling the neutral game here. He's been get oh maximum charge on the chainsaw, and wouldn't you know, you're that far off stage. It's not like you're hitting it on stage. That's right at the corner. You're getting Maximum out. overdrive, and he <laughs> had to deal with all of that. And his mix-ups at the ledge have been so good because the fact that he held that, he got him on the spacing before with the D-Sig, yep. and it just feels like Impala's ledge play is just that much stronger, which is crazy considering how good Sandstorm's ledge play has been all day. Oh, yeah. Impala's just been getting him with the, the spacing on the D-Sig when he's got the bow, the timing on the D-Sig when he's got the spear. I do like the fact that Sandstorm wasted no time as well, uh, getting out there to go for the Great Sword Toss. Uh, a little bit of a mistake on uh, the weapon Starve, so he was able to get back in with the Spear, but it doesn't matter. Uh, this is, in, again, even game. I don't... Oh, I just realized. Sandstorm was incredibly good earlier getting a lot of D-Light anti -ears. That's something that me and yes. Toss were complimenting. I don't think I've seen a single one so far. Yeah, he's been wanting to just kind of play that grounded game. He's been mostly consisting of the neutral lights and the down signatures. Mm -hmm. He's con co covering so much of that grounded space, and that is something that gave Impala a little bit of trouble in his previous set, where he was trying to use that bow down light, and it always got covered by a grounded threat. Yeah, and that's actually another option. Uh, I mean, that one is off of the confirmed, so he could get the recovery, but uh, Sandstorm was using a lot of jump over dares, just as a quick poke oh. with Greatsword earlier, and he's kind of been reserved on that more, but the Sarah will be able to take it out here, tries to catch it with the D stick at the ledge, nothing really comes of it. Neutral Lights maybe to get the poke, but he just misses even as the two Whoa. go through, but the Sarah actually still not enough. Yeah, Impala touching the ground with the dive kick, but right into the trap, and Sandstorm pulls the trigger of the side air. Now he's got a very tenuous lead. I think the only other time I can think of from last year that I saw like th this high of a signature count oh, be tossed the out. The side signature? Are you kidding me? He barely ever goes for that. You have to be so like, accurate with it. He, it gets, he's so reserved with them, and he catches them just slipping. Uh, I don't even remember what I was saying before. <laughs> now we have uh, him going for the D-Sigs and trying to build some damage back up, but like, you know, Impala literally never lets him keep a lead for long. Man, down light into neutral light, building that damage, building the lead. Just getting around all of these great sword attacks. He's always at Sandstorm shoulder blades. And Impala trying to send a message too. Remember, a lot of us uh, before today, because of that historical uh, unfavorable stat for people who won BCX moving into winters, usually don't perform very well. Many people didn't think that there'd be a 2P or even a retrip to the uh, podium for Impala. That included chat and us. And Impala trying to say, y'all made a mistake as he currently just barely missed that neutral stick to try and build a lead and he still has a small lead right here. Yeah, you see the movement kicking into that top gear once again. Again, we saw it at the tail end of last set. We're seeing it here on final stock. Here comes Weapon Toss in, trying to get the Nair. Oh, baits him, but he doesn't get the spacing on the side light. That was so good by Impala. But now Impala trying to find a Nair. Uh, I don't know if it'll KO here yet on Apocalypse, but any one of those will absolutely do it. He has to be careful of the D6s at the ledge. You know Sandstorm's thinking about it. That's why he spent that dodge right at the corner. Oh, and Sandstorm, oh, okay, I thought he still had access to the Great Sword. I figured he was going to start looking for Dare recovery pretty soon, but Whoa. instead, Sarah won't be enough. Going to drop off stage. Going to go for another DC, get Ledge Weapon Toss out, and he catches him wow. with the ledge, and he mixed him up. Weapon Toss made it look like he had a gap momentarily, but the swiftness of that pickup into the DSIG definitely tripped up Impala as he came up to the ledge. That's one of the coolest Arcadia-specific things that I've seen in a while, and I'm going to tell you why. Because normally, there's such a long cooldown on like any trap or projectile-style signature where you can't do them back to back. If you press that, you'll just kind of get like a dead input. Nothing's going to happen because, hey, you used that cloud. It dissipated too soon after. So you got to wait like a full second almost. He was able to do that because they are separate attacks. The down yes. on the spear and the down stick on, stick on the great sword are different attacks. So he did it on the spear and then picked up the great sword, was able to do it so much faster than you can in any other situation. And you only get that when the weapon drop is right on top of you. It was literally, that's protagonist privilege, bro. That's all I'm gonna say. Like plot so armor couldn't have been better for him in that moment. And the swiftness for Sandstorm to recognize that as soon as it showed up, and go for that mix-up. And that prevented what was about to be a 2-0 lead for Impala. Yeah, that is just absolutely insane situational awareness. 
And like, yo, you don't get to this point of winning. Oh, oh. without plays like this as well. Is he gonna be able to go out there and close it out? Sweat beats come through and Paulo going for the high recovery to get around it. Does it take too much after that? But that was still an incredibly good push there from Sandstorm to start off game three. Oh, Impala taking some of that neutral light into weapon toss energy. Able to hit Sandstorm with it into I so many unanswered attacks. I love when players start doing that. That, that anything you can do. Oh, it's like it's a neutral stick. It did disarm him. To it. Oh, it did disarm. Actually, good point on that. I, but still, I'm kind of upset that it didn't KO. It looks so <laughs> cool when it lands. But uh, right now, um, they have just been going back and forth. Still no knockout just yet. One good finisher at the ledge. Actually, Sidear probably just does it here on Greatsword. So Apollo has to be careful. Oh, my gosh. And as soon as he saw that dodge burned, checkmate. This is, this is the mix-up, all right? Sandstorm was using those down signatures to such great effect throughout this tournament. Then Impala was punishing them very consistently throughout game one. That's where he took the victory. And now Sandstorm has the rock to that paper where he's using that neutral signature. Hey, you're gonna try and get up over my traps? Well, I'm just gonna cover the skies instead. There cannot be a greater compliment to the growth and strength of how Impala is not only able to get that championship, but also just consistently perform well as what we're seeing here against Sandstorm with prep time. He actually put some time into this beforehand. Oh, yeah. Most people would not be having a good time, but Impala's right there step-by-step step, the entire way with, him, uh, with Sandstorm so far on this set. Now setting up the edge guard, a slight damage lead in Impala's favor. He gets back up on stage, now just trying to jockey for position against Sandstorm. There it is, the juggle doesn't able, not able to catch the landing. With Sandstorm trying to get out there to get that DC against the Sarah, but doesn't find it. However, Pogo comes through his first attempt at it in a while. DC does not find his mark either. Neutralite setting the back off though, oh. and he gets the immediate jump call with the Sarah. Weapon toss down. Is he going to be able to get by just yet? Impala is unarmed, and he's struggling quite a bit to oh. get back on. Man, the damage gap has been completely deleted. That ground pound almost knocking out Sandstorm from center stage. Apollo just trying to close it out here. Go for a near anti-air or air to air option. That Sarah might be enough. That is going to be enough as Impala takes back the lead. But as we said before, these leads are just ever so long because it's it, they keep evening up yep. the last stocks. Like it, it feels like every stock that they take is last stock of the game. They're playing that stressed out as we Ooh. see an anti-air come in and sandstorm takes no damage once again game number three one stock apiece yeah it, it's almost like they're not exactly racing against each other but racing against each other in a three-legged race I feel you like can only get so far in front i feel like at this point it's like nah they're 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 in, they're in like that like the derby they're at the drag race they both lined up and they're both hitting the gas pedal but once one pulls ahead they intentionally kind of pull back as the other one oh. sneaks back in front of them and they keep doing that it's, i'm telling you we're watching an intentional movie they're, they're doing this on purpose so we can have a fun time maximum but, uh, drama i love it <laughs> we have an attempt at the desync but catches oh. him on a stuffed recovery doesn't really get too much else after that though i think honestly because i don't think anybody expected he, that trade-off yeah, sandstorm was not expecting to hit right at the tail end there he was like all right he's over it we need to go on to the next thing Sandstorm back on the great sword. Hasn't really been to get too many uh, combo finishers, but it doesn't matter because he's been finding the D6 anyways. So he's still finding his follow ups into Sair. And uh, he's been pretty on point with finding Dare Recovery as well, which it looks like he's kind of hunting for now. Yeah, just wants the, some strong hit to seal the deal. You see the side air, you see the recoveries. Knocking him off stage, sets up the traps. And Impala, once again, just up and over. Paula has been incredibly calm in those positions. And Paula going for Whoa. it all. That's a big whiff punish, but it won't Whoa. be enough just yet. Does he go for the recovery on the play? Decides to weapon toss down to keep Sandstorm grounded. Uh-oh, neutral air, neutral light. Oh. Through the juggle. Oh, that recovery just missed. Sandstorm trying to catch him at the ledge to get to d -Sync. Just misses out on the punish. Oh he does gosh. not get the KO there either, but one neutral air probably takes it. They're both hunting for the knockout. So incredibly hard here right now. Oh my god, Sandstorm finally makes a mistake, but he still does not go down yet. That one will do it Woo! though, as Impala moves up 2-1 in the set. Finally, one of those takes the gets the job done, but Sandstorm was just barely living on this Apocalypse High Blast on multiple times, and we are in a similar position earlier, so we are looking at what is probably going to move towards a game five, but Impala has struck in first and tries to get it. Man, absolutely. Just look at the control that they've had My over the goodness. course of this match. Over 600 damage for both of them because they were controlling the neutral space on stage so much. 31. 31 signatures from Sandstorm. 20% of that hit from how much he's been tossing Ooh. out that D-Sig and company at the ledge. Not even just that, the slide cancel neutral stakes were on the money, but Impala... Yep. 
four, but it was 25% accuracy, so he only got the one, but that one that mattered got him a stock earlier, and his ability to play clutch on the bow, the bow is so good from Apollo when he needs it at the right moments, and it is so frightening on last stock when he has it. Ooh, look at him now spacing those down lights, so that way he doesn't jump into the trap, but snipes through it. It does have just enough distance to be able to make that work. Apollo already starting off the stock very strong here with this bow. He's going to see a weapon toss away over to the spear. Not really liking the matchup of that great sword at the moment. Uh, looking for a potential maybe side light starter or actually just neutral lights. Weapon toss over. No, actually a little bit too far over to the ledge. Not really worth making an attempt on that one. Yeah, you see he's setting it up. Oh, gets caught in that one. <laughs> and once again, Sandstorm now actually capitaliz capitalizing off of these. And that one not dropped, not missing out on that D, uh, D light into GCD light Sair. Uh, Sandstorm has been really accurate now. Remember earlier while I was worried, I haven't seen many D lights coming out of Sandstorm, even though he's been getting the job done. Before, he was incredibly accurate with it. Now it seems like he's starting to warm Ooh. up a bit. That's still not enough just yet. Yeah, I mean, they were so far into center stage. He just had a ton of distance to cover. Apollo trying to uh, trip him up, go off stage. That's going to give him access to the weapon, get over to the spear. Uh, trying to build some damage up while he can. Going for a reversal. That's but good interesting. Spacing. Now, because because Impala's been so good, especially when Sandstorm has the spear, knowing that you're going up into the air with it, so I can just get a jump in punish on you. He actually gravity canceled that one to put himself a little bit higher. It's that just just the twist on the rock paper scissors. Yeah, just the fact that Impala waited just that much, knowing he'd swing at a disadvantage like that, and just confirming on the punish afterwards. That's that similar position that we saw earlier, like with Meg D, where his patience has been working. But his patience is working out again here. He's holding a lead. This is a big opportunity for Sandstorm. He's got to build up some damage on the side, which Impala once again sneaks right through. Sets up the juggle. Ooh, even through the weapon toss, able to snipe. Sandstorm getting over, trying to go for a starter. Doesn't really go for any, again, he's not really going for any big, like, uh, break, like any combo starters at all. He just goes for a single hit, gets data, and then looks to see what he could get out later. Uh, D6 doesn't find his mark. Going off stage, finally, for a dare attempt. Sider finds his mark. Weapon toss through, gets, no, oh, he misses the gosh. compound. In similar fashion to what we saw happen to Luna earlier, that slide kick ground pound in these higher pressure, pressure situations, it's not easy to hit. You can overshoot it, you can undershoot it. There's just a lot of nuance to it. This is uh, oh, actually Sandstorm. It looked like he intentionally went for a uh, ground pound whiff to try and get Apollo to jump earlier so he could get a punish on him. Nothing really comes off of it, though. Uh, DC got the ledge, misses out as well again, and Impala just trying. To, I, I think if Impala could get any extra damage for free, it's definitely here on this bow with the second stock. Ooh, a little bit of a tag against the signature, but that's all he's going to get. Sandstorm in the yellow, Impala on a fresh stock, but we've seen that doesn't amount to much. Yeah, shades of the beginning of the day. It literally went down to game four last stock where Sandstorm was able to clutch it out and get back into the set because Impala was almost about to beat him 3-1 earlier, but now game four once again. Will oh, Impala man. stop that from happening? And it's so far, it's working. I mean, he just needs one strong hit. I know Sandstorm's got the potential. Stuffed recovery. Here's the chance. Managed to get the wall touch back on the ground. Wait, no, that was Sweatbeats. He's out of here. Impala takes the victory in the run back 3-1. Apollo not letting the double elimination happen to him from the hands of the Sandstorm himself. Instead, the Blizzard has come through here in Winter Championships Ooh. to stop that storm. And he will now have a trip to fourth at minimum, but one match closer to getting that trip out here to that Royale. Man, what a set. I mean, that was what an phenomenal. absolute treat that we got to see them play earlier in the day. We got to see the run back here with the adjustments. I. I I'm just so overjoyed. Yeah, and also kudos to Impala for being one of the few people who, A, has not only been able to not let the championship curse kind of wear through, mm, but yeah. to be able to do it against someone to the caliber of Sandstorm, even with the fact that he hasn't been performing as strong as we're normally used to seeing. He looked very, very good today yeah. and stopped him from getting the double limb. Still not out of the tournament yet. Already has beaten Luna recently, so the likelihood that the podium finish is not only impossible, it's not impossible, but the likelihood that he can maybe be one of the few people to get that Winter Championships Ooh. is still Ooh. available. It's still on it's the line. It's in the running, man. I mean, we are reaching the creme de la creme, the top of the top. We have sitting in that winner's finals, there's Radish, there's Stingray, still down on the elimination bracket side. We've got Luna versus Anime. 
and then now Impala moving up into that lower semifinals of the elimination bracket. Yeah. This is crazy, dude. It really is. And also, we just saw uh, two of the Spear players go head to head. One must fall, so that is one of the Spears gone. Yep. And we're going to get into a similar situation. Now, Luna could also play other things. It might not be the Qatar mirror match, but there's a high likelihood that that happens as we have uh, anime and um, Luna coming up next, which is probably a high likelihood going to be yep. the Qatar mirror. One of them does fall here, but this is like uh, uh, Winter's. Winters is always that toss-up. We always talk about the coin flip of trying to decide who might win. And we're actually seeing some pretty consistent names here sitting at the yeah. top of Winters for a change where a lot of people were saying they were stressed about this in the first place. Yeah. I mean, Radish, Stingray, Luna, absolutely crazy names. But I want to talk about that last set with Impala. So we're going to take it over to Remy for, an, for some analysis. I mean, TWK, to keep it straight with you, Sandstorm is a spammer. I don't, I don't know what else we're going to describe him as. 15 D SIGs in the third game, 37 SIGs or something overall. He's just here to show off the signature kit that you guys did a beautiful job of animating. But uh, let's get into it. Impala is something else. Sandstorm is something else. He's that guy that comes in and he plays your weapon and all of a sudden it's his weapon. I had to get off Koji when I played him. He's He owns that character now. I won't contest him. But the spear is Impala's, and he just showed it off right there. His neutral is insane. We're going to start off with some signature uses of Impala's own because Sandstorm was spamming, but Impala was spamming with style. He put that kit into perspective. That Kaya down sig is always his to use right there. You saw it once. We're going to see it, I think, again here uh, with this play, and it's just what he does. He loves that down sig. He always puts it over the edge just enough for you to move into it, and... But what I really want to look at here is his neutral gameplay in situations like this, in these close encounter situations where most people, they panic jump, they dodge, they use their options to get out of there. Impala doesn't. He plays it smooth. You saw there, he didn't use any extra jumps, no extra dodges. He hit the end light, moved forward, got the date sig, and it is extrapolated into these deep red situations. You think when they both have three stocks, it's insane. And then look at what happens when they both have one. No panic jumping, no dodging, nothing. Gets hit by the weapon throw, okay, cool. Continues holding his spot, dashing around the ground. Down it comes out, I don't care. Move forward, move back. Not gonna do anything I don't need to do. And out of nowhere, it, he just turns it on. He hits one neutral air, he keeps his ground, he hits the next neutral air, and you're off the top. He did not use a single dodge in that entire interaction. Why? He didn't need to. What's the point of wasting my dodge when I can just out neutral game you the entire time? And honestly, I think it's at the point where we can argue Impala just has the best neutral post BCX because he also gets interactions like this where now you've dodged in, I'm instantly going to go for the punish. You're going to downer. I'm going to get another one of those free hits. Thank you for it. I'm going to take it, eat it up, put you in the red off of one interaction like that. And all it took was me just waiting patiently for you to make that mistake. Again, these docker, this 1-1 uh, situation where it's like, okay, Sandstorm, you're coming at me. And we, we were looking at the Megadie games earlier, and they're going back and forth for a long time. They're playing it slow, they're playing it steady. Mehdi likes to take it slow, Impala can meet him at that speed. Sandstorm decides, let's take it fast, and Impala bests him at it almost instantly. You can see the end light come out peacefully, the Nair punish on Sandstorm punish. Sandstorm dodges, Impala punishes it. A Sig comes out, okay, I finally dodge after you hit me. I don't care, I'm not gonna use another option. Gets back on stage, gets the pogo beautifully, takes him off stage, brings him back on, gets the punish, no dodge, no jumps, takes him off the top takes the set count on a convincing lead on that last game. He did a very good job in the neutral game the entire time. His neutral is honestly uncontested right now. You've got to figure out a different way to beat him because if you're just going to give him that space he wants, he's going to take you out every single time. And Paula, the Kaya looks amazing. I want to see what you can do in top four with it. I mean, we said it back at BCX. When we were watching what Impala was doing, it was contestable that he just had the best neutral in the entire world, and that was a one-time nope. showing. Can you replicate that, though, is the big thing. And he has. He's been replicating that. The fact that he is outboxing people like Meg D, who is one of the most defensive dominant forces in the neutral game, not overextending, has a 5-0 record on him. Gets a run back against Sandstorm. Almost won that in the first time in general. Mm -hmm. Gets him this time around. And Sandstorm's neutral was looking phenomenal. And he yep. essentially shut down Greatsword that game, outplayed the spear with his own, and he is so still good. here in the running of Winter Champs, preventing the curse so far again. But now we have that big breakdown on the PR list. You look at those charts. Ooh. Usually you kind of break it down in fours on occasion. We go yeah, top 25, yeah. 20, uh, 26 to 50, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. It's 1 to 25 right now. PR Ooh. number one versus anime, who is the Cinderella story, if you will, of the day. 
currently yep. sitting here in top eight. Yeah, this is going to be probably one of the hardest uphill battles that anime has had today. He's come out on top of pretty much all of those up to this point. But the, oh 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 you Ooh. seem very pensive over there. Oh What's I didn't I didn't on? I didn't take a look at this before we started. Now of course don't get mad at me because I have a bit of a I, I have a bit of a commentator's curse when it comes to saying who uh -oh. is the winning record. Normally I'd say most likely it's probably Luna so I wasn't really looking right 2-0 lifetime lead between community events in uh in in bracket. I believe they're both like, these both might be a community events, but oh. anime has beaten Luna 2-0 and has not dropped a single game. Do do we know when those were? I will look. <laughs> like are are those recent or how far? Let's see. In the past. I got to hunt. Uh but Oh my gosh, Luna with the Lucian that down signature just enough over the edge. That's one of the main scary options we saw it coming out earlier today. Uh Luna on this Lucian pick, I love seeing his blasters. I love seeing his Katars. It's definitely a new kind of style from him. Yeah, I'm not even going to bother to hunt because Luna is on the hunt. He went head hunting over on the side right after Diamond Head. Off that ledge, you have to watch out for that Lucian DC because he is going to smack you for staying there. And that, of course, is one of the most stressful oh. things. But there's that DC neutral stick we mentioned before. This is that Katar mirror match we said was going to be on its way. And it is definitely here to stay. Probably going to be another very fast-paced match. Yeah, absolutely. Luna hunting for the side signature. He wanted the reversal for that early, early knockout. And Luna trying to outspace him right now. Misses the Cerdo and that GC D-Light uh, aiming the other direction. That is a free punish all day for uh, for anime. So now Luna unarmed for a little bit. Anime managing to get over there, steal it out, and tag him for his troubles. Luna going for the unarmed recovery. Of course, looking for uh, something soon, but at the moment, uh, he's uh, he's kind of outboxing him very well. I mean, we saw earlier Stingray was basically making Unarm look like the best weapon in the game. <laughs> just uh, consistently boxing with everyone. Misses on the D uh, dare, but does find a Sarah. However, still not enough just yet. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the weaker side airs to begin with. And there was a lot of stage left to cover. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, there it is. That is the, uh, yeah, yeah, there's, there's no, there's no shot. <laughs> <laughs> no you, shot. He's got three shots. It, pow, pow, pow. <laughs> oh, true, true, true. All lined up in perfectly on aim as he's uh, taking a decent amount of damage, though. So if I'm anime, I'm still feel pretty good. I've gotten my damage out of that previous stock. Oh, my gosh. That said, uh, Luna is chasing, and he is not letting you touch the ground. So uh, might not be so easy. Yeah, he uses the Blaster's Neutral Air uh, better than most anyone I've ever seen. It's like almost levels of Cody usage. I think you're Especially, on the money with that. He uses the X pivot of it so much. He's used it off of hits. He's used it off of just dash jumps. Just a lot of unique movement that you can get in that kit while anti-airing your opponent. Yeah, because most of the time you figure the blasters would be a keep away tool, stair wise, D lights. Just try and keep away the rushdown character that is coming at you in Diamond Head. But he just chases you heavy. But that's still not enough just yet either. Uh, Animate. Oh, oh, okay. Finally, finally catches him slipping up to get himself on the board. Yeah, that's one of the character-specific mix-ups that you can get here with Diamond Head. You know, usually Katars versus versus Blasters. Oh no, you just kind of lose that range. But what if you could toss one? Of I said, but what if I could throw something at you? I think that works. Occasionally, if you just throw something at someone, they might just stop what they're doing. I think that'll work. Uh, of Ooh. course, though. Get caught up, two-pieced, and that's going to be uh, the first game going to Luna. So already, already, that has changed things. Luna didn't even have a single game on him before, but we don't know how long ago it's been since those matches have uh, uh, taken place. But this is a very different Luna uh, going here into this, uh, into this set. Yeah, looking incredibly strong. Took the early lead. Didn't even seem perturbed on that final stock. So he is chilling heavy. He's still got the momentum oh. going into game two. And interesting, too. I think this, uh, I'm pretty sure this is the first time today that we've seen Enigma show up at all. And I think I've only seen it like twice or three times, period, this weekend. I like yeah. it for Diamond Head because you get that coverage on the soft platforms with that, uh, with the Qatar neutral stick. And not even ah. just that, you get people who freak out on there because of it. And that should help you line up some of those recoveries, not even just off the neutral edge, just the panic of getting off the platform. Interesting. See, I was just kind of thinking about, like, how much of a playground that could be for Luna's X-Pivot dash jump now. Oh, that is true also. This could actually just be a big mistake as well <laughs> because you did mention how Luna was chasing heavy into the skies before. Uh, so that is a possibility. And he did open up a lot more of the side wall. You do not have to worry so much about that D-Sig on the side uh, trying to get away because that was really bad for him to start off the last game. Oh. That's a recovery as he gets the first game. Yeah, first that's stock. going to be a pretty scary factor here is while Enigma usually has... 
what we classify as like a tall ceiling, that's only because you're factoring the knockout distance from the highest soft platform in there. If you've got blasters, downlight dash jump recovery carries so far off the top platform, you can score incredibly early knockouts, even with Lucian's low strength. Exactly. That's pretty much why we've only seen, uh, I think, spear players kind of counterpick to this from what I saw this weekend, mm. because you can chase more often on that top platform. But anime actually hasn't been able to stop the platform camping from Luna. I figured that uh, his answer would be utilizing those neutral stakes, utilizing the Nair and wait, make, make him freak out. But oh Luna my gosh. has had no Nothing but hands to deliver. They're coming in at full speed, prime delivery, and he is receiving them. He doesn't want them, but he is blocking them with his face at the moment. Yeah, I mean, he is sending that cash on delivery. He has delivered it, and he's looking for the prize pool. I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. me too. <laughs> he's going to like it too. I mean, yeah, that payout increases. It's gonna he was, <laughs> he's got a full stock lead here. I mean, Luna is looking so comfortable. I'm, I'm with you. I want to see anime start using a lot of those neutral signatures to cover those platforms because I mean he just has to find some sort of answer you need Luna right now is just moving exactly you need a reason for why you came here instead Whoa. Luna trying to use that to his advantage as he chases at the recovery off that second side platform there and yeah get down off the top one don't get caught up on a neutral <laughs> neutral light into recovery read and lose that stock that early Okay, but anime, you know, honestly, he has started to stem this damage flow. It's actually going in his favor now, how much he's mm. closed the damage gap. And there it is, tied up the stocks. But, but despite being down 3-1 just a few seconds ago, now it is last stock and not too far behind The solution the, the whole time was to throw hands himself. As soon as he got the gauntlets, he started fighting back with his fists. It worked, and Luna started blocking with his face. And now we're on all of a sudden a last stock situation here. Luna uh -oh. catches him, though. Good mix up, deciding not to go for D-Zig instead of changing up the timing there. Wasn't enough to get the knockout, though. Luna over onto the blasters. This is where he gets those anti-air knockouts, Ooh. any of those vertical ones. But it looks like he's opting for the horizontal. Just enough side airs will do the trick. One good downer at the ledge will close it out too. But he's going to get the D-Lights there instead, just keeping it nice and simple, I not overextending. It was beautiful the way he executed it too because he hovered over the side like yep. two times. I Baited love the, idea. the choice because, you know, there's a lot of people just being like, oh, but more damage and more force, the dash jump recovery. Uh, but that is so much harder to execute than just the downlight side air. And if the if the downlight side air is gonna knock out, keep it simple. Exactly. Go for the guarantee. Exactly. No, there's no reason to overcomplicate uh, over things sometimes. Because look so out, smart. he's already so far to the side. And the dodge was burned. The moment that that dodge was burned, that's a free follow-up into that. There's there, yep. there's no shot he's getting away from that D-Light. Might as well go straight for the Sair and just guarantee the knockout rather than complicate things. We're going to go into what is a 2-0 lead for Luna trying to punch his ticket into the Final Four. Yeah, so Luna has just been playing so smart. He's been playing so consistent, making the right choices. That set him up 2-0. He's on set point. I, I, I just realized. Have it? I just realized literally the difference in that last game too. We talked about how at the start the Qatars literally weren't doing anything, and then uh, Anime was able to put on 318 with the uh, gauntlets, where it was 22. Ooh. And this is a big opportunity right here. Just misses the Nair to try and keep that extended going, but uh, Luna has had even damage between both, so he has not struggled on either weapon choice so far. Yeah, he seems just so incredibly comfortable. I mean, you you could tell this Lucian pick, it suits him well. Yeah, I'm, I'm digging this. This is uh, somebody who has gone through the uh, literal loops of all characters. We saw the Taros originally. We saw the Jiro come out at one point. We've seen uh, the Lucian here, amongst many other things. That, uh, oh, the Mordex as well. But yep. the, uh, the ground pound, not enough yet. Uh -oh. Sweat beads just barely sneaking by. Yeah, but anime, he's really buckled down. We saw him take out that three to one lead down to final stock that Luna had last game. And then here, the damage was so incredibly even. I, if I mean, there was any time to turn it around, this could be it. Literally, the only difference between these two is that Luna's been able to get the knockouts first because Anime's been yep. able to put the damage on. He brought it all the way back in that last game too. And in this game again, he's got him at KO windows. He just can't get the KO first. And of course, that neutral light's not going to be enough to do it just yet. But uh, is he going to be able to get him off the wall? Yes, he played around it. I think he, yeah, okay, he yep. got him low yep. enough. And no he minimized touch. the damage. So here we go again, where he's getting the KOs, but he can't get them first. He's got to change that. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, if you trade all the way down, well, 
they take them first, they'll take the last one first. It's one of those things where you, uh, it's, it, I mean, it's also way easier said than done that gets the PR, oh, yeah. PR oh, number yeah. one player, the person who, uh, the most winningest North American player from last season outside of where it was the big show where Impala is waiting for that rematch on the other side of it. Uh, it is still not that easy to hold the lead against Luna. Oh, by no means. Right now, Luna just hovering above him, throwing weapon toss up. But uh, anime, I think this is anime's big. Uh, if I felt more confident, anime getting a lead is definitely right now. He's uh, he's looking good. Might be looking for solid recovery read soon. Yet yeah, he did uh, make the attempt at it, but he didn't read the right direction. Dash jump recovery, not gonna knock out Lucian again. The lower strength, but also Demon Island, a very tall ceiling. Wow, all the coast way from the edge. Coast, and that was across Demon Island at that. So he goes one side to the other, gets Diamond himself Head to lead. Is a high strength legend. Just, <laughs> just never forget. Uh, let's see if he can build on it. That's the biggest key. Honestly, the Katars have just been the throwaway weapon out to all of a sudden. That, that was literally what got him to this point. But uh, ooh, oh wait a minute. Oh my gosh. I, I respect the attempt, and he gets around it. Not that one, though, as we see Luna even it up. Second time's the charm. Always, always the second time. The third time is a fluke, okay? So <laughs> don't believe anybody when they tell you that, all right? Oh, Thank punish on the signature. Just a little bit of a tap because Anime wasn't able to get armed up with a weapon. Anime in an uncomfortable spot, if you will, because, of course, that D-Zig is going to make you feel very uncomfortable. Uh, finally catches one of the neutral zigs. So wait a minute. It's uh, And he's still... He's got a, the damage yeah, advantage. He's got a handling. small adv advantage, yeah. All right, this is, uh, is kind of stressful. Luna getting in. He's him up a little bit, but Anime gets over, tries to catch him at the ledge. That might have been what sealed the deal. Does he get the recovery? Oh he takes the ball to the gosh. top. That was so good. I feel like he got so much data off the last time he didn't get it because he went up there, he hovered, he went towards the left, but that was after he saw that Luna would wait for the reaction of the jump and then go again. Yep. That time he followed him all the way up to go after at that time. That's oh, yeah. probably a mix up that only works once in the set, but you needed it at the best time ever because you're not now, you are still not I feel like he out. grabbed a cab here and he's like, yo, follow that car. <laughs> Luna takes this guy, he's just gonna pulse right after him. That is, that, that, look, give me that cab, okay? Cause like, for one, try to get a good cab in NYC nowadays, ha! But <laughs> also, um, great job, because I will hunt down the ice cream truck just the same way he did right there, and I want to get my strawberry shortcake. I am saying this because I'm gonna go get one after this is over. Well, we have game number four, here with anime, not out of it yet, still holding on. And for a change showing that even though he had those winning uh, records against Luna before, he was not completely figured out. Yeah, I just love that anime was able to hold on, deny the 3-0. And hey, he's got the momentum going into this game. We're right back out at Demon Island. All the variables are the same. I just hope he can recreate those results. I mean, literally the main thing we mentioned before was can he actually get a lead and build on it? It's so, it, it's the most, straightforward thing to say but it was the truth and he finally got it done over luna's blasters picking up a ton he did finally catch him at that dead zone he missed out in the gap where it was able to get anything started and now Ooh. that neutral air just saving his life at the right time here we go chasing ah oh, went for the dodge read but luna took higher to the skies and luna's just barely missing some of these this is uh it's a, i won't even say uncharacteristic it's just a good defense but luna switching up to the cars meet uh, qatar's immediately and getting the first one but the damage was done it's one straight hit away from anime evening it up yeah but once again we do find ourselves in that situation the damage able to be even but the stock the first one taken by luna and answering right back without taking any damage that time. Beautiful. Almost every other time that this has happened, he's been at least at minimum in the low orange. That time, nothing happening. It feels like anime is starting to wake up a ton. Yeah, I mean, he's finding the beats where he needs to. He gets those punishes, even just if it's something as simple as getting in there and a gauntlet's neutral light. Sets him on the heel, takes some stage advantage, and that damage builds up over time. Look at and then Luna starting to get a couple of two-piece strings at minimum. Uh, here we go, back to the blasters though. He's feeling extremely comfortable with the blasters at the moment as he Woo. catches him on his way down too. Guessed incorrectly. He, it was yep. a good read, wrong direction. Oh my gosh, dribbling him. Knew that the dodge was spent and had the distance for the down, light and the down air and deciding. Where is the ref to call that carry right there? He is just bringing him all the way over and getting the double dribbles through. Doesn't oh. matter though, and anime not able to take him out just yet. That was really close though to getting the lead. Again, caught the landing, just the neutral light, building that damage. Luna going for the reset. He wanted the guarantee into the recovery. And yeah, both of them looking for the big reads right now. I like the idea out of Luna too, because he hadn't gone for that reset at all prior to that moment. And now recovery will just do it in anime. Let's go. Strikes first. 
power of God and anime on his side. <laughs> Look, if we start here, now you feel like number one in the background, it's <laughs> over. It is over. Shining bright for everyone, <laughs> let it out your fantasies. All you Bleach fans, Ws. Anyways, so we got last stock. Two to one. As even as it could possibly be. Luna catching his land and goes for that reset once again. But anime dodging up into the air. Anime looking for a punish, but gets a punish for himself. So it beats out, though. That's a free grab. Tries oh. to go for it again. I like it, waiting on it, because you know you have to get that wall touch. Get back on. Anime, however, in a bad spot. Tries to go for Wait it Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Does he get the reversal? No, he gets out of there. That was almost such a disaster for one of the two of them. Yeah, Anime, I mean, he was scheming for that thing the whole time. He was trying to get Luna to chase him down there. Let him cook. He had the gauntlets. Let him cook. But Luna is now the one cooking instead. Does not get the closeout. Luna trying to finish it. 3 up potentially here. Going for the recovery. Does he get the follow-up? Seer comes through. Does he get the closeout on the Anime? Keeps him stuck. Juggle. He gets back down, though, somehow. Oh, just dodges down and under that signature. Ooh. Piling on damage of his own. They're going to be threatening with the big stuff. Oh, the side signature catches the landing. And just like that, Luna with the 3-1. Shutting down what was almost an incredibly good chase by Anime a second ago, too, because he went all the way up to the skies and tried to catch him slipping with that GC side take. Oh, you aren't prepared Ooh. for this, are you? Well, he was. He just drifted away just enough. Luna was able to clutch it out at the end, but Anime made him work for it for sure. Here we go. Chases him all the way up to the skies. Tried to catch him a little bit. Look how just close short. that just was. Short. That was so close to being such an immaculate play from Anime. Doesn't matter, though. Gets the whiff punish right there. Crosses him up, and Luna now lines up not only the the last position of our final four but a very fun rematch Man. we've been looking forward to we uh, thought we yes. might see in winners instead it's for that ticket to oh the my wait God. this is eu version two i just realized this this There's is EU so version two. line in, in eu we had godly and akno fighting mm -hmm. for the trip Yo. in elimination semis yup and now we have impala and luna fighting for oh. the trip eternal in elimination rivals semis. i love this Winters is fun. Well, for us, because we're not actually playing in it, so we don't have to deal with this stress. But for all of y'all, this is this is a phenomenal time. And again, oh, that man. lines up the, the the last four and only one match left to determine who will be our last player to join us for the Winter Royale. Wow. Wow. So that top four, just to refresh the bracket here, after seeing all these victories leading up into that top four, we've got Radish versus Stingray sitting up on the winner's bracket. And now we've got Luna versus Impala for that lower yes. elimination semifinal. And kudos to everybody who's been able to perform the way they did today, because we mentioned before, I know we keep bringing it up, but Winters is that first event Post BCX with that gap, off season comes in, people get a little bit comfortable, spend some time with family, they don't maybe warm up as much, but the pressure's on the Fair. line to start off the season strong. You want to be the first one to get that W to set the tone for the year, and the people we expected to be here, most of them are here. A lot of us had yep. predictions of Radish, Stingray, Luna, in some degree, Impala wasn't there for us, but we all thought maybe Impala could do it. It's just hard to say the back-to-back -back after that mm. performance. Impala putting a lot of people to a silent tone right now as he is sitting in a potential W. But we are not going to be silent about a certain thing because we talked about it all weekend, and Winter Championships has an exclusive thing going on right now. Oh, yeah. Brawlhalla.com slash winter merch. It will be ending on the 12th, which is, of course, the final day of the Winter Championships 2v2 edition, which has been both an amazing custom blanket that's super soft and has all the weapons it's on great. it. I love that thing. I need it. And of course, the hoodies as well. Uh, sign up. Well, not sign up. Go get it on brawlhalla.com slash winter merch. Yeah, I'm going to go bundle up with one of those because these matches have been absolutely crazy and top four is going to be even wilder. I only found out about it when I got here and I've been, like I said, I've been poking at the people uh. in charge every day saying, Give me, I need it. Give me, give me, give me, give me. Uh, also, shout out to uh, as well the incredible jerseys they had. I had to put mine on today. I actually got custom one from BCX. For any of you who didn't get yours, what are you doing? Why did you forget to go get it at the desk? Uh, I, there are some here. Talk to people, get it. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, again, we're going to go to a short break as we get ready to get into our final four of the Winter Championship for North America. So you already know what time it is. Go run to the bathroom, get your food, do whatever you got to do, but do not leave as we have the final four around the corner.
power on that ski is, uh, I get looking really good. I like, oh, GC. Oh, no, 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 High blast on the ending capture. Won't be enough. Gonna drop off stage. Gonna go for another DC. Get Ledstorm toss out. And he catches him wow. on the ledge. Wow. Oh, caught in that one. <laughs> and once lot. again, Sandstorm now actually capitalized. If he did open up a lot more of the side wall, you do not have to worry so much about that DC. Got the side uh, trying to get away because that was really bad for him to start up last game. Oh. That's a recovery as he gets his side there. Good trick. The ledge to close it out too, but he's gonna get the deal somehow. Oh, just dodges down and under that signature. Piling on damage of his own. They're gonna be threatening with big stuff. Oh, the side signature catch!
We've already figured out five of the players who have earned invites to the uh, Royales, but we've already actually found out seven, technically, because there's two sitting on the winner's side, guaranteed top three finish. We still have one more to figure out and also one more person to crown for the singles because we're here in the Winter Championship, North American Top Four. Now, you might be thinking, what is a Royale? What's is, a Royale? Is, is that what they call a, a, is it a Whopper a Whopper? In France? A, no, it's a Big Mac. Is it a Big Mac in France? Uh, they call that one a Royale with cheese, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the seasonal Royales. You can see it in the, about the top middle of your screen. The top three North American finishers, the top three EU finishers, and the top two South American finishers will be invited to an invitational only small group tournament that happens after each seasonal. Yes, it is in person. We fight online for the winter championship, the spring championship, so on and so forth, and then they fight in person. That small group of hyper competitive individuals, the best that each of these three regions has to offer, are brought here to the true proving ground. It's kind of like we almost have half of a mid season invitational four times this year. Yeah, and unlike traditional royalty, bloodlines don't matter. This is almost like a meritocracy instead, but it's all it about is. the It is. Actually, yeah, it's, it's one like of the, the very few yeah. meritocracies truly left in this world, yeah. and we have it here in Brawlhalla Esports. But again, it is all about those invites. The winner of these get to go into that Royale. We've got four, like you said, all related to those seasonals. And of course, we've already figured out technically seven of the people going. Three from EU, because that's already happened. Two from South America, that's already happened. And there's two currently sitting in the top side of North America. So there's a lot of things riding on this tournament, not just your placement, not just the money that you make, not just the PR points that you get, not just the seeds for the rest of the tournaments, but the Royales are so important for these super uh, hyper peak echelon players, the absolute best of the best that we have in Brawlhalla Esports. MIB. The Royales are really important for them as well. It's uh, That's going to be some of the most interesting gameplay we see this year. Yeah, and one thing that's really, really nice is that we don't have to go into those uh, bigger events, right? The mid-season invitation or the world championship and going, oh, I don't know how these regions stack up against each other. Now we kind of get to see, we get these like kind of check-ins, but um, that's it for the Royales. I think it's time to get into our gameplay for today. We've got the top four PR in North America all competing in the top four of the North American Winter Championship. But on the top side, it's Stingray and Radish. My fingers are on the other side. There, there You can see it behind yeah. us right there on the screen. You can see it if you're looking at the bracket as well. Radish versus Stingray here in the winner's finals. This determines who is guaranteed top two, who will move on to the grand finals through this winner's side of the bracket, who will go down into the elimination side of the bracket to fight the winner of Luna and Impala. We got Radish on the screen right now. We have seen Radish playing a lot of Petra today. Been an incredible legend choice. The win rate of 2022 is about 77%, but Stingray is going to be just a little bit higher here at 79%. Stingray coming into this one on that Bryn. Yep, Stingray, a little bit more established in the region. Again, Radish kind of on the come up from 2022, but he's had that consistency in the later stages, getting PR4, uh, sorry, not PR4, uh, rank four, both in Autumn Championship and in the World Championship, just behind Stingray at BCX. So likely they ran into each other, and it was Stingray who took the victory, but it's a different pick from Stingray right now. It's that Brynn. And interesting to note is our top four placements here in North America right now are our top four power ranked players here in North America. Impala being uh, PR2, Luna being PR1, Stingray being PR4, uh, three, excuse me, and Radish being PR4. And Stingray showing him why he is one better PR than Radish as he gets a, like a 37 second stock without taking hardly any damage here on Small Brawl Haven. Yeah, each PR higher you are is how many stocks above your, your opponent you're gonna okay. be, right? You know, that's how that works is he is taking the stocks. And again, it's been predominantly about that spear from Stingray, but really his ax has been leveling up throughout the day. But on the other side, Radish is able to clean that up with the gauntlets, but it's all been about the orb from Radish. That was a great answer back from Radish. It did take like essentially another 30 seconds, but in that time he took very little damage. If you're looking at the top right of the screen, there's hardly a color change there on Radish's damage. So he's still sitting in a really good spot. Look at the momentum there. Even after he missed the dare, he still got behind Stingray, hit the neutral. Okay, Stingray, I thought we might get a gimp off the top there, but you saw him hit those sweat beads. He was running out of in-air economy to continue chasing up top. He got what he could, landing back down, 
has the axe. Radish is going to have to essentially hit two hits to every single hit that Stingray finds. Look how far that side air sent. Yeah, that one really launched. It is small Brawl Haven. Almost a little surprised that didn't KO. The down sig, though, is punishable. Radish just comes in, hits the neutral light. Nothing else behind that one. Down light recovery will KO for Stingray. And Stingray essentially has the exact same lead that he had when he took the first stock from Radish. We'll see if Radish can do what he did before, hit the second verse, same as the first, and get the answer back. He has already taken one hit, now two hits since then. Ooh. Did not have line of sight. Nope. Even though the animations overlapped, he did not have line of sight on Stingray. The corner of that wall got in the way, which is why you didn't see that hit. Yeah, usually if you're the person on the edge, you want to be a little bit higher or a little bit further back. And then on the other side, Stingray, of course, very intelligently sat far enough back that that line of sight Ooh. was blocked as the side <laughs> sig connects. And Stingray is up game number one. That was a really clean side signature coming out on that spear from Stingray to clean that one up. He got past Radish, got behind him, and you saw that coming. The second it started, we all knew that was going to hit. Had some solid spear damage here, 170, but of course, like we've been saying, the real star of the show is this axe. He feels really comfortable on this Bryn axe. He's actually opting in to the deck stance. He's going to have that 5-6-5-6. Five, six, five, six. So it's essentially middle of the road. In the middle of the road, people just like that stat line. They're really nice. Maybe some people would prefer movement speed, but if you can get stats right down the middle, no one's really feeling any pain on that. Yeah, it is kind of interesting. Usually you'll see a lot of people kind of take out of decks whenever they have the opportunity. But Stinger is like, I don't like having that extreme movement speed. Instead, going to kind of bring that one back down and neutralize some of these stats. On the other side, Radish is taking out of the decks, putting into the strength, I believe, and he's trying to swing as big as he can with his Petra. Wapitas goes up. Stingray is able to get underneath it. You saw the neutral light come out. He didn't fall into it. Picks up the weapon as well. He was doing, uh, he had some unarmed damage coming out. If we remember back to previous Stingray sets that we saw, his unarmed, Good, good gosh, uh, Miss Molly. <laughs> he had some incredible unarmed play earlier. Axe plays stellar. Of course, the spear play as well. Whoa. Everything in this kit. Oh, and he doesn't get the punish there. Stingray Whoa. still in control of this game. About 50 seconds for the first KO this game. Stingray up 1-0. Now he has a stock lead. While he's in the red, Radish could clean this up pretty quickly. He won't have to do as much work to get this stock as he did the previous game. Yeah, definitely a real possibility of cleaning this up. Just needs like a side light, side air, maybe a recovery, or just a raw side air, and he will clean it up. Likely will want to stick with the orb. Yeah, just going to toss those gauntlets up, try to delay that spawn. But we'll see if he can get some momentum here, because again, Stingray has been in the driver's seat for the most of this set. Now we're seeing some good momentum. Nice string coming out from Radish. He's going to be stuck over on the edge. That time he picks it up a little bit higher, which is why he found that line of sight to actually make the connection onto Stingray with that neutral signature. In terms of last game, the time he spent on Orb and Gauntlets was radically different. 63% of the game was spent on Orb, but he only did about 50% more damage. He did 101 on Gauntlets and 163 on Orb. So he had it for a long time, but he wasn't really able to capitalize on that too much. I feel like in general, he just wasn't able to do a lot in that last game this time doing all right manages to get back has just enough movement i thought that weapon toss would have been a uh, trouble because it did catch that downward movement but radish thankfully makes it back he's got the orb in hand again with the end sigs but stingray has yet to punish him you can see how far back Stingray is playing now because of that. Because the last one ended up making that connection. Oh, big spirit bomb so fast. You don't see that utilized very often because, you know, it's kind of one of those obvious things yep. that you see coming when you're just like ready on the edge. Like, okay, I'm waiting for you to move up a little bit. I'm going to spirit bomb you. Get ready. But Stingray. He got hit by it because Radish threw it out so quickly. He didn't charge it, went with that minimum charge time and got it out. Yeah, it just caught the movement of Stingray. It wasn't like he was sitting on the wall waiting for it to come out. Instead, he was trying to get to the wall and Radish cut off the path. But right now, Stingray's the one with that damage advantage. Radish hits a two-piece, but Stingray's already swinging back. Some of those zoning side airs coming out. Stingray with middle of the stage. Radish actually put himself on the wall. And when he got back up, the landing was punished by Stingray. Back-to-back -back side light side airs. Goes for a third one, but Stingray dodges through. Jockeying for positions here. Stingray throwing out those neutral airs. Just trying to take up some aerial space away from Radish. Catches him with that side air to punish that side light. And again, there's the end sig. Radish likes to stall when he gets po uh, put onto those corners. And again, you see how far back Stingray is playing. There is no time for him to actually punish that sig. Maybe he doesn't even really know the best way to punish it. So just avoidance at that point is the first priority. 
Yeah, at least not letting it hit you in the face is good. But a side light side air, and Radish gets a sigh of relief as he ties up the game. Grabs it right at the end, tying up the set 1-1 between these two players. Looking at the breakdown here of the damage, this one much better in terms of damage numbers. Before he did 101 on Gauntlets and 163 on Orb. He took that out of Gauntlets, added that and much, much more onto the Orb. Great numbers here. Good solid efficiency from Radish on that one. And of course, good clutch at the end. Yeah, and uh, great utilization of those side light siders. We're seeing him do it a lot against Stingray. Uh, I'm kind of reminded of his earlier match against Sandstorm where he was doing a lot of these downlight approaches where he would do like downlight and air against, Sand, uh, against Sandstorm. But now against Stingray, he's really catching that landing with the side light, getting that side light side air, which is a position where he can kind of pressure a little bit more than that downlight and air can. That's also gonna give him some more range. If we're talking about the downlight, I mean, it's gonna hit a little bit up, but it doesn't hit as far in front of you as the side light will. And when you're going up against an ax, like the ax side light has some range on. Of course, the ax neutral light that he's using a lot has some decent range on it as well so using that side light on the orb let's radish kind of extend his effective range out a little bit earlier but there we see a down light nair coming out early in this game a yep. couple of hits coming out from radish but stingray again swinging back on him there's the n6 stingray he's just letting him do it he's like all right take your time sitting out there because at the very least you're burning your own timer right exclamation points will eventually hit if you stay out there too long there is a weapon spawn on the field. Stingray is going to throw his axe away, pick up the spear. Of course, Radish being on the orb is not really going to throw his weapon away unless he absolutely has to. Or there's several weapons on the field so he can pick up some gauntlets, throw those away, and then pick up another orb. Yeah, definitely a comfort weapon of Radish. Stingray does get behind the side light, but the side light of his doesn't really lead directly into a follow-up. It's going to be the axe swings looking for a side air doesn't get the hit. I was wondering if we were going to see, oh, neutral signature KOing off the top. Great pickup. I was wondering when Radish was on the wall, if we were actually going to see more of an initiation into an edge guard because Stingray had the weapon advantage. So Radish didn't have that gravity cancel neutral signature or anything other than the unarmed kit. You saw a big commitment there from Radish. He's finding some solid damage here. Even though he did take a stock loss, he put some good damage out on a Stingray, who I believe is in the beginning stages of orange. We'll see the next time he gets hit. Yeah, he is in orange. There's, of course, the sideline side air. Yeah, I'm so fascinated by this like mental that Radish has, which is just like, I'm gonna super play this orb and Sig will connect for him on that corner. Did in fact find the line of sight. But like when he has the gauntlets, it's not like he's inefficient. It's not like he's struggling. He's able to put out these big damage moments and then he'll just go, I'm gonna play orb, side light side air. Working on the spacing here. Radish has not thrown out a move in probably five to eight seconds because he was waiting for that moment, the perfect moment, while Stingray was not only not able to hit him, but also in the right spot for him to pick up that side light sider. If he goes for that in the middle of the stage, probably doesn't have enough force on it to KO off the left, so he waited until Stingray was all the way on the left side. Stingray playing from behind now, and Radish is finding more catches him with the GC side light into the side air. Can't continue it though. You saw the sweat beads come out and the side sig will not connect for Stingray. Radish keeps oh. it going, goes into the nair. A two stock coming out from Radish there, showing complete control. His orb 100% leveling up now in this game. The route change up. He had hit side light, side air so many stinking times. You're seeing it right there. But in the final moments here, he wants that extra tap into the nair, into the jump side air, gets him a little bit closer to that right side box, and it forces Stingray over to the Orion for game number four. And that's where a player is going to see the side light come out, and they know the side air is coming out. They're not mashing that dodge. So you can get away with a little bit more there, which is why he probably went for that neutral air instead of just a straight side light side air. So if Stingray's not mashing that dodge button, he's not mashing a jump button, because he's expecting a true combo, that standard true combo to come out. Yeah, trying to uh, save some of that mental energy, maybe cost him a little more, but he has the Orion, the comfort pick of Stingray. He's back to that spear, but Radish is over to the gauntlets. He gets a two-piece, Stingray swings back. Radish doing a great job here in the spacing game. He's going even in damage, but before just about five seconds ago, he was definitely ahead in the damage. Oh, he's gonna take that there. The D-Sig gonna be able to cover both sides while they were basically stacked. Stingray was just a little bit too far behind Radish. He moved out of the way of that weapon toss as it was coming down. 
Yeah, I love the way that Stingray loves to do these up tosses. It's something that's like very unique about specifically his Orion, is he likes to just cover this vertical space. So go for these up tosses. He knows that he's got two weapons with a lot of horizontal space coverage already in the toss. So he's just going vertically with it and just trying to take space. Ooh, he picked up that. Even though, man, that signature has so much range on it. It wasn't like a game changer because Radish was in white, but he still got the damage out, still made the hit, and now we see Stingray. I wonder if he's gonna go into any more of those GC neutral signatures now that he got hit by one. He was being so good at completely staying back from it, but then all of a sudden, that one he got hit by last game. I, if anything, I, f I feel like he's getting a little bit more aggressive against him. He's really trying to do this like dash jump down toss and just like bop Radish on the head, maybe make him think a little bit. You see the triple exclamation points, but Radish not able to punish it. Follow up side air. Oh, he doesn't make the connection on it. There's a nice dare. He was basically stacked right on top of Radish. Of course, Spear is not really going to have that stacked option when you're grounded, so he jumped in the air, went for the down air. No weapons for Stingray, though. He might have impeccable unarmed. He might honestly just play unarmed, considering uh, he's done that in the past, but it won't even matter as Radish hits the recovery. He's still playing from behind, though. He needs to get that damage. I'm still waiting to see some Lance here. We really haven't seen that whatsoever yet after he made this Legend swap. Ooh. Oh, didn't get the read, though. Now we have it in his hand. There's a nice D-Light. Goes for the neutral signature, expecting Radish to move in after getting hit by that D-Light, which is usually a risky move because you can sometimes get caught with another D-Light. I love to double D-Light when I'm using Lance, mm -hmm. catching someone dodging in. Oh, but Stingray had the read this time. He just Not even waits close, dude. He was so far back. Doesn't have the movement there. Again, you saw those sweat feeds. Stingray is really good about like getting that really high hit and then just chase dodging down, saying, all right, I'm going to walk away with that damage that I've earned. So I'm wondering, like, Radish is still going for these GC neutral signatures, and obviously the success rate is very, 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 very low. But he may not even be trying to hit at the moment. He may just be throwing those out because there is virtually no punishment throughout the entire game <laughs> coming out as that two stock happens right now. But I'm wondering if it's just Radish being like, I'm going to throw this out every time. It's going to be really difficult for you to punish. So if you just stay away from me for a second, I get a second to think, figure out exactly what I want to do, and I stop the immediate onslaught and the immediate edge guard from coming out. Yeah, it definitely feels like it gives them like that mental breather. The worst case scenario for him is, oh, he's burned a dodge, but yeah. he's been getting back safely, hasn't been getting hurt. And then there's those occasional times where Stingray gets a little too close, yep. and then he gets this huge damage dump. But now we're into game number five. Winner of this goes into the win uh, the grand finals. Now, we really haven't seen too much off stage. Oh, oh I was wondering if that was going to bring him down and actually yeah. not bounce off the main platform. Stingray. With that big early pickup, I'm sure he wanted that to send down and not actually into the main stage itself. That could have been a huge edge guard and a huge early lead. Yeah, it could have converted into a whole lot more. You did see that air dodge burned from Radish, but he fights his way back towards the stage. Stingray dodges down, doesn't get the read this time. Good change up, oh! but he eats the weapon toss. He thought he was past it, went for the recovery. Radish got caught just a little bit too early in that recovery. Oh, that was nice. I. I feel like I haven't seen a gauntlet sidelight <laughs> in like the entire tournament. He has not. He's definitely not gone sidelight gravity cancel sidelight. Yeah. I swear that's like the first time he's done. I that. forgot that existed. <laughs> Man, gauntlet players after those nerfs, gauntlet players are just <laughs> different now. I swear that was like a, a mental patch change more than anything else. Yeah, they're they're and like it's nerfed and suddenly they forget the rest of the kit. But right now he needs to find that move. The N6 have been working for him for finishing stocks with the gauntlets. Might even be a downlight situation, but instead he just goes for the neutral light and is gonna be likely looking for the side air. No weapon toss here, just waiting for the side air to punish the approach into landing. Radish didn't take too much damage on this second stock. Of course, he's going back to the orb. It does have some damage on it, though. So there is the potential that he might get disarmed. I don't think so. He's yellow on this stock. So the weapon probably doesn't have too much damage on it. Yeah, he should be all right to stick with this orb for at least a little Ooh. while. The chase up, good movement from Radish. Avoids that recovery. Not sure if it would have KO'd, but it's definitely extra damage for Stingray. No punish. It's just, it's essentially a timeout signature. Yep. It's saying timeout, I'm going to think, time in. It's a, just a little pause in the game. Down Sig, though, will launch Radish. Weapon Toss doesn't connect this time. Radish goes Ooh. for the quick one, but the Down Sig catches Radish. Gets past the weapon. He didn't even try to dodge yeah. that. He somehow knew that he could get in right under that. Just hold left and pray. The, the confidence, really, to get past it avoids the downlight as well. Still playing very far behind in the damage department. And the nice side air. 
Just a little clean one, got right behind him. He was right on that corner, so it wasn't too far to that right side blast zone. Oh, he got the dodge. I was hoping he was going to get more, but he picked up that D-Light in a little bit of a weird spot. He might have thought that it wasn't going to hit because it was just the final frames where Radish finally fell into it. Now, the D-Sig is like a standard thing that Stingray does in his gameplay, but until that like one that we just saw a few moments ago, he hasn't really been using it too much in this set. Yeah, he definitely hasn't been throwing them out the way that he used to, Like especially like those gravity cancel down sigs used to be a really big part of his Orion Lance play, but haven't seen too many of those throughout the entirety of today. Nice. Other side air. Radish keeps this one even. Basically a mirror image of the first stock. The exact same thing, just waiting for that high recovery back to the stage, grabbing that side air to punish it. Shockying, no attacks thrown out. Stingray really picking and choosing how he wants to get in on Radish. Very careful. Even running all the way to the left side, right over to that corner. He didn't want to put himself on the wall. Could have been in a possible disadvantage state there, but it was just to the far left side of the main stage. Catching the landing. Radish already has a lead now. Double nair, though, from Stingray. They are fighting for this. They want to go into the grand finals. A guaranteed top two finish. There's the end sig again. The burn dodge Stingray knows that he can get away with that weapon toss, but it's not going to be much. I was a little bit surprised that he went for that weapon toss. Uh, I mean, he was very confident that he could probably hit it, but there wasn't a weapon on the stage that he could then pick oh. up. So just a few moments after, and Radish is going to knock out Stingray in game five. Game five, and Radish finds the side air that he needs. He's been so efficient with his orb side airs in particular. He's hit so many of them, and they have KO'd time and time again. <laughs> All three replays are about that orb side air. So one of the things that I really like about the Royale to online seasonal championship relationship okay. is like first, second, third, still matters because there's like the prize pool difference and the PR point mm. difference. But like you can get in the top three. And if you're like one of those land players, like Boomy and Remy back in the day in twos, they didn't care about onlines. Little Captain Faison could win all the onlines in the world. It didn't matter to them. They were the land monsters. That's what they really cared about. So you could essentially, once you get into that top three, some of that pressure can be relieved because you've gone past that break point and you're like, I'm in for the Royale. That's where I'm really going to bring out the craziness. And that, with the pressure relieved, maybe you even play better and place better in the actual online seasonal championship in preparation for that. Well, at the very least, I'm sure that they all want that gold medal. Absolutely. It is still the winter championship. It's still the first championship of 2023. And of course, all three of, or all of the, all four of the people here have all earned a gold medal in their history. But of course, they want the first one of 2023. So that is Radish securing that spot in the grand finals. It is going to be Stingray going down to fight the winner of the set we are about to watch. Yep, it is going to be Impala versus Luna. PR number one and PR number two currently sitting in the elimination side of things. Now, this is going to be the world champion from last year fighting against the people who thought was going to be the world champion from last year. Now, Impala already took down Sandstorm, a former world champion. So let's see what he's got for Luna here. It is going to be a drastically different game because I highly doubt we're going to see any type of Arcadia coming out from Luna. Yeah, definitely a different play style going to be coming out from Luna, not only between him and Sandstorm, the earlier set that Impala played, but also between him and the last time these two fought at the world championship. It was all about that Caspian, and Impala really had Luna's number at the World Championship, but today uh, Luna's on the Lucian, and we'll see how well he does. This Lucian setup is so hard. Those those blasters actually go crazy. That's a, <laughs> that's a really good blasters model. Uh, you'll get to see it when it's actually in the game. And we're going Three, to two, Miami Dome. One. The dome. Uh, interesting pick. I'm not sure how well it works for Impala. I know Luna's going to have a lot of uh, success with those nares covering those soft platforms. On the other side, Impala's N6, neither of them really cover those soft platforms, but the recoveries do work for him, so he might not care too much. He could also use those platforms as a way to extend his grounded hitboxes because yeah. some of those side signatures have a lot of left and right movement in them. You can use that to catch a high recovery and then actually get the stock off of that because some of those send in that 45 degree angle. If you lift those up off the stage, you're closer, especially if you hit a bow recovery like off of that soft platform as well. There you kind of see in it, right? Like he jumped off the soft platform, went with a gravity cancel downline, just trying to extend his range and height. Luna right now, though, needs to find more damage onto Impala. Goes for the ground pound. That's going to get punished by Impala. And Luna 
Gets the hit he needs to guarantee the wall touch. As a Blasters player, I do be liking this stage for the exact reason you said earlier. Because of those nares, being able to juggle, also being able to move myself up. That after I get those juggles, I move onto the soft platform, I can pick up a Blasters recovery in orange, and all of a sudden I got a super early stock. Luna fighting for his life over on the edge, able to get through the weapon tosses and the flurry of moves that Impala throws out. See a nice little quick weapon toss. He's going to strip the field, grab some Blasters. But Impala staying just above Luna. Luna went for the stacked option for the Blasters. Unfortunately, did not connect for him. And Impala ends up catching him. Grab Pound Ooh, thrown Luna, out. what are you doing, brother? He telegraphed that like a Dark Souls boss. And Impala punished it. He wanted the stock so badly. He's just throwing out the big attacks. He needs to finish it off. But oh, Impala's no. getting damage. Oh, he's still going. Has Luna already okay. in the orange. Finally picks up that side signature. He's going to sit on this weapon. Is he going to stick with the blasters? No, yes, maybe. Who knows? At the end of the day, you're seeing some nice, quick movement coming out from Luna showing off, being able to uh, dash onto those soft platforms, move himself around very quickly. Of course, maybe that's one of the reasons he's playing this Lucian. Oh, 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 oh. Luna, what are you doing, brother? Oh, no. He's just <clears throat> going to throw that stock away. He could be throwing game one off of that alone. That gives Impala so much room to play with. He was already adding up a bunch of damage on the second stock before Luna found the first of Impala's. This could be a major confidence and momentum shift in the way of Impala. If he keeps, if everything remains the same before that SD, this is gonna be Impala's game. Yeah, Luna just made his climb even harder, getting rid of the harnesses and taking away the safety net of having an extra stock. Instead, now he has to take two off of the current world champion with just one, and it won't happen in game number one as Impala hits the down sig and takes the game. Now you're going to see 488 total damage coming out from Impala, and that's because Luna basically threw away an entire stock or at least half of a stock right there. He hits the falling nair, the recovery to the right, the dodge to the left, and he falls. He was in the orange there. He still had plenty of room to go before he was knocked out. This was a beautiful pickup. He started picking him up in the whirlwind blades of that blender. That had him in orange, and then the final swipe, that actually turned him red, sent him into that left blast zone. On Miami Dome, those left and right blast zones can be a little bit devious in how close they are to the actual stage, so he's picking that early KO up as well. Yeah, it is a map with a high ceiling, but relatively close horizontal Three, two, KO boxes. One, and it looks like they like the map because we're going back to it for game number two. Luna hoping that having an extra stock here might work out better this time. That was definitely a tough first loss in game one for Luna. Let's see if he can be like a goldfish and forget everything that happened. Or you and I, because we tend to forget a lot That's, of things. So that the, is true. But the down sig will hit for Luna. Not going to do too much there. Not enough damage onto Impala before that one landed. It's really just me doing a really good impression of a goldfish. Everyone knows I'm great at impressions. A method actor in, in all uh, rights. Let's see. No major edge guard. Just going to throw a little side light over the edge. Not even some D lights coming out. Okay, some poking coming out from Luna, utilizing that long range of the blaster's side light. Again, the side lights connect. Not getting that extra damage off of it. You're not seeing those, like, chase pivot nares that he was doing against was, other yeah, opponents. Yeah, I was just about to say that. I'm not seeing the confident blasters play as much as we saw previously. I can't remember who he was actually against. I know it was looking really good against Anonymous Alex when you and I saw that earlier. Oh, but he does end up finding that dare and the weapon toss down. Uh, and it looks like he wants to stick with the Qatars against Impala's second stock. Doesn't hit the dare. Going to deny weapons. Yep. Impala looking for the weapon spawn, hoping it comes to the left soft platform. No, it goes to the right, which means Luna's going to be able to get over to it, pick up that set of blasters, throw out a little bit more damage. Impala hoping he can get to this one. The down air hoping to zone around it, but no, Impala is able to dodge away from him and get a hit, giving him free reign to pick up that spear. Ooh, and Luna nice punish. lands on top of that with the side air, ends up outranging that down sig, and he gets the punish onto Impala. He's adding up this damage. It's not super fast, but he's still getting it. And he's not taking too much. And the damage he is taking is not stock taking away damage. He's not getting hit Ooh. by the D light, but he is getting hit by the side light into the turnaround, into the dodge read, so that he can get that neutral sig coming out. We haven't seen too many signatures coming out from Impala, especially not that spear neutral sig. Yeah, that's a, a rare sig for Impala, right? He'll do the spear down sig a lot, but when it comes to the spear kit, like I'm used to seeing that side sig in particular. And then when he goes over the bow, it's that end sig that he loves to use. Edge guard opportunity. Nice. And yep, Luna. Gonna be clean with it.
He knew the exact timing on that final spear recovery that came out from Impala so that he could perfectly punish it, get that KO. Luna, in true goldfish fashion, he is a full stock up, a complete 180 from last game. Yeah, this might be a whole different goldfish right now. Somebody has to check the tank, this fishbowl. That is Miami Dome, but right now Luna, he's got an extra stock to play with. As long as he doesn't throw it, could be a good game for him. Luna's like one of those goldfish that you find in like a koi pond that's like 19 pounds and like 40 years old for some strange reason. I mean, it's just, it's well loved and well yeah. taken care of. Those those yes. absolute monsters of a goldfish. Oh, oh gonna get bonked on the head with that. Does he have enough to get over? He touches! He's able to get it. That in-air drift coming from the high movement speed and a little bit of in-air movement economy still under his belt. Luna holding it. Okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> dude. He was looking like he was gonna tiptoe right <laughs> on into that, even in his Jordans. He was really playing that footsies, poking as close as he could, and he ends up getting inside. He's still alive on the second stock. He's, again, not getting the most damage with these leads that he has, but it's still enough to maintain the lead as the side air finally finishes the stock. I mean, we're seeing Luna play pretty hot right now. He was probably just a little bit too warmed up, had to get close, feel a little bit of that icy cold breeze in his face, a little bit of refreshment there for him to then come back and take this final stock from Impala. Yeah, that Kaya AC comes free of charge, but right now Luna needs to take this stock to prove that he's not free against Impala. Doesn't get the dodge read though, chases alongside it, gets a nice nair for some damage, but it's oh, not a much. lot. Wasn't a huge punish, just a quick neutral light. Luna wasn't in any major damage, so there wasn't too much that Impala could do other than just that easy neutral light that at least gets something on the table. And stick thrown out, giving more opportunities to Impala to punish. Down air doesn't hit. Unfortunately, he picked that up, or he used that too low to the ground, so it was basically into the ground. The neutral signature, that higher defense that Kaya has. She has lower strength, but she does have that higher defense, so she's able to survive that one, but not a second one. Luna is going to tie up the set. He picks up the neutral signature onto Impala, has just enough on the second one, putting out good damage on both weapons. You're not seeing him lean too heavily into one or the other. He's been starting off with the Kataras, and generally it seems like Blasters to KO, but he's also building great damage with the Blasters as well. Nice solid spread between all the weapons, even including the unarmed. 41 unarmed damage is not too shabby whatsoever. In terms of damage per engagement, these two players are almost identical. It is 26 from Luna and 25 from Impala. That's pretty close between the two of them, and of course you can kind of see that in the way that that one almost ended. Is like That definitely wasn't 1,000% a Luna game. Even though at kind of like halfway through on that second stock, it almost seemed like it was going to be. He had that full stock lead, then all of a sudden Impala turned it on and started going, brought it back even, but Luna was still too much in the end of that as we come in to this 1-1 tied set now, about to enter into game three. And we're seeing a, a lot of thought put into this one. We were sitting on the map ban for a hot minute. Luna does eventually lock in, I believe that was Apocalypse for Luna in this one instead of the small brawl haven. Now we are seeing both of these players go into the strength stance. Both of them are playing low strength legends. Impala coming in with the, uh, the default is gonna be four and the default on Lucian is gonna be three. Each of them putting an additional point into those stances. So Impala is gonna have five and Luna is going to have four. Yeah, it seems like the meta has kind of shifted away from strength. We even saw that in some of the other regions, right? We saw the Lin Faze doing really well as well. Um, definitely a lot of characters that aren't really known for having high strength. And then, of course, you throw in that Stingray on the Zul. Uh, but right now, it is all about Luna versus Impala. Luna finding some good damage with the Blasters, but it's still just trades between him and Impala. Ooh, uh, they are not doing anything for about five to ten seconds there. Just seeing who can actually throw out a move, who comes out on top in terms of the dodge circles between these two. Very safe return back to the stage from Luna. Over to the Katars, doesn't catch the movement of Impala with that Nair. Down Sig Impala dodges through it. Oh, that was enough of a stacked weapon toss that the hitbox wasn't actually active on it. Even though it looked like it was close enough to hit, it wasn't actually an active hitbox coming out, which is why it didn't make contact and interrupt Ooh. Luna. But the down sig will connect. Yeah, there's two situations where those weapon tosses will go through the opponent. It, one is when it's like the startup of the weapon toss, and two is when you get hit as that weapon connects with the opponent. A little bit of a falling nair coming out from Luna. Ooh, no big in sig. I, I wonder if that was a baiting neutral signature because it was really far away. 
to the point that Impala couldn't even actually punish it. The move that Impala threw out to punish it wasn't even close, and Luna had plenty of time to then hit a jump side air. So it could have been just used as a baiting tool from Luna, or it could have been a miss. Yeah, definitely uh, one of those things where, like, when you're the person playing, you're like, yeah, I meant to miss that because it perfectly set me up for it. But either way, we've seen uh, more than a handful of players kind of throw out those, like, high recovery move attacks just to get the opponent to come engage. Oh, I'm light. surprised that didn't hit. Yeah. Must have been just a little bit too stacked for that to make a connection. Impala. He okay. has the lead here. He's going to eat that down sig, but he doesn't have too much damage on him. Oh, he, Impala went under the stage right at that 45 degree angled wall, and Luna made his move. Yeah, he went in, tried to get more with that. You even saw that GC down light at the top, but unfortunately did not connect for Luna. He's still behind in the damage, despite the fact that he had that offstage pressure. No major edge guard. You saw it seemed like he was going to go into one, probably trying to scare Luna, but no, he actually snapped back onto the main oh. platform. That time, he goes for the ground pound, picks it up. Nice, simple, classic textbook spear edge guard. Yeah, that corner movement was tricky. It, it was a fake out. Could have been that uh, dash instant down air, or could have been that dash into the slide charge down sig. Did neither of those things, but it was really just keeping Luna on his toes. Still hits the recovery, but it's not enough. Easily picks up the weapon spawn, has the blasters. You saw, oh, he's throwing out the D-Sig now. Already thrown two of those in a row. I don't know if he's going to go for a third one. The N-Sig, while Impala was safely on the platform, he didn't fall into it, but it almost looked like Impala went for the punish, then expecting Luna to maybe jump up and be to his right, but Luna found the KO. We are basically even, not in this just this game, but also in this set. So we're tied 1-1. Impala finding the better damage here as he's about halfway through Luna's second stock. Some good juggling coming out. He's going to take a two-piece after whiffing the neutral signature on the spear. Yeah, Impala had some great juggles that built up a lot of damage onto Luna. Luna now over to the blasters, but it won't matter as Impala hits the recovery. He's up 2-1. I was a little bit surprised that that recovery KO'd there because I saw yeah. that how far that neutral air sent, and it was just, you know, he hit him with the neutral air, sent him a little bit, then all of a sudden it felt like that recovery had some real juice on it. Well, the force does end up getting applied after the damage, so maybe it just had enough damage on the tail end of it. But like you said, that Nair didn't go very yeah, far. I, I swear he could just got, like, extra launch. Yeah. <laughs> so there we go. Impala now up 2-1. It was previously tied in the set. 602 damage that game compared to Luna's 422. Impala's looking good here. It seems like he has Luna's number. Yeah, maybe uh, trying to break that winner championship curse that happens so often where somebody wins the world championship and does not win the winter championship. He's definitely trying to do it with his Kaya, uh, but he's going to have to get through Luna at least one more time. Very few people put Impala in their top three. Do you, do you know like anybody like around here who did no, that? I only know yours, mine, and Ajax. Is he's probably so. like the only one that actually did predictions. Thank you, Ajax. Yeah. You're a good guy. We love That's that. Ajax. Um, so yeah, I don't. I think very few people probably put Impala in their top three. Everyone around here are certainly all of them. Impala still hasn't made it into the top three yet. This is sort of the gate to get in. You have to beat Luna. You have to beat the gatekeeper to then move on into that top three to get that guaranteed spot at the Winter Royale, which we know every single player wants. Of course, Impala wants it. Of course, Luna wants it as well. Yeah, it's definitely interesting because again, Impala has not podiumed. If you like, if you ignored the World Championship, pretty hard to do. But if you ignored the World Championship, Impala has not podiumed in an entire year. He did not podium throughout 2022, and uh, he's poised to at least podium here at the Winter Championship after, of course, getting the gold medal at the World Championship. It is a very real possibility. The crazy thing is that in 2021. Our current world championship mm -hmm. got Three, second two, at the last one, chance four. qualifier, which means he was like second if the person person in first place was like the last seed. Yeah, he's like he got like thirty third. Yeah, so it was like everybody pr the thirty one people or thirty two people in front of him pr'd. They were already invited, so he was playing with that other group, and now he has just ascended all of a sudden in a very short period of time, essentially a year. Yeah, he's definitely leveled up since 2021 and right now Luna hoping that he'll level up in this game as he's back to the guitars but he eats the owl there is a weapon spawn on the field Luna's gonna swap that onto the blasters back over of course like you said over to Miami Dome downlight side air puts Luna off stage down air doesn't connect though 
Luna able to dodge through. He's still taking the brunt of the damage here as the recovery launches him. Doesn't quite have enough, as much force on it as it used to, so it does require a little bit more damage before that one's ready to KO. Of course, we always talk about those 45 degree angle sends are some of the hardest to KO with because that is statistically the furthest away blast zone you can possibly send to. Of course, using the neutral signature, you're gonna have some more force on that than you would on just a bow recovery, so that is going to secure that KO, absolutely. He was looking to get the dodge and then continue with like another side light, D light, recovery, or maybe neutral signature, or whatever but no luna immediately stuffed that woke up with that down light yeah really halted that momentum build that impala was getting like he got that first stock pretty quick with that end sig and he definitely had some room to get more but luna's blast just came out picked up the recovery and then picked up the end sig off that soft platform impala trying to play the range game here against luna's guitars you see him going all the way over to the left corner even putting himself back on the wall now he's starting to run over to the right side of the stage before he turns himself back on the initiation. The juggles from Impala can be so scary. Luna this time goes for the recovery, doesn't want to miss input. It's a risky option. Neutralite connects, doesn't hit the pivot nair. Impala was floating in the air just a little bit too long for that nair to actually make a connection. D-Light recovery, of course, not going to KO. It ended in orange, so there was basically no shot that was going to KO with the high strength of Kaya, the low strength, or the high defense of Kaya, the low strength of the Lucian. And even on a regular strength character, you're really not KOing if you pick up your opponent from the ground and they're only in orange. Yeah, wasn't likely to KO, but was half expecting him to go for that uh, the end sig again off a soft platform. Instead, just started finding his shots, was so accurate with his blasts, but He's got that lead, but Impala's trying to get rid of it already. He's able to get past that. Those little ice crystals not close enough to pick up Luna. They're both in the air, but they also both kind of spread out there. One went to the right soft plat, one went to the left. No DC, don't do it. Don't do it, Luna. Okay. About it. Okay. Showing doesn't patience, showing discipline so he doesn't immediately go into that. Restraint coming out from the top PR of North America. Still not a lot of offstage. He was so close to falling into those icicles. Yeah, Luna's really playing a very dangerous footsie game around a lot of Impala SIGs, right? Like, he's trying to get as close as he can. Down SIG connects, gets the weapon toss, backs away, trying to take any advantage he can without risking too much. Now, we saw that one blaster's ground pound earlier from Luna, and I'm, did he get punished for it? I'm pretty sure he did, yeah? Yeah, I'm pretty okay. sure he did. So, yeah, that's one of the reasons we haven't seen one since. Oh, actually oh, goes for the okay. ground pound there. Again, he goes for the D-Light into the recovery. Yeah, definitely remembering. Like, he flubbed twice those down-light ground pounds in his matchup against Stingray earlier today. So he's just going for the safer option. Down-Light into the recovery. But Impala gets away from that. He'll get the KO. That was a solid approach back to the stage from yeah. Impala. He, he used a, he went really, really down low in case Luna was gonna throw out any immediate punish. That gave him a lot of space. Then he also threw that spear up, which is a big weapon to toss. So it covers a long left to right area, giving him like a force field that Luna would have to dodge through and then burn his dodge in order to get down and actually punish Impala's recovery back to the wall to reset the jumps. Impala here, he's being careful. Luna's not putting too much pressure out on him. Really trying to push forward. Down light, side air, and Luna will tie it up 2-2. Game five coming up for these two players. The current world champion against the player that many people thought could be the world champion of 2022. We're at a game five situation here for our top Three. The winner moves on into that top three, guarantees their spot at the Winter Royale in March. The loser isn't going to make it. They got to watch from home. And it's honestly heartbreaking either way, right? Kind of like a similar storyline to uh, in EU, right? It was like that conversation of like, will it be, I think, Godly and Akno fighting to get into the Royale? Same thing here. Like, imagine a Royale. Imagine the first offline invitational not having the world champion or not having the top PR in North America, it's going to be a heartbreaker regardless of the way this one ends. Now, my question is, if Impala moves on past this, of course, that'll give us the world champion in our top three, which means top uh, world champion at the Winter Royale. Would that change up the PR? Because Luna's top PR, like you've said, would that be enough to shift those two positions and give Impala that? That would be crazy if Impala came in and stole PR. PR1 off of 
two tournaments. I mean, he skyrocketed in PR. He was what, like PR 14 at the World Championship? He just wins one tournament and becomes PR number two in a region. Absolutely ridiculous. Now the fall off on PR points isn't that brutal from one tournament to the next, so it still may not happen, even if Impala gets first and Luna ends up getting fourth in this tournament. But we still have yet to see who will continue on. Right now, Impala on the Kaya. Luna still with the Lucy and doesn't hit the down air. He's hit so many down light down airs against earlier opponents, but not here against Impala. Oh, Luna was floating so much. He already burned that dodge. Impala came in with the recovery, now sending Luna over to the wall, using the neutral air like a force field. That is what you should do on the edge if you are a Blasters player. It's a very safe move to throw out when you're on the wall and your opponent is above you. Yeah, got to protect yourself with those snares. You're going to see him chase dodge up as well. Wants that verticality, but Impala gets a nice three-piece Sair down light into the recovery, launching Luna. Luna from below, back to the Blasters. They are trading damage, but Impala with the GC catches Luna's hat. You saw both of them spot dodging at exactly the same time, but Impala canceled his spot dodge into an actual move. Anything that Luna would have thrown out there either wouldn't have came out in time if it was going to hit or wasn't going to hit because of where Impala was above Luna. Beautiful pick up there on that side signature. With the side air. Weapon toss oh. from Impala stops the edge guard. Luna back onto the stage. Doesn't get the read. Over to the blasters. Is he in downlight recovery territory, Sparky? Uh, ooh, that's a really good question. I'm going to say no. I would love to see a pickup without getting another hit, though, just so we can uh, truly see. Please do it. That would be hype. Okay, just a side air, though. Okay, I'm willing to think, based on how far that side air sent, that we probably were in delight recovery territory. Definitely possible. Oh, but he needs to get a hit right now. Impala's finding so many connections against Luna on the second stock. He's just building a bigger and bigger lead. Impala what's, goes real what's, what's going low. on here? What's going on here? Man, this you can Bro, see he's scared of it. You can see the fear in his eyes from not wanting to go for that D-Light ground pound. Because like the D-Light recovery there, many other players are not going for that. But Luna is so scared of dropping that combo that he's gonna wait and wait and wait and have to do more and more and more damage to find the KO with the side signature. I'm thinking if it continues the way it has been, Luna's damage numbers are gonna be so high because it's taking so much damage for him to finally get these stocks. Yeah, I mean, like that's that's gotta be a mental block at the very least from Luna. He knows how much is on the line here. Again, game five situation against the current world champion battling for that spot in the Royale and he does not want to mess up against him. Avoids the down air edge guard opportunity. We haven't seen any big edge guards either way, but there's the icicles. He hasn't fallen into too many of those, but one of the ones he does fall into is giving Impala almost a full stock lead in game five. There's the D-Light side air. Impala recovering high. No major punish coming out from Luna yet, but he does pick up the D-Light recovery. Even that sent further than I would have expected. Impala being in the orange. He should be in the red very soon, maybe on next hit. Luna picking and choosing. Doesn't throw out too many attacks here. Impala gets in, doesn't hit the down light. Luna wants the stock, doesn't find the positioning for the recovery. You saw him neutral jump. We have Impala in the red on the edge. Oh, again, the side light, but a quick turnaround d to get him back on the stage. There's the side signature. That was pretty solid efficiency on that KO. That side light on the blasters was what actually put Impala into the red, and then it was like one or two more hits, side sig done. Yo, the hope is real, the potential is real. Both of them basically even in damage. A little bit bigger of a circle on the side of Impala, though, with those spear nares, he hits the neutral light. I just think Impala has too much momentum. I think the fear of Luna not being able to pick up the D-Light uh, ground pound unarmed is also going to extend the pressure with the situation that we find ourselves in. Luna is so far behind in the red. Game five for a top three finish. He's finding some damage here, but still, he only has Impala in the yellow. He's retreating to the soft platform, putting a lot of space between him and Impala, and now he's starting to take some more damage. Stays low. Didn't panic into the owl, though. Impala got away from the dodge read from Luna. The damage still in favor of Impala. Luna stuck on these Katars. Hits another recovery. What was the down sig for? Maybe it was just, uh, it could have been fear for either player. Big side air. Is he going to disarm himself? By throwing, are you kidding me? Could he get the victory oh! off of this? I wish that would have hit just to see what he was going to go for. But he's back to the Katars. The oh, down no. sig misses. Luna's got to be careful. 
That bounce off Deep the stage. Red. It's sending Impala off screen. He's still going for these D-lights. Avoids the owl. Impala's disarmed. He's got Luna's hit got everything, but he goes so low. It's a spear. Oh, this is scary. It's a side oh! air. And Luna holds on. 3-2. The world champion is not coming to the Royale. And you see it reflected in the damage numbers. Even though his second stock was very efficient, 637 damage. That is over 200 per stock. That is like 212 damage per stock. What a nail biter. Deep red, last stock each side. Luna was hitting not enough Qatar stuff, but he does find the side air that he needs. And Man, he closed that one out, but he's he's not done. This is not a sigh of relief situation. It's now a sigh of, uh-oh, I have to go against the guy who knocked me here into the elimination side of the bracket. Yeah, it's one of those where you go, whew. Uh-oh, he's right behind me, isn't he? Yeah. And then he, and then he, he turns around, and it is, uh, it's going to end up being Stingray, who is right behind him there to just tap him on the shoulder when he's in the, like, big Orion that is, like, <laughs> way bigger than the, than the screen. Or it's here. the big old Zol with the axe that crosses 50% <laughs> of the screen. Stingray just playing big characters <laughs> on the screen. Production is going to have to, like, change things specifically because of Stingray. But you see it right behind us. Luna is the winner for... For that game, Impala is going to finish in fourth place. Still solid, of course. We talk about Impala not podiuming until the actual Brawlhalla World Championship. So it's definitely not what he wants because he's denied the Royale. He's denied the podium. He had the World Champion gold medal around his neck, and he wasn't able to repeat that. But maybe we're going to get some, like, sage advice from, like, all of the other world champions that haven't done <laughs> the past that. past avatars. Yeah, like, they're, they're going to get in the group, in they're gonna get in the like, group chat, and they're going to be like, hey, man. It's, none of us won winner we've championship all been either. There. <laughs> we've all been there, brother. It's okay. It's it's the world champion into not winter champion yeah. support advocacy rights group. Yeah, it's a, it's a real tough. I mean, it's not even that large of a group, yeah. but it's definitely a tough group to be in. And, of course, Impala, he's, he's, he's also alongside them because he is uh, – uh, he's done for today. Yeah, it's like Sandstorm. It's like, I don't know if we're going to count onlines or not. I'm just I gonna, think we are. I'm going to throw like Pavelski in yeah. there and then and then M M Impala, of course. So, yeah, definitely a tough finish for Impala, uh, but a great finish for Luna. Uh, like you said, it was a nail biter. So, I think every game after this, of course, if Luna continues on, is going to be really tough. We saw a lot of great stuff from the Lucian. If he doesn't figure out D-Light Ground Pound this tournament, we better see him putting some serious time in the lab to pick those up. Because we've seen it this weekend. We've seen it through all of Brawlhalla's history. D-Light Ground Pound unarmed is a very important skill that every top player should, and pretty much every top player does, have in their toolkit. Luna needs to have that in his toolkit. Well, we'll see what else he might need or what else he did have inside of his toolkit. And uh, I think Remy is going to be really good at explaining it. Take it away, Remy. Now, that was a matchup where the stats kind of fell in line with that high defense, high speed, low force between the two legends. And you also were put in a situation where, okay, your KOs matter. And when you can get them, they matter so much. Because we saw at the end of that set how Impala ended up having a lead while in the white to red and ended up losing it because he couldn't find the KO. He couldn't find the correct moves to do so. So I'm going to start us off here by looking at the map bands, what they mean for both sides and how that's going to work. Because we have Brawl Haven left open here. We have the Spirit Temple left open here. And we have that, uh, the final one with the Fortress of Lions left open as well. And with Blasters, you're going to need to find that downlight recovery KO, that Ser KO. And if you're playing Lucian with that three fourths, those high ceilings, those high, uh, those far side boxes are going to be treacherous for you. That's why you saw Luna when it was his strike, always leaving open that Miami Dome, and that's where they ended up uh, getting most of their wins till that tail end. We saw Luna; most of his leads were when he was on Miami Dome, and we have some clips of that here uh, of what he could do when you gave him that chance with the smaller ceilings, with those with those close in areas. Luna going for that downlight off stage, as we mentioned a lot, wasn't able to go for the ground pound, didn't want to go for it. Patience on the stage was beautiful. And we just get to see him carry off Impala with the side airs rather than 
having to go into that deep red. Look at Decider here, middle of the stage, he can get his KO. And Paula, same thing, if he has that low force, you want those bigger maps. He saw that it was a bigger issue for Luna than himself. That's why you saw him on the Fighters of Forces Alliance in the last game. It didn't end up going as he planned though, because at the end of it all, he couldn't find that KO. Look at that health advantage. Look at what Luna is able to do with all the stage he has, all the room he has, getting the double end lights on Katars. And Paula, he finds a neutral uh, in, a, in the scene right here after this punish, but he's not able to do it. He's not able to capitalize off it because of such a high ceiling. It gives Luna just that time he needs to get back in there, to get back into that top three position and to get out to the Royale. And I can't wait to see what he does with that Lucian coming up. The well, NFL has Tony Romo okay. as a commentator and analysis for oh. a 10 year, $180 million deal. Uh -huh. The amazing thing is we got Remy for half that. Yeah. Half that price and we get generous. way better commentary, way better analysis than Tony Romo. Yeah. Uh, and he's also got the same uh, tools uh, with the whole like drawing yeah. on screens. But uh, we're going to take a short little break, give a little breather to everyone at home, give you some time to pick up that Brahalla Winter merch. But when we come back, of course, we'll be bringing you the top three of the Winter Championship North American singles. Stick around. yourselves outside of town but you sense danger it's the dark warlock Volkov. a hero must rise up to meet this challenge who could it be i will face this foe the great jay young the hero blades levels up and unlocks new rewards but the hero cannot defeat Volkov alone. I call upon my team of great adventurers. Sidra, the beast master. Hugin, the bard. And Kaya, the cleric. They'll need items and familiars to succeed against the great Volkov. Now that the heroes are ready for battle, it's time to roll for initiative. And now the battle begins. Are you ready? Three, two, one, roll! Adventure awaits in Brawlhalla's Battle Pass Season 7. It's all fun and games until someone rolls a one. We're now down to the top three of things, of course. Luna just defeating the world champion moments ago. Three to two. Impala is done for the day. The world championship curse continues as no, or only one, I think, world champion has ever gotten a winter championship afterwards, if I remember correctly. It's all easy. Yeah. But for now, uh, the curse continues, and we've now got our top three. The last person to earn their spot in the Royale as well is going to be Luna. 
That is our top three. You said Luna, then Stingray. That's going to be our elimination finals match. The winner of that will move up to fight the other player coming to the Royale, which is, of course, Radish, who we saw make it into the grand finals via Stingray earlier. But let's see what the viewers have to say about this upcoming match. Stingray versus Luna. I was a little bit critical of this when they first fought in the winner's semi earlier today because people were leaning on the Stingray. But given what's happened today, I don't blame them. Stingray did end up closing it out over Luna earlier today. Now, in terms of the record between these two players, it is heavily favoring Luna to the tune of three sets to zero. One. In fit, what? Today. That's true. Yeah. The database hasn't updated yeah. yet. See? You talk about how you don't remember things. You remember things? Don't talk about yourself Sometimes like that. Sometimes I just that. say things. Don't do that negative self-talk. Yeah. Talk about You're better than that. the positives. And we're going to be getting into this game very soon. Oh, you are going to be excited by Let's this go. one. Is that guy? It's, it's, it's Roman Reigns. It's Roman Reigns. Dude, why is Brent is so much like he? I, I know he's doing like a knee. I don't know. I'm exactly sorry, what he's Roman. Doing. Uh, you. He's uh, bound to the queen. Her eyes are up there. He's bound sir. to Queen Brynn. He's showing her, her respect. Her eyes are higher. Okay. Uh, no, he's doing the thing like he's like he when he enters the uh, the ring he like he's does doing like the, the, like, the super he does like the hand yeah. thing and bah. but either way, uh, Luna he's back to the classics he's going to the Taros again on the other side Stingray is starting it off with the Brin that's what he did against Luna earlier today, but he switched over to the Zol. Uh, after game number one, so this is an interesting matchup because it's going to be Axe versus Axe. Have we seen that today? <laughs> I mean, so far, the only axe we've seen today has been Stingray. Yeah, so, so. That, that answers that <laughs> question right there. Uh, no, this is the first time we're seeing two axe players. And uh, that's going to be an interesting change of pace. I don't think we've hardly seen any axe versus axe in any of the regions whatsoever. Nope. Didn't go for the follow-up there off the Russian Mafia, though. Uh, but yeah, we haven't seen too much axe overall. Like, it's really been uh, few and far between from the players in any region. Uh, that had to have been a misinformation. Yeah. There's the, no like the way he would way. do that the other direction because there is no world where Luna can physically make it over there as a legend. Oh, but he might be able to make it over to Stingray. A Stingray out on the outside. Ground Pound does not land, doesn't need to, though. And Luna will have that stock advantage. A lot of it off the back of the hammer, though. It's hammer season, baby. Remy said it. Remy tells no lies. We know that. Yeah, I mean, Brahala's Tony Romo is definitely... Uh, an expert in his field. Did Tony Romo ever win a Super Bowl? I, I, I'll let you figure that one out. As Stingray figures out how to hit the end light, gets the KO, and no. evens it up immediately. Remy is better than Tony Romo because Tony Big Romo facts. has never won a Super Bowl. He has zero rings, and that cannot be said about Remy. Because he's, he's won a 2v2 World Champion. Yes, sir. All right, weapon toss from Luna. Opens up Stingray. Nice falling side air as well. On the other side, Stingray Pogo is back. Generally, I really like the Spear into the Hammer matchup. Spear's got a lot of control. It's got a lot of good things going for it against Hammer, especially in the grounded, like, uh, 1v1. But right now, Luna's looking pretty solid. It's so funny to see how far back Stingray is playing. Because, like, when he was playing against Radish previously, he was playing really far back from the neutral signature. But, like, now he was playing essentially right in the middle of the stage. That's how much space he was giving Luna. When, like, what what can he really do? Like, he has the gravity cancel neutral signature, yeah. which is going to be, like, similar. It probably doesn't even have as much range as the it's Petra smaller neutral hitbox. signature. But uh, you know what? Maybe it's just the respect to the classics, right? This is, again, the OG Luna pick, the original thing that won him so Ooh, long ago. Oh, that was nice. Doesn't hit the down Dude. light. I'm, I'm so excited to see the next GC down light that yeah. he hits. I really want to know what option he goes for. He did tweet out not long ago that, like, now that he's in the top three, he's in his element. It's no longer trolling season, and uh, he's really got to bring his A game. But right now, he's got to get through Stingray, which, again, Stingray's the person who knocked him down here into the elimination bracket. We do have that proper Axe v. Axe matchup here. Luna over on the edge. He gets back up really quickly, but Stingray immediately punishes it with the neutral light. Luna goes back down again. The neutral light, and Luna goes back down. Same thing. Ooh, no, it's a side air this time, mixing it up. But that's one thing that works really well for Stingray is like with this high mobility Brin. Again, coming in base seven movement speed, likely on the six because the stances doesn't matter as it gets a down light side air. But because of that movement speed, he can go from the middle to the outside really quick. Dude, Luna was lost yeah. at the end of that game. He just kept trying to go up 
and Stingray kept kicking him back down. It was a neutral light, sent him back down. It was a neutral light, sent him back down. It was a falling side air, sent him back down. Then it was the spear neutral light, sent him back down. Then it was a pickup. See, here comes the D-Light pickup. He goes to like almost the same spot. D-Light side air, easy cleanup for Stingray there, who took very little damage on that final stock because most of it, Luna was just stuck on the wall. Yeah, and now the question is, what's Luna going to play? He played Lucian throughout most of today, but he's also played the Caspian today. He also played the Mordex, or the Tai Lung, in his earlier matchup against Stingray. But ultimately, Stingray was the one who ended up victorious, and uh, fortunately, the fallback plan of the, uh, the, <laughs> the Taros did not work out. Do you think we see a swap right away? I don't know. Honestly, with the way that he played the matchup against Impala, where he didn't change at all in the Lucian, I kind of feel like he won't. I kind of feel like he's just going to, like, try to fight through with what he's got. We're currently on the map bans, but until I see him ban a map, I won't actually know what he picks. Well, Unless we have a quick uh, view of the graph okay. behind us. Maybe we can get a little quick one of this. They cheated. Look at that right there. Look at that. That's very, very steep towards the end. And then you can see this right here. This what? is where Stingray was just on the edge, sitting there. It was Neutral Light City. He's not taking any damage. All of this damage is the Neutral Light, the Neutral Light, the Falling Side Air, the Neutral Light, the D-Light Side Air, and then the KO. Thanks for the view on the graph. I appreciate that. I tried to get out of the way. I tried to be uh, a good... Good uh, person. Yeah, you, you're a good teammate up yeah. here on the desk. And we are going to have a legend swap yep. from Luna. It's going to be not the Lucian, but another legend he has played today. And another legend we've seen him play a lot of going over to the Tai Long Mordex. It's an interesting pick. It Again, it worked really well for a game in the winner's semifinal where he was able to get game number one. But once Stingray started playing more of that axe, once he started switching over to the Zol where he was getting a lot of damage per hit, then the, the Tylon kind of started to fall apart and already we're seeing some trouble here against Stingray. Incredible spear play already coming out. Throwing out that D-Sig, but Luna's not able to land any move because he was stuck on that soft platform. Okay, Nairs and Sayers getting some good damage put out from Luna. Backs away once he started running out of movement there. So what we saw from the uh, Taros last game on Luna is we didn't see any major string potential, which like the best hammer players in the world, they're really good at finding those hammer strings or they're good at finding those regular three piece or even just two piece, but all the time on the ax. He wasn't able to find either of those. We already do see Scythe momentum coming out. And actually after that initial flurry from Stingray, Luna has taken back the lead and definitely done that after he picks up the first stock. Yeah, and a great weapon toss follows the uh, trajectory of that gauntlet side air to take out Stingray's first stock. Now, looks like a little bit more gauntlet play is going to be coming out from Luna. He definitely was leaning on the scythe in his winner semi-match. Reaching up on that soft platform with a neutral air. There we see a side light. One of the few that we've seen today from a gauntlet player. That recovery got Stingray back to the stage. It didn't end up hitting Luna because Luna was too far away, but as Luna moved left over near that wall and up to recover on the main stage, the turnaround side air from Stingray makes the connection and gets the stock. Yo, but Stingray is doing a very similar thing to what he did in the last game, where he just kind of walls out Luna. This time it was with the Spear Nairs, but Luna hits the side sig, connects onto Stingray, and now he is up big. That was hugely early. He picked that one up in orange onto Stingray. That's given Luna a massive lead. D-Light into the turnaround side air from Stingray. A little bit of an interesting choice on that one. Not sure if he was just trying to like fade away to do something else and held that right direction a little bit too long. Whoa, Whoa the weird scoop reaching down, bouncing Luna off the stage. Going back to that downlight side air though, I think it was just he wanted the stage control so he could get that weapon. The weapon okay. spawn was on the left, so he was trying to shove Luna away. That makes sense. But uh, edge guard opportunity from Stingray did not convert to more. Luna swinging back, trying to hit some damage, try to get that extra credit. Now, one thing that we saw from gauntlet players in other regions, uh, I believe I was doing commentary with Taza, and we were noticing that, or maybe it was Remy, it, we were noticing that it was a lot of uh, GCD lights on the gauntlet player as the starter move, which would lead into a recovery as the KO move. That is just simply nope. gone from okay. North America and all of the gauntlet players we've seen today. Goes for the side light into the recovery. He knew he could hit that easy because the dodge was burned on the D-Sig. Yeah, and we also got to see that GC down light. That time it wasn't really in a position where the uh, ground pound would have made sense. So, of course, he went for the recovery. And then that side light recovery, like you said, there was a burn dodge from Stingray. So that was 100% guaranteed KO. Here's that goosey that so cool. down-sig that kind of bounced him off the wall. I, I wonder, like... Does, does he know? 
that that was supposed to happen? Like, is that, is, is that <laughs> on purpose? Gonna, does he know? Yeah, like, it, it, was that was that on purpose? Was he like, I'm going to throw this down, that's going to bounce him off the wall, do a bunch of damage, and send him flying to the right? Or was he trying to, like, scoop him back onto the stage? I, I want to say that he was likely trying to scoop back. But either way, he is scooping back to that guy. Cool. Yeah. We're going to get some Zol gameplay here. We're going to get some solid axe against this Tai Lung from Luna. Yep, completely tied up. Luna was definitely looking really good in that last game against Stingray's Brin. But again, looking like a repeat of what happened in the winner's semifinal. It's a nice little wait there. It didn't actually end in success with the recovery hitting, but it was like, it was neutral air and then the side air and then a neutral air and then a wait and then the recovery. Oh, he is definitely finding some hits onto Stingray though, but Stingray is hitting Bigger disarmed Luna down like ground. He did, it. he did it! Goes for another one, but Stingray's below it. It wasn't a GC. No. So he still could be terrorized <laughs> or terrified to do that on the edge. But he at least did a D-Light ground pound. That's step one. Well, step one was like admitting that you have a problem, and that's why he swapped over to the D-Light recovery. Uh, step two, I don't know all the steps of the 12-step program. But uh, step two is like just starting, I guess, to, to do it uh, on the stage. Sure. Right now, doing a lot of stuff on the stage, but okay. Stingray does hit that down light side air. Again, just trying to keep Luna away so we can get that safe weapon pick up. But Luna just moving him around. That's one thing that uh, Scythe really gives players is control of where the opponent's going to be. After we saw that GCD light into the turnaround side air, I think you're exactly right. You're 100% right when you explained that earlier. It was definitely on purpose, not a miss input. Luna going to take that one. You can see a little bit of a signature as a taunt there. Feeling some confidence here in this game as he's almost a full stock up. He's going to be going into Stingray's Cannon with his gauntlets. Nice little two-piece. Oh, three-piece, oh. four-piece. Oh. Oh. Almost hit, hit like the Got classic done. string that gauntlet players love to use to carry their team or their opponents off the stage. Do it again, though. He's got the opportunity, doesn't get the dodge this time. Stingray trying to bring out the classic of the cannon. Oh. Gonna go for it again, and he'll get it with the side air. Last stocks here in game number three. Luna was playing a little bit too high there. He didn't recover low like a lot of players might have done. He didn't recover high either. He was just like right at stage level, and that gave Stingray the perfect opportunity to run up and get the KO. Man, I was gonna say earlier that we're seeing a lot more swagger on the gauntlets from Luna, but now we're also seeing a lot more swagger as well on the cannon from Stingray. So sort of the two quote unquote off weapons for both of these players are really leveling up this game and looking good. Yeah, they're definitely, got, they've, they're definitely bringing out the entirety of their character kits. You're seeing the chase and Luna burns it all to get the recovery and he will find it as he puts himself up to one. The swap over to Tai Lung, or entering this in this string, set man. with the Tai Lung. Beautiful. Oh. Oh. There's the side air. It didn't send over the corner. It bounced off the stage. He must have used that ground pound to, I guess, get back to stage really quickly. He probably could have done the same thing with a fast fall. I mean, look the, at that string. You can't even see it. It's, it <laughs> it's, we're not, we're not, it's brutal. It's too brutal. It's not fit for <laughs> twitch.tv. Well, here's, here's, a, here's an, a, another look of a part of it. There you go. The side light side air. Man, I like revisiting that gauntlet string, though. Like, one thing that was huge was, A, it bounced him around, didn't let him touch the stage at all. Oh. I know you, just, I know yep. you see what I see. We're getting to see uh, this in super slow-mo. But we're also seeing a character swap from Stingray. This is like one of his top three legends, which I'm like always surprised to see. Not necessarily because like it's a weird pick, because like we know he does Lance. That's mm -hmm. a super normal thing for Stingray. But that we just like don't see it in tournament very often. The fact that it's like a top three legend for Stingray is always a little bit surprising when we see it come out. So now you've had your Taros representation. I've had my Vrax representation. So the desk is feeling good. We are eating today, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I mean, it's always nice when you get to uh, see your pick. And of course, now we get to uh, go full bias mode nice. and pick our players. But Stingray hits the side sig. Luna, bounced by the weapon toss, needs to find more hits. One thing that Vrax brings to the table beyond the weapon kit is that high dexterity. He's going to be able to swing a lot and be pretty safe with it. He also brings really good signatures to the table. The signatures being the only way that I was ever able to beat Java in the money <laughs> match that he and I both had is how cheesy that D-Sig can be. Oh, yes, sir. We are feeling good as we see Stingray using that high dexterity to his favor. Oh, edge guard opportunity. 
Yup. There's the end. Sig catches Luna out of the sky. He's got to respect all these options from Stingray. He's covering himself so well, too. He'll go for those end sigs, and then if you get too close, down light comes out. We just need Stingray to go like full grime time and hit Insig into GC Insig. That's like the most disrespectful thing I feel like I've ever done. And I love going for it. It used to be like an insane amount of damage. Now it's just a really good amount of damage. Right now, Luna needs a really great amount of damage. He is three stocks behind, or, uh, well, <laughs> Stingray has three stocks to the one of Luna. Sidelight not even gonna put him off screen. Let's see what the blasters are here. This has been dominated by Stingray's Lance. Nice Nair again, seeing blasters players using neutral airs on the edge. You at home, that is something you should be doing if you are not as a blasters player. Nair hits, doesn't hit the down light, still denying the weapon pickup. Nairs and Sayers doesn't read with the side sig and Stingray gets past, he'll have that Lance again. This was so devastating, the first two stocks of Luna. Okay, Luna's starting to find some momentum in his favor. Ooh, he tried to extend that combo, or at that point, once he, he threw out the side signature, it became a string after he hit the combo of the side light into the neutral air. Trying to get back on stage, Luna is not letting him. Recovery will bounce him, and he doesn't have the movement. Last stocks here for both players. This will determine whether or not Luna goes into the grand finals or Stingray brings us to game five. So the high dexterity on Brax means he has to have a pretty low stat in there. He's going to have a pretty low strength, and he's also going to have lower defense. The default is going Whoa. to have four, but it doesn't matter. Ends up taking off the top Stingray with a great character swap at exactly the right time. Going to take that game, and we're going to game five. And Luna, no thoughts of a character swap or anything of the sort. He's going right on in to game number five. I, I I just kind of think back to like the last time I saw Lord Brax. I want to say it was like Cody Travis when he would honestly, play it against like it, Sandstorm. It might have been Stingray is the last one. And yeah. I'm honestly wondering if he's going to swap Legends off of this because we have seen him do that before, even on win, that maybe the Brax game was a little bit too close for him or maybe he's like, I'm going to switch this up now and then I'm going to go back to something different. Turns out, no, we are getting yet another Brax game and we do love seeing that. But yeah, it, it might have been Cody. I don't know between these two players whether it was Cody or Stingray. It's definitely a hot, it's been, definitely been a hot minute. But again, it's kind of that narrative that we've been seeing throughout the weekend, which is that like strength and defense, maybe not as valuable of stats as we're used to believing. Especially since we're like not in that heavy weapon meta, or at least so far this year, we're not in that heavy weapon meta anymore. I mean, even when Luna played double heavy weapons, got off of that really, really quick oh. over to a non-heavy weapon. Oh my goodness. Luna is the leader of Miami Dome right now, still in yellow, 30 seconds into the game, and he takes Stingray's first stock. Yeah, he uh, definitely learned a lot between those first two stocks and the last one because he was playing so much better in that final stock, and he just took all that information here into game number five against Stingray. Back to the gauntlets against the blasters of Stingray, but there's that down zig. That was a bold move. Going to get punished for that one while he's already hugely behind. Even if he hit that Whoa. side signature, nice dodge to get away. Well, not actually the dodge move, but his movement worked in and of itself as a dodge to get away from that. Yeah, he managed to get underneath it, managed to avoid it. Nice. Luna tries to track the movement, but Stingray with the raw side sig. His side sigs on the Lance have been very effective. That move is so good. That move is insanely good. It is very, very, very good. I cannot overstate how good that move is in Brax's kit. Nice little D-Light into the neutral light. Okay, finding some good momentum, fighting his way back into this. He is not in the red yet. Sayer doesn't hit for Luna. Nair hits for Stingray. Luna struggling yes, to find hits. Yes, it's sir. the down sig. GCD sig right there is so good. I love using that one to just scroink a stock from my opponent when they are in the orange. Showing that Stingray definitely has this character in the pocket. It is one of his three most played legends. Nair doesn't hit. This time it will. Needs to continue the edge guard for the nice. turnaround. Nice. Stingray. He no way, no way, no way. Luna's oh, done! Oh, Stingray closes God. it out! 3-2 with the Lord Brax! That was so gross! Oh my gosh! Stingray with the disgusting Lance Edgeguard. We have not seen too many Edgeguards 
from really either of these players. And now they're both going to engage in one off screen. Luna's off, almost off screen. There we go. Luna's off screen. They're both off screen. Dodging back on down air. Recovery to bounce off the bottom of the stage. I mean, Stingray had to charge that up regardless, and he's just going to ground pound. Didn't even need to hit it, but it was there nonetheless. Stingray, what a huge way to close that out. Luna is not going to be happy after that. Got to believe he is not too satisfied with that third place finish, and especially finishing it in that way. He's got to be replaying not only just those final moments where he kind of made a couple of missteps there on the edge guard, but even like going back to his earlier match, right? If he had successfully hit a down like ground pound, would have been a completely different tournament run. Wow, what a finish. All of a sudden, that massive explosion that came out from Stingray at the end to close that one out, huge clutch moment where he could have just lost that stock and thrown away a good chunk of that lead that he had. Huge risk, even bigger reward. Great investment there coming out from Stingray. Yeah, I mean, some amazing play in it. A good decision, again, like you said, to swap on over to that Lord Vrax in those final moments. It felt like it came from nowhere, and yet it worked so incredibly well. Uh, put Can you put a graph here, please? Any graph or, like, the last Well, game? you know, probably the most recent one. I would love to look at it for just a moment. Okay. Let's look at these big flat lines. Now, some of that is, like, there's respawn time in there, but there's just, like, no damage being engaged right here. And then look. Oh, my goodness. But look at this guy right here. This is, like, one. This is probably, like, a weapon toss. Yeah. Maybe. Or maybe, maybe just, like, an unarmed hit. You see part of beautiful steepness right there on that one also the beginning of this stock beautiful steepness beautiful steepness beautiful steepness and then absolutely nothing so we see long periods actually really for for both players here where there was just no damage being taken and a lot of damage being dealt in the process well of course we got your analysis on the graph let's see some analysis on the gameplay remy take it away we we started this off with the old school picks. We had the Brin, we had the Taros, and the Lord Vrax came through at the end, revolutionized it. I know Sparky loved to see that. Maybe he picked up a thing or two, can get out of Platinum Elo. Not too hopeful. It's fine. He's a caster. Uh, the other, the other uh, parts of this I want to look at are the neutral gameplay from Stingray. It would start off really interesting, even from this play right here. We're going to take a couple of a uh, couple looks at a couple different clips. So sit back and enjoy. Stingray in this play right here just brought it out. It was kind of hilarious to watch how he played it. Just kind of holding the edge here the entire time. Uh, we started it off with the end light. He backs up, gets stage again. Luna says he wants to come back. He end lights him again. And naturally, a Taros player, your head is usually empty. So you're just going to get Sarah again as you move back onto the stage. He switches the weapons, but the play style hasn't stopped. We see him just completely stop Luna from ever making it past this point really with another end light to come out. It was really beautiful watching him work there and he mixes it up very quickly at the end. Luna says, okay, fine, I can't make it on directly like that. Let's go high and the spear down light there comes out. You always kind of just like look at Stingray and you're like, okay, there are just moments where he takes over. It's back and forth for a while and then he just breaks it open. He says, all right, I'm gonna make a big play here. I don't really like going back and forth. I'm gonna end up just taking your stock and it just works out so well. Another nice KO here. Not too much to talk about with that clip, but the Lord Vax came out and this is what we wanna look at. We wanna look at these big momentum shifts. Luna winning this interaction here. Anyway, that's expert. Gets that side light in there, gets the down light and the side sig comes out for a big punish. Of course, doesn't take that KO off, but with the Orion expertise, bringing that over to Lord Vax, fixing your signatures into your kit, like the caster said, he that high level he knows when to put the sigs into the light attack and it looks very very good when he does it the end sig comes out that's going to be a lot of damage the down sigs are i mean the down lights are coming out the side light nares are still coming out luna can't find the footing to punish it because of the high decks and the signatures are still being mixed into that interwoven into that kit and but he knows when to do it the side sig comes out again getting him that two stock lead and when it matters most when he's so very behind that flow state again. His clan was named flow state a while ago. I don't know if it still is, but it's that moment like this where you can get that side light there, down light, I mean down air, get the combo going, push it towards the end, and then once again, close it off with what are we expecting? The nair, the, the recovery comes out, 
the signature at the end woven into the kit it's weapon mastery it's character mastery he looks so good that's why he's in grand finals that's why he's stingray that's why he's him and he's gonna show you what's up he's him he says as uh stingray has earned his victory over luna and will continue into the grand finals for the rematch against radish now the last time these two players fought Started off with the Bryn, and that was a game one victory for Stingray. Then game two and three, also on Bryn, were losses to Radish's Petra. Then game four, we saw an Orion swap, a victory for Stingray. Then game five, of course, went over to Radish, securing that with a 3-2 victory over that Orion pick. What is Stingray going to choose for this? The viewers have made their choice, and they have Radish winning 52% to 48%. Definitely narrow margins, though. That's Absolutely. within like a plus or minus 5% where you're like, you know what? It really could go either direction. Somebody may be putting a lot more confidence one way or the other. And then you're seeing it already shifted 49 to 51%. But the thing that makes it really hard for the Stingray believers out there is that he's got to win two best of fives. One thing that's nice. He's sticking with the Lord Rex. He's going to be feeling the quickness. He's going to be feeling all the damage he can put out at a rapid pace. He's going to be feeling that wonderful signature kit. That's something he, we've seen from a bunch of different legends today. Not necessarily the Zul, but of course we saw it from the Orion. We saw a little bit less of it from the Bryn, but still had very potent signature usage. Of course, we see a lot of it from the Vrax. Starting this one out with the Blasters here against Radish's Gauntlets. Radish waiting out that down signature. Another situation where somebody can kind of keep Radish on those corners. Ensig doesn't hit the second one. Stingray not able to punish with that dodge down there. But he's definitely playing this Blasters game right now. You see the weapon spot on the right side, and he is not making any moves to go over there and pick up a Lance. So other than Stingray's Lance, Radish hasn't really fought against Blasters today, unless it was like really, 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 really early in the tournament. Mm -hmm. He hasn't fought against Blasters, and other than Stingray, he hasn't fought against Lance, except for that Orion that we saw earlier. So we'll see how he does against the Blasters. We know he beat the Orion Lance. Will he also have as equal success or better against the Raxlance, man, that's tough to see that. I believe it turned him red, the final pieces of it. Neutral Sig, still not gonna KO. They took that force away from us. <laughs> Look, Rax players, rise up. That's what they took from us. Rax players crying out in unison alongside Sparky. It does definitely have less variable force than a lot of the other Lance signatures on the Vrax, but conversely, it has the most damage of the Vrax Lance signatures. And of course, it's it's going at that weird angle where it's a lot harder to KO. He's still got that downsick fantastic for KOing, and he's already made sure that the damage between the two of them is basically even. They even took some of the damage from us on that too. That thing used to do like 37 damage, which of course uh, had no business doing that. Stingray, there he goes, picks up the side sig, not quite enough. Even though Radish is in orange, that almost was enough. Oh, turn Tries around. To, okay, you're right, you called the turnaround. Radish got it and got the KO. I was almost critical of that decision to go in with the down air. I would have believed that a side air was the better angle of direction, but he definitely had the better positioning, so it ended up working out. Now he's going to go for the edge guard against Stingray. Hits the ground pound. Stingray does manage to get back to the wall. He's going to reset to neutral, and he gets the end. Sig keeps this one close. So you saw him disengage from that off uh, stage edge guard didn't want to do that whatsoever he had that one good one against luna but he's not going to get too cocky on it he knows he has lance which it does not have the best edge guard game in brawlhalla especially when you're against an orb or you're going to be against gauntlet so he got out of there pretty quickly yeah got out of dodge made sure not to risk too much there but radish isn't finding the hits with this orb. Likely going to be looking for more side airs again. He was so effective with those side light side airs, and that's going to be another one to give Radish game number one. I do like what we saw from Stingray right before he got punished for it. He threw out that down light, and then he hit the turnaround side air. And because of that drift that you have in side air, he was holding the other direction from Radish. He was still holding left. This is a beautiful turnaround. There you see the down air, and that was it. But that turnaround, he was able to get away from the punish. Yeah. The biggest range that Radish has is going to be that side light. I think even if he put a dash side light, he might have just barely had the range to make it. But using that drift and the movement speed that Brax has to all of his favor to throw out a move and then get himself out of range of being punished without having to burn a dodge, just holding a direction. Well, he's going to have to play completely differently now because he's swapping over to the brain. He'll still have high movement speed, but again, he brings that movement speed down from seven to six to try to bring it more in line with the rest of the Bryn stats. 
Spectre Alliance. Gonna try to cover this corner. Radish utilizing those weapon tosses to guarantee a landing, but you saw the stars come out. That was a burn recovery. He'll get back to the wall safely. There again, we're seeing Stingray do those signatures, like running off stage, turning around, and getting that like reverse charge on it. He did that with the down signature on Axe, where he hit the scoop, bouncing his opponent off the wall. And now he's doing it with the spear side signature. That's gonna be a punish. Maybe for Enough. a KO, setting up the edge guard, spirit bomb, and he's done. Yeah, Radish, I mean, like, his gameplay hasn't had to change too much. Yeah, he'll bring out some gauntlet stuff. He'll kind of show a little bit more. But for the most part, he's just had this consistency with his orb. He takes a lot of stage control with those side light side airs. And when he needs to, he'll get the edge guard with that spirit bomb. But it's going to be a neutral light from Stingray to keep the stock count even. He has around 50 damage on this stock, so not a huge lead, especially as Radish is coming in unarmed. Is able to pick up the orb very quickly. We'll see if Stingray can put out the damage to even these things up. He's gonna take a two-piece, now hits a nice double down air to sort of interrupt the momentum that Radish had in that string. Radish is Ooh. still finding these, almost taken off the top. He's extending these recoveries with his neutral airs, starting off with the down lights. There's the side light side air, gonna toss that up. Toss it straight up so that he could pick up the gauntlets, throw those, and then catch the orb on the way down. This time nice. he chases out there, hits him with the recovery. Radish is picking apart Stingray off the back of his orb gameplay. Neutralite beats out Stingray. He's continuing to press the, press the advantage. Stingray with the ax in hand, can't find a hit onto Radish. And oh, it connects no. as well. He falls into it. Radish really wasn't using those until like that one was the first one of this set between these two players. We haven't, I almost forgot that one existed yeah. because we haven't seen it in so long. The anime signature teleport behind, but didn't connect onto Stingray. That's a burn dodge, so it's a double into the side air, but Stingray is one hit from getting KO'd. He's gonna have to play basically perfect. Even that side light, that sent him so far off stage, giving Radish plenty of room to pick up. Of course, it's going to be the orb. He set that up, and he takes that game home. Now up 2-0, of course, with the winner's bracket blessing, where he only has to win one more game. And he's going to be adding his second gold medal to his belt. The last time he had a gold medal was the Summer Championship of 2022. Oh, but he has been so good practicing so much since then again did very well for himself in autumn championship did well for himself at the world championship and of course doing amazing for himself here at the winter championship he is one game away stingray has swapped characters time and time again we've already seen the lord brax we've already seen the brin we've seen the orion earlier it worked for a game is it time for that or something different so comparing these two players, uh, they are so close to one another. If we're looking at seeds, Emotionally? if we're looking at everything, oh, okay. Stingray is just like one step ahead of Radish mm -hmm. until we actually get to this set. But Stingray is one step ahead of Radish. At the Autumn Championship, Stingray was fourth, Radish was fifth. At the World Championship, Stingray was fourth, Radish was fifth. In PR, Stingray is third, Radish is fourth. In seeds, Stingray is third, Radish is fourth. So Radish is hot on the heels of Stingray. Now he's really Ooh. ahead of them, at least in this game, as he opens up with a massive string, putting out 100 damage just like that in about 13 seconds. Stingray hoping the bow is going to be the answer for him as he switches over to the Azoth, at least level 25 on this Azoth. His axe might have worked really well, that's why he's keeping it, but he maybe wants to bring out the bow, but it's back to the axe as he needs a little bit more damage before he can look for that side air. Now we were talking about the signature usage on Vrax and how he was able to easily weave those into his gameplay based on the signature kit. That's something we see from a lot of Azoth players. I mean, pretty much every Azoth player ooh, runs right into that Hadouken. So much range on it that Radish can play so safe back on almost the uh, left third of the stage and still have a threat while not being threatened. I, I really feel like Stingray's got this mental block of like, he really wants to punish those orb end sigs off stage. He knows that's a burn dodge. He's going to get that side air to get the KO. But that's time and time again where he tries to do something. He's really trying to push into Radish's uh, end sigs when he does that to protect himself. We are very even between these two. The bowstring that Stingray found at the end of last game. Okay, still trying to punish that one, but it, he, he punished that too late because he was waiting. He was giving it respect, which is really probably the better thing to do there is punish just a little bit too late rather than falling into it. 
Yeah, uh, rather not get punished for your whiffed punish at the very least, but he's still struggling to find that damage. Radish disarms Stingray back to the axe. The dare. Radish still has a nice lead here. The side air sending just barely off screen. Almost trying to pick up that side light right off the corner. Stinger is able to use his dodge to get through it. The recovery is back to the stage. Stingray just really isn't able to punish too heavily, and Radish is the opposite. Yeah, Radish does a really good job of covering those corners where Stingray has not been able to do so against him. Radish, one stock away from being crowned the winter champion. And Sig, Ooh, not okay. enough. Down, or side Sig. Starting Down to use Sig. those a little bit more. Pops himself back, puts some range in between him and Radish, also throws out that hitbox. Okay. Okay. Keeping like him weapon movement. starved. That's going to lower his damage output. That's going to lower the priority he can find with his moves. Now he's on the quote unquote off weapon with Ooh. the gauntlets. Maybe not the off weapon anymore. Trying to catch that movement of Stingray. Nice, neutral light. But the down sig does not get it. Oh, that's a dodge. Radish gets him with the side light. He's so close to closing this out. Each of these hits in orange is sending Stingray so far. Radish, without a weapon, Stingray has the axe in hand. There is a weapon on the field, immediately stripped away by Stingray. I'm really digging the bow right now. But is it enough? It's past it, hits the recovery, and Sig oh. doesn't hit! That was so close. It's gonna take one more side Sweet. air. He almost picked oh. up that sideline side air, and there it is! Radish is your 2023 North American Winter Champion! Putting another gold medal on the neck of Radish. He is a champion again for winter 2023. Radish, he's been looking good. He's on the come up. And of course, he is now the winter champion. He's going to the Royale against uh, the person he just beat, as well as many other people in March. I am so curious how that is going to affect PR. I wonder if he is going to jump above Stingray with the points from getting first place here in the winter championship. We could see some major movement coming from these players. We could see Luna drop. We could have a new PR number one. Who knows? I don't know. It's going to be tough. I mean, of course, uh, Luna was PR number one just above Impala. He did manage to beat Impala, so you might see that kind of proportionate change between the two of them. But at the same time, Radish is he's got to be going up. He's going to be moving up. He is the most recent champion. At the very least, he'll be seed one going into the next tournament. So we saw Stingray dip deep into those pockets to find a bunch of different legends, while Radish, of course, even though we thought we might see some Tezka from Radish today, no, it's that Petra, it's that classic Petra that he broke out onto the scene with and continues to play this legend. Very few other people have made this legend work, and nobody else has made this legend work for as long a period of time through all the different shifts, the ebbs, the flows of all the different metas and popular legends and popular weapons. Radish has made this Petra his home. Yep, he is the person who practiced uh, one kick a million times, whereas Stingray is the person who practiced many kicks many times. And of course, it is Radish who ends up being victorious here. C again, congratulations to Radish being our gold medalist. Stingray, of course, getting that silver medal. And Luna going home with the bronze. So all of the players we have decided who are going to make the Winter Royale, that yeah. is going to be our top three today. Like you just mentioned, Radish, Stingray, and Luna. Then in Europe, we have Machete, Godly Knees. Yeah. I know Machete and Knees. Machete I don't remember who the second I one I think was. it was Godly. It was Godly? Okay. And then South America is Use Kina China. and Use. So those are our, this is eight. eight. This is eight different we players that we have decided Thanks. upon. Our Winter Royale is decided, and that is going to be a wonderful tournament. But you don't have to wait until the Winter Royale to see more Brawlhalla gameplay. Of course, we have twos coming up next weekend for Australia. SEA, Europe, 
South America, and North America. You can check brahala.com forward slash schedule to see when the streams will start in your time. If you want to enter those tournaments, make sure you go to start.gg forward slash brawlhalla. That will show you past tournaments, current tournaments, and upcoming tournaments that you yourself can enter. If you're like, yeah, but I'm gold. What am I going to do in tournament? You're going to have fun. You're going to learn something. You might get the chance to play against your favorite pros. And who knows? You might be the next one up for the top player in Brawlhalla Esports. You can also go to brawlhalla.com forward slash winter merch so that you can get your piece of wearable clothing for the Brawlhalla Winter Championship. Man, it would be so cool to be drift out in all of the seasonal pieces of clothing and then be cozy underneath your Brawlhalla blanket since we're still in the winter time. Where else should you go? You should go to twitter.com forward slash Brawlhalla. You should also go to twitter.com forward slash pro Brawlhalla is the esports sure, one? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, probably. You'll find it on there. I have faith Figure in you. Follow both of those. You can also go to twitter.com forward slash who is Sparky to follow me. Go to twitter.com forward slash Duke X fam. Fam is spelled P H A M. Duke is spelled D U C X is spelled just like triple X with an X, except there's just <laughs> one of them <laughs> this time. That's the worst way to get to that one. <laughs> Shouts out to Xander Cage, Vinny <laughs> Diesel. We got you here. We're brothers. We got that. Thank you to everybody who tuned into this one, man. Congratulations to Radish. You can see it right behind you. Radish coming in for Kingdom Esports. Big W next to his name because he is the winner. Big crown going to be on his head, of course. Champion. You see the livery behind us, that Petra, that iconic Petra. We see some Ryu sometimes. We see some Ken sometimes. We know the foundation comes from Petra. But we've got an interview coming in. Radish, of course, the champion. You see his name on screen. You won't get to see his face, but we'll get to hear from the champion himself. Uh, Hello? I'm Hi. Hello. Hey, congratulations, brother. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so how are you feeling now that that just happened? Well, I actually didn't expect to win it all because, like, I was playing ranked a few days ago. I was getting farmed by, like, Balloon Boy and stuff. But yesterday I played a bunch and I got rank one. But I was still, like, not confident. But I ended up pulling through and winning. So the meta talk recently was Tesca. The meta talk recently was Spear and it's Katars. You came up against, I believe, all of those. Did you play a Tesca against a Tesca today? No, I haven't fought Tesca. Okay, how do you feel about fighting Tesca, and given that you played some ranked? I'm sure you ran into some Tescas there. Honestly, I, I actually practiced a lot of Tesca. I have like a level 54 Tesca. Oh, I goodness. I today. But I honestly think it's like not as broken as people are saying, so I, didn't, I decided to play Orb. Okay, so... Out. You heard the wisdom from Radish right there, your winner champion. We also heard it from Faison, who said the council has decided that boots are not broken. So now that you have your trip to the Winter Royale secured, how are you feeling about that? Uh, I'm actually really excited. Like my goal of this tournament was actually to get top three so I could go to the first Royale and I hit it. And yeah, I don't know how I'm gonna do against like Kaina. I know I, I lost him by BCX. I'm excited for the rematch. And besides that, yeah. So cool. tell us, tell us about the Petra pick. You've been on Petra for a long time. Why have you stayed on Petra while others have moved away? Uh, I mean, I already put a lot of time on Petra, and I don't think I could get as good as my Petra on any other character right now. And I don't think it's just. I just don't think it's worth putting that much time into something else right now. Okay, wise words. Duke, you have any questions for the winner champion himself while we got him on the line? Well, I got to put you on the spot right now while I can. Are you coming to the first LAN of 2023? Are you coming to San Diego? Yeah, I plan to, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'm excited to seeing you there. Um, any final words of wisdom, uh, Mr. Champion? Uh, just grind ranked and you'll end up improving. That's all. Easy, simple words from the champion. Uh, yo, Radish, where can we find you? If I want to see more Radish, where should I be looking? I mean, I don't stream a lot. Like, I tried before, but, like, with school, it's kind of hard. But I might 
I might end up like starting to stream more in like the summer or something. So, what's your Twitch? Catch me on Twitch. What's the channel name? Radish. Radish. Okay. It's Radish. What's your Twitter? It's Radish with an underscore. At okay. The end. Do you have a YouTube? And nah, I don't upload on YouTube. I All did. Right. I had like one video like two years ago, but that's it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Radish. Congratulations on your victory today, adding another gold medal to your belt after the thank championship you. that you earned last year. We'll look forward to seeing you in twos next week, and we will look forward to seeing you at the first LAN and at the Winter Royale and how you continue the rest of the season. Thanks for your time. I think they've already uh, kicked them oh, out okay, of here. Okay, word. Okay, cool. You, you said so many nice things, and they didn't like that. You're well. being not as controversial as you tend to be. Yes, uh, it's because I'm fake. <laughs> congratulations again to Radish. Congratulations to everyone. The weekend might be over for 1v1s, but like Sparky said earlier, we've still got 2v2s. We've still got goodness. And of course, the merch is still on sale, but it'll be over soon. So again, make sure you pick that up over Less at Brahalla.com. Less than seven days. Less than seven yeah. days. Get it now before it sells out. Seven days. Was that supposed to be like a the ring? I feel like I don't. I can't uh, remember. I know they make like a. It's uh, like a phone thing, right? Like, uh, they, they make that yeah, noise. Yeah, was, I remember that, that noise. Okay. All right, Duke, take us home. Thank you again for watching. We love you all. We hope you have a wonderful week, and we'll see y'all next weekend for the two v twos of the Winter Championship. Again, congratulations to everyone, and I look forward to meeting all of the winners at the Winter Royale. For now, have a wonderful rest of your night, everyone. Bye. goes for this you may just be throwing those out because there is virtually no punishment throughout the entire game coming out there Stingray right dodges down doesn't get three this time good change up oh. buddy he needs the neutral light and is going to be likely looking for the side air no weapon toss here just waiting for the side but haven't seen too many of those throughout the entirety of today nice side oh. hit it but there wasn't a weapon on the stage that he didn't pick up oh. Seeing that side stick in particular, and then when he goes over the bow, it's that end stick that he loves to use. Edge guard opportunity. Nice. And yep, Luna. She has lower strength, but she does have that higher defense. So she's able to survive that one. Green, he's still going for these D-lights. Avoids the owl. Impala's discard. He's got Luna's inside. got everything, but he goes so low. The spear. Oh, this is scary. It's a side oh. air. Interesting ring is like with this high mobility for him again coming in. Base seven movement speed, like side momentum coming out. And actually after that initial flurry from Stingray, Luna has taken back the lead to what he did in the last game. Where he just kind of walls out Luna. This time it was with the spear and airs. Gone from yeah. North America and all of the gauntlet players we've seen today goes for the sideline. After we saw that GCD light into the turnaround side air, I think you're exactly Ooh. right. You're 100% right when you explain that. Yeah. He's got the opportunity, doesn't get the dodge this time. Stingray trying to bring out the classic of the cannon. Oh, go for it. Yeah, in there. He's going to have a pretty low strength and he's also going to have lower defense. The default is going oh. to have four legends. Here it doesn't hit. This time it will. Needs to continue the edge guard, but the nice. turnaround. Nice. Stingray! He's no way, no got way. it! Luna's oh, got oh, oh. that force away from us. <laughs> Look, Brax players, rise up. That's what they took from us. Um, even though Radish is in orange, that almost was enough. Turn around. Okay, you're right. Fine, but can you connect on the Stingray? That's a burn dodge, so it's a double into the side. Plenty of room to pick up. Of course, it's going to make the orb. Set that up and passed it. It's the recovery. And it oh. That was so close. It's going to take one more side air. He almost picked oh. up that sideline side air, and there it is. Radish is your 2023 North American.